his people. And so, sir, it is with a sense of wonderment that I think about what was shared yesterday by the member for Christchurch South. I found it difficult to follow some of what he was saying because, sir, a lot of it seemed to be theatrics. A lot of it seems to be play acting, using language in a way to create a picture without the underpinning of facts and truth. And sir, this is why I am joining this debate to speak about what it is we are seeking to do and what it is we are seeking to establish for the people of Barbados. Because one of the things, sir, that I had to conclude after listening to him is that where the leader of the opposition was sleeping, he did not realize that the world had changed. He didn't realize. And sir, if he had spent his time preparing himself to serve the people of Christchurch South, if he had spent the time preparing himself to be of use to the people of Barbados, there's certain things that he would know and certain things he would do. First of all, he would understand how the budget works and how the estimates are constructed. I was shocked to hear him say yesterday that the honorable member for St. Michael North East has apportioned to herself $180 million for the prime minister's office one would not believe that he checked the estimates to recognize that they're close to 29 units under the Prime Minister's office that has to be financed. And I do not know which ones he would have wanted to get rid of or underfund by cutting in half the 180 million. But that wasn't the worst of the, the thing. Let's pretend he doesn't get the chance to read everything. It was for him to compare it to the 108 million given to the People Empowerment Ministry. As though he does not understand that the provision for the poor of Barbados is not only contained in the Ministry of People's Empowerment, it runs throughout every ministry in this government. Sir, let me educate him. Agriculture, more than 40 million to help people get into the feed program and for small farmers to be able to make a living, sir. Let me help him again in housing, over 60 million to help poor people get affordable housing that they can hold their heads up in dignity, sir. In the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Transmission, $11 million for Export Barbados to help Export Barbados help small business people and young people with ideas to get ready for export so that they can participate in the economic gains in this nation. Sir, this is what we do. In transport and roads, so that people have decent roads running outside of their homes, $30 million. In health care, out of that budget, $145 million is dedicated to NCDs, to health promotion, to primary health care, and to nutrition. All of that is for the people at the bottom of our society who need to be lifted up, sir. Youth and sports, $68 million for youth advance for the sports program, for community training, for youth development. The peace program and national crime prevention program, over 12 million. And sir, when it comes to education, with $651 million, more than 254 million has been put aside for tertiary education. And why is that important at the level of tertiary education? Because as the honorable member for St. Philip, West pointed out how many children passed through the system that did not gain certification. How many children came out without having a career or a pathway from which to earn their money, ending up on a block. Ending up, sir, like that video that has been moving around Barbados today. That our children, when we fail to transform the educational system, 
they will have no platform for their lives. And therefore, putting $254 million towards the tertiary education is to help us provide a second chance for all of those children who missed it at primary and secondary school. Sir, and I will tell you something else that distressed me was when he was speaking about the ash workers. The honorable members in here have already pointed out that when they were released, that one of the things we did was to make sure that the NIS was paid, but then in the Ministry of Education, we made room for them in the Construction Gateway Program. Sir, more than a thousand were able to get into that program of young people who were able to pursue construction and building classes that would give them the skills that they can make a life for themselves. Sir, I was distressed to think that he felt that the solution for our ash workers was to return them to that same job. I want him to understand those are stopgap jobs. Those are not careers for our people. That is something that you give people to do when they need something urgently to be able to get food on the table. But if they are going to live out a full life, maximizing their potential, a country owes them the opportunity to get the type of schooling and education that will give them better paying jobs, more sustainable jobs, especially in the area of their personal desires because they have the skills to make their way in this world. It is only a stopgap, sir. It's only a stopgap. We want more for them. And that is why we work earnestly in the Ministry of Education. And I really want to congratulate the Honorable Member for St. Philip West because she works tirelessly with a huge program of transformation. There is so much work in that ministry. There is so much that has to be done to transform this educational system. Sir, I really have to congratulate her for the work that she has been doing and her team. So here are some of the things that have been happening while the Honorable Member for Christchurch South was sleeping. You need to understand that there are changing conditions in the world and that any government that is interested in the welfare of its people will plan and seek to govern in a way to address the conditions which their country will meet. And UNCTAD put out a paper outlining and advising developing countries what are the key things that they need to do in order to cope with the changing conditions that we are facing now in 2024. They outline that one of the things that must happen is that we have to help countries develop new businesses, that you have to bring more people into entrepreneurship. Barbados is doing that with the Trust Loans Fund. They're doing that with Fund Access. They're doing that with the Enterprise Growth Fund Limited. They're doing that with the feed program in agriculture. They are doing that at every turn in community and youth and sports. At every turn, entrepreneurship is offered in this country to give our people a fighting chance. But it is not only for new businesses, but how do you help your existing businesses to expand and change to meet the conditions that we are facing? And what are those conditions, sir? That the consumption patterns of the public have changed. People now can buy everything they want and bring it in via the internet. That means we have to get our businesses to go global. The other thing that is present in our environment is that there are a lot of technological changes. That means that we have to educate not only this current generation, but including our seniors, to be able to use technology so that they can continue to live their life safely in their own home and young people get cutting edge technology that help them to make good choices and have choices for the careers that they wish to pursue. And the other piece of advice that UNCTAD shared was that these developing countries need to pay special attention to the hostile global trade arrangements that impact how we do business. 
And so, sir, I recognize that because the honorable member was not awake and because he did not understand what is facing Barbados, his conversation took him to talk things that did not make sense, sir. It did not show any connection with the fact that there are changing conditions out there. Had he connected with that, he would have asked us, what are we doing in education to prepare this generation for the fourth industrial revolution that is on the way and that if we don't catch up with it, we will be left behind. And then he will know why Barbadian children are going to school without breakfast. Because if you do not transition this economy onto that fourth industrial revolution, our businesses will fail, people will not have jobs, and people will face starvation. That is the reality. That is the truth. And this is why there is an urgent movement all across the world for countries to try to upgrade their economies. And there's only one way to do it. You have to do it through education. Without education transformation, there is no future for Barbados. So when he can say, and I don't know how he said it with a straight face, that Barbadians like and prefer the 11 plus, I was wondering which Barbadians he was listening to. You have a system that fails 80% of the children, demolishes their self-confidence, makes them feel that they have failed life at 11 years old. And you want to tell me that as a person aiming for leadership, you believe that Barbadians think that this is the best course of action. I'm here to let him know that that is not true. That Barbadians recognize that something must change about that 11 plus. And what the Ministry of Education is doing is taking the time to build a proper platform, a pathway for the transition, so that we can safely conduct our children through the transition, so that we can make sure that every single child in this country feels that he can learn, knows that he can learn that he can find his own special set of skills and know that there's a Barbados that is providing for him not only at primary, but providing for him even before primary. We're going to be providing for early childhood education. Every child will get to go to a nursery school and get to primary school and get to secondary school and then be able to get to a tertiary institution that is going to help them, help them to be able to build a good life. And that is what we are here for. One of the things that is really important, sir, is that if children are going to maximize their potential, and if that potential is to mean something going forward in terms of them being able to earn well and therefore provide for themselves and their children the things that they dream of, the things that they desire, it is important that the educational system, as was shared by the Honorable Member for St. Philip South, that that system must embrace education in technical skills. That this is important. And why is that, sir? There was a study done by Professor Andrew Downs looking at the labor market demand in Barbados and where labor was at. And one of the things that he tracked from 1976 was the fact that over a period all the way through to 2010, there was a shift in how we were educating our children. And one of the things that he outlined was the fact that 70% of the enrollment at UE were females and only 30% was male. And the question was asked, why was this? And it was discovered that males actually prefer technical training. But unfortunately, Barbados did not have enough capacity to offer males the technical training that they were interested in from which they wanted to be able to make a living. And sir, a lot of that contributed to why we have so many young men on the block, because we've not been able to give them the technical training. I remember has two more minutes. Two. Ten flights. Get ten flights. 
Thank it does. Thank you very much. And so, sir, what we have decided to do, we recognize that it was important to expand our, our capacity to offer technical training. And so at SJPI, there has been a massive expansion of the programs which they have been doing. And so we're able to offer not only the usual technical skills, but they've also looked at things such as mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. They have labs that help youngsters to learn how to take care of the electrical vehicles. They also do specializations in agriculture, building studies, and printing, human ecology. And this is important. BVTB, the Barbados Vocational Training Board, again, offering the technical skills in photovoltaics, welding and metal fabrication, cuisine, tractor operations, and the backhoe. And one of the things, sir, that I'm really pleased to have found in the ministry was the Dukes and Hope project, and that there has been significant progress in the building out of the Dukes facility to allow agriculture to flourish in Barbados. But what kind of agriculture? Smart agriculture agriculture that would take us into the future. And very shortly, we'll be breaking ground on the HOPE project, which will allow our tertiary institutions to transfer all of their agricultural training at HOPE in St. Lucie. And sir, this is what will make the difference to everyone, because it is going to provide us with a wide platform in order to build out the skills and opportunities for people. But we're doing more than just simply offering those. What has been happening in the tertiary section, we are sitting down with SJPI, BCC, et cetera, and what we're doing, we're looking at whether the programs are fit for purpose, whether the way in which we organize it meets the need of the student. We're looking at what do we need to do with the courses to make them fit better to their lives. And then one of the most important things that we've started discussing is how do we make sure that before they leave the institution, they understand how to commercialize that skill, not only to get a job, but if they needed to start a business. That this now has to be part of what we're going to be doing. Do you remember so, some wind up? So, oh, sir, some wind up. as I wind up, I want to say to Barbados, education now has to become in the forefront of the minds of every Barbadian. Because for us to make the transition from nursery all the way to seniors, must be able to embrace the changes and learn new skills and stay in learning mode if this country is going to prosper. And therefore, it is important that everyone puts their hand to the plow to help make this work. I end with this. I found it very strange that the opposition leader kept making this statement, that he has the right to be wrong. But I want to say to him that our people cannot afford the cost of his errors, either in judgment or his errors in fact. And I want to say to him that while all of us will make errors, while we are seeking to transform Barbados and we have to move quickly because of the urgency of the hour, sometimes when we're running with the milk, some of the milk will spill. But what we are prepared to do is to wipe up the, the, the spill and make sure that we keep moving to make sure that we give to Barbadians what they need to be able to live their best life. I'm obliged to you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank our leader. And I also want to thank the myriads of civil servants who work hard to produce these estimates and who work hard to turn them into a living reality. I'm obliged to you, sir. Honorary Member, Sir Michael West. Mr. Speaker, I rise on this occasion and I'm mindful that as one of the younger members of this house, not the youngest, because I was shocked to hear that my colleague, the honorable member from St. Michael North, is only 38 years old. But 
I am thankful, Mr. Speaker, I'm thankful to the Father above, who is the only omnipotent one that I can think of, and like what the Honorable Member from Christ Church South said yesterday. I also give thanks to the constituents of St. Michael West for putting me in this honorable house so that I can give contribution to these budget debates. Now, sir, I want to echo the course of approval of this budget that was presented to the nation by our, by our Honorable Prime Minister on Monday, coined as the people-centric budget. Now, sir, I would not expect the Honorable Leader of the Opposition to understand or even support a people-centric budget. Because after all, he has a natural aversion to people, especially the ones in his constituency. Now, as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister, she talked about the macroeconomic indicators that we face when we came into office in 2018. The macro indicators matter. And for context, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to beat a dead horse by bringing up the previous administration, but for context, I lived overseas for 12 years. I came back to the family business in 2007, a hundred year old business in Cheapside, opposite the Cheapside market, sir. A prosperous business. Sir, those who feel it know it. I could tell you, that when the disaster of the tanking foreign reserves hit this country, not a natural disaster, but a man-made one, there was a queue from here to Fontabelle to get foreign currency, sir. At that time, the reserves were about 300 odd million, the, the honorable member, from Christchurch, the Central could give you the exact figure. But it was daunting. Business could not get foreign exchange to pay for goods to bring in this country. And the thing about it is, is that you have a prosperous business that is doing well. And that is the impediment to success. It was very frustrating. And we could, we could talk about all the other things. The Honorable Member for St. Peter mentioned some of them. The, NAS and the fact that that government hadn't put in contributions for three years, correct me if I'm wrong, Honorable Member. I mean, does the, 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 the Honorable Opposition Leader have, he has a convenient memory, but we are here to remind him, sir, that is why we have to go over this nightmare scenario over and over again for context. But sir, I am pleased with the people-centric budget that we have here. Because this is not the macro, but the micro, sir. And as I told you, I work in Cheapside along with vendors. And these vendors I've worked with for 12 years had businesses that were thriving. Which is why legislation like the vendors bill that we pass in this honorable chamber, sir, that gave dignity to the vendors in this country, that they would not have to be hiding about to sell their goods to support their family, sir. That's what I'm talking about, the micro. But sir, since we came into office in 2018, we stabilized the economy, we saved the dollar, we commandeered this small island developing state into 11 periods of significant growth. These are facts, Mr. Speaker. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, sir. That's right. And as the Honorable Prime Minister said, we are going upwards and onwards. And as some people like to say, up and on, brother. That is correct. Perfectly correct. That's right. I remember. Mr. Speaker, economic activity and rising GDP is of extreme importance to allow this country, after having to climb out of a massive hole left by the previous administration, a hole that it could probably drive about 
three garbage trucks, and five buses through, if they had them. Sir, we need growth. We need it to continue to deliver a high level, a high standard of public services that our people have grown accustomed to. Sir, we need it to keep our standards of living high, to keep our standing on the Human Development Index high. We need growth to continue to, to support the QEH. And I am very encouraged and thankful for the announcement made by the Honourable Member yesterday from St. Michael North that we will be hiring 250 doctors and nurses to help alleviate that problem and offer better patient care to our citizens, sir. Because that's what we want. The, the average Barbadian wants efficient and effective delivery of public services. And that's what growth will allow us to do, sir. Also, I am encouraged that we will tackle the scourge of breast cancer that has rampaged our society by purchasing a linear accelerator, sir. This is a long time coming for the women in our country. And that we will revise the screening guidelines targeted to our demographics, which will help us to attain world-class five-year survival rates, upwards of 90%, sir. That is what our women deserve. Sir, we need growth to continue to deliver free education from primary to tertiary. And I, like everybody else here, I am shocked that the honorable member from Christchurch South is enacting his convenient memory that that administration abandoned the principles of that great party as it pertains to free education. Sir, I applaud the Ministry of Education in the training of young Barbadians in the discipline of cybersecurity through joint partnerships with North America, I think specifically Canada, allowing these young Barbadians to, uh, to get gainful employment in technology, jo technology jobs. I applaud you, Minister of Education. Barbados has a long history of exporting talent. You can remember the days, Mr. Speaker, when esteemed Barbadian nurses, teachers would go up to New York and the UK and they would be um, ambassadors. We didn't have to appoint the ambassadors back then. We had ambassadorship provided by average Barbadians who used to excel and carry forward our flag on the world stage, sir. We could get back there again. That's our natural resource, sir. We need growth to protect the vulnerable, the elderly, people with disabilities, the commitment by the Ministry of People, Empowerment, and Elderly Care to amalgamate those agencies under its remit will help to deliver efficient and effective health and service to, our, to Barbadians, sir. I applaud you. That is what our people want. Mr. Speaker, as we go upward and onward and continue to grow the Barbadian economy, we, through this budget, sir, have aligned ourselves with the hairdressers, the nail techs, the vendors. These are the people that make up the heart of our economy, the micro, sir. And I am encouraged that we will not make the errors of other jurisdictions in history. We will not repeat their mistakes. And allow growth to be fueled by venture capitalists and stock markets leaving people behind. As the Honorable Prime Minister would say, not about here. This government is morally responsible to craft policies to bring everyone along, Mr. Speaker. So, as this great nation records through the many corporations on its shores, Record profit, sir. In the billions in some instances, I want to urge those corporations to do right by their employees. As the Prime Minister would say, share the bounty, share the burden, sir. 
You can't be making billions of dollars in a corporation, and then your own employees can't even afford to buy the products that you're selling, sir. So which is why legislation like the labor clauses bill that the Honorable Member from St. Peter brought to the House matters. It hurts that we have to legislate good behavior. There are a few, not all, but corporations need to be mindful that you're making money, you got to share. And this government will set the tone, sir. Another thing that I am proud of is the establishment of the trust loan, sir. Because I could tell you that vendors had it rough in Bridgetown after COVID. I know they wouldn't mind me calling some of their names. I drew Jalav, Yaskin, Ruben. These are vendors around Bridgetown. Some of y'all probably know them. They were successful, put their kids through school, but COVID mashed them up, sir. And that vent, and, and the trust loan helped them, some of them, to get back on their feet, sir, to provide a lifeline. And that is what this government is about, sir. Not only just the macroeconomic indicators, but the micro, the people of this country, the heart, the soul, the crust. The Prime Minister is very correct in highlighting the scenario where the average person could get a car in under a month, but can't get the money for the small business, sir. So I am encouraged by the efforts of this government to review some of those regulations that make it more difficult for them to access commercial loans, sir, when it comes to investment in their business. I am also encouraged by the creation of Business Barbados, sir, because that is another impediment to our people, and it frustrates them. They want, you want to do the right thing. You want to pay your taxes, but you can't do it in a proper timing, and then the bill is piling up. You want to help yourself. So this is a step in the right direction for creating ease of business in this country. So I want to encourage the government to continue to lower the cost of living. We've done a lot so far, as much as we can, it's out of our control. Things like capping the freight rates on goods, things like the expanded basket of goods, they help. 7.5% VAT on 250 kilowatt, it helps. But we need to find other inventive ways. And I know that the government is looking at increasing and, and strengthening the relationships with the South-South, going to non-traditional markets for goods so that we can complete our target of 25% import substitution by 2025. We can do so by strengthening our links with, our links with Brazil, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic. A lot of these goods go through North America and come back down. We can go direct and it will be cheaper. So I want to encourage the government to continue to strengthen those trading ties, which will be beneficial to our people. The Honourable Member has two more minutes. So I believe in my heart that the future is bright for this country. We have a bo booming construction sector that employs thousands of Barbadians. As the Honourable Member for Christchurch West said yesterday, there are too, too many to call. But soon for now, we will have a problem with skilled labour. And I, I'm thankful for the programme that the Ministry of Education has launched with the Construction Gateway Initiative. And I want to encourage more young Barbadians to sign up for that. Because, sir, as the American president, as one American president said one time, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So I want to encourage young Barbadians to take advantage so that when this growth happens, that they can take part in the boom and not get left behind. But it's up to them, sir to take advantage of the opportunities that we present to them. Sir, Barbados continues to be a guiding light in the world. Led by our Honorable Prime Minister, we have positioned our country as the moral authority on the issue of climate change and climate justice through the Bridgetown Initiative and other things. Sir, as the Honorable Prime Minister said, 
if we invest in hotels, we need to invest in the coastline because there are thousands of jobs there. So we need to find the money to invest there. We're borrowing the money to protect our investment, sir. That is what we're doing. I am hopeful. I am positive about the future. And despite the naysayers on the other side, our future is bright, sir. I have the utmost confidence in our people, not only because of the economic factors, it's the resilience, a resilience that we can't engineer, the resilience of our people, sir, that has been, have been handed down from our four parents. It's in our DNA. This nation will continue to reach higher heights. This beautiful Barbados and her people will remain the jewel of the Caribbean. I'm obliged to you, sir. Honourable Member for St. John. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I want to say blessings on all of those persons in St. John who are responsible for having me here today, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to deliver chapter number two of my story. I grew up in a village, Mr. Speaker, and they told me Your that- Your mic is on, I remember. It is on, Mr. Speaker. They told me that dogs bark at people they don't know. <laughs> and I'm a firm believer of that. And people from George Street keep barking and barking at the Barbados Labour Party. Mr. Speaker, I was looking for this I document. One has to be very careful how you couch those words. We, 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 we don't want to appear that you're using unparliamentary language in relation to the. the no, Mr. Addict. Speaker. I, I, just, I just thought that. Just mindful. I, I have a cousin living on George Street. Okay. okay. So when I go there, the dogs don't know me well. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I was looking for this document home. And you guide me if I should make this a document of the house because this is fiction. I couldn't find it. And I asked my PA this morning to go to the library. And she called back and said, Minister, I can't find the document in the ministry. I said, move to the fiction section. She said, yes, Minister, I found it. This, Mr. Speaker, is the 208 Youth Manifesto of the Democratic Labour Party. And last week or two weeks ago, a former minister took a full page in one of our dailies to suggest the work that they're doing. I am saying today, Mr. Speaker, and I have some young people here from Youth Parliament, um, democratically, a, a pledge to young people of Barbados. Mr. Speaker, from 2008, you, you know that this document was pulled down from their website? And you must ask why. And, and there's some things in here that I want to highlight. 2008, and not a single thing, 17 pages of lies that were foisted on our young people in this country. This, the Democratic Labour Party Youth Manifesto, and, and I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about, Mr. Speaker. And, and on page 13, we organized the National Sports Council to reach more, to reach out more effectively to schools and communities. The only thing that came from the Sports Council was a marriage from 2008 to 2018. And they're talking about reorganizing. Mr. Speaker, as I speak, we are going through the process of dealing with the restructuring of that. On page 14, Mr. Speaker, make grants to successful sporting organization, and I will get to that a little further. Not a single cent was paid to any single club or organization in this island, and it is written in this manifesto. Page six, Mr. Speaker. And this, this is a howler, an absolute howler. The Democratic Labour Party commits to high quality education for Barbados, free for all from preschool to tertiary. 
Can you imagine that? When they talk about fiction, which party cut the university fees for our young people? But it is documented here, Mr. Speaker, in the youth manifesto. In this, they have said that they are committed to that. On page two, Barbados needs to provide better opportunities for young people to realize their potential. I will show them what a government will do, exactly what they're saying here, Mr. Speaker. And this, this was a manifesto that stood for 10 years and not a single, I was working in the ministry, so I should know, not a single thing that is written in this document came to fruition on this island under the same minister of sports that took a full page ad. Same minister. I don't even know, Mr. Speaker, if we should put this anywhere. Mr. Speaker. There has to be made a document that goes over here. Unfortunately so. Unfortunately so. I don't think that people, uh, sorry? It, it, it is crazy. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to share really and truly what a government is doing to move our young people in Barbados forward as it relates to sports and as it relates to other areas. And I'll try to do it within my allotted time. Mr. Speaker, we are in the process of converting the old National Sports Council into a sports secretariat for all of the federations on the island. Because there's a need to help those federations in terms of clerical work, in terms of training, in terms of various, various things that are required from these federations to make them functioning and viable for what they're supposed to. The mini stadium, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of talk about the mini stadium. And I was told that the mini stadium will disrupt community life. The Honorable Minister of Education is here. I think the majority, if not all, of our schools are fenced, Mr. Speaker. But guess what? The community are able to access the grounds. At Mount Tabor St. John, Sherburn and Venture are able to access the pasture to play um, sports. But all of a sudden, fencing these locations will mean that we are disrupting community life. Mr. Speaker, these things have at least nine or 10 gates attached to all of them that are not locked, that provides entry at four o'clock in the morning, at 11 o'clock at night. But they're finding problems with that. The last time I went to a fair at Mount Tabor School, Mr. Speaker, they made in excess of $10,000 because they were able to take a gate. And I mentioned before in the well, ask the St. Michael School, if, for not, if not for the fencing, what would have happened to Glow Sports and the money that they raised to assist? The lighting project, Mr. Speaker, to help our youngsters who want to practice late and those persons who want to exercise late. 27 out of 38 fields are late right now, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to finish the rest. You heard the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, indicating that there will be two tracks, one in the north and one in the east. And I'm suggesting here that we have um, 26 acres in St. John that can um, assist with that 400 track, but that is a different story. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there's a 400 track being constructed at Wildy that will take some of the pressure off the national stadium when that is completed. It will also take some pressure off the Usain Bolt. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, the Usain Bolt is a partnership between government and the University of the West Indies that you see now um, BISA is taken care of. Road tennis, Prime Minister mentioned road tennis. Road tennis is our indigenous sport, Mr. Speaker. And we have a road tennis academy that was launched last week with 26 U16 individuals at Blenheim, Mr. Speaker. And this is to ensure that we can grow the sports, we ensure that those persons, and, and if you see talent, Mr. Speaker, the talent in this young cohort is absolutely outstanding. Coaches. Prime Minister mentioned there's a need for us to export coaches in rural tennis, and we have started the process of doing that. We have started a coaches program, but now we're going to ratchet up, ratchet up that to ensure that we have more persons involved in the process. Community gyms, the non-communicable diseases that are hitting us, diabetes and all of the rest of it, we need to have people mobile. And hence, the community gyms are being put in place all across this country, this country to facilitate that. 
the Netball Stadium project, Mr. Speaker. And soon we will not be talking about the Netball Stadium because this is going to be a multi-purpose facility at Waterfords that will accommodate netball, basketball, and volleyball. And I dare say probably in a month's time or so, Mr. Speaker, that particular um, project will start at the location. Community golf, seen as this one of these elitist sports, only this morning I had a conversation with the president of the Golf Association to see how we can work together to expand this program across the island so that youngsters from in St. John, in St. Andrew, and St. Lucie can have access to coaching as far as this is concerned. Expanding our community coaches program. If we're gonna have a ground swell of sports on island, it means that we must have persons who are prepared to go and coach these youngsters all across the island. And we have started the process with the football, where we had 22 or so footballers that we coach up, asked them to go back to the program to make sure that they can find a group, hone their skills, but yet still provide um, the basics to those youngsters who are involved in the different sporting disciplines. Um, a program that I'm sure uh, my colleagues sitting to my left will, will, will applaud. We had an elderly swim, po swim program last year. We are bringing it back this year, Mr. Speaker. We had in excess of 900 elderly persons swimming on Browns Beach. And we figured that we need to re replicate that again. Similarly, Mr. Speaker, swim for life. So we have at one end the seniors, at the other end we have the juniors, six to 16, who will be involved in that Swim for Life program. Mr. Speaker, they talk about assisting young people. A cricket academy. We have five practice pitches being prepared at Blenheim. We're now waiting for two bowling machines to complete that. Mr. Speaker, this is a, a project that will see us dealing predominantly with youngsters at Blenheim to ensure that they have all the cricket skills that we can move them up to national, regional, and maybe international as well. Mr. Speaker, I mentioned the 400 track, but adjacent that 400 track, we're also constructing a badminton and squash facility at Wildey. So we're building out the compound at, at Wildey to make it a full, full um, sporting complex. Training for national federations, I mentioned the Secretariat, but we're also looking to provide training for the national federations in terms of how to prepare for tournaments if they're, they're doing, um, if they're bringing teams to the island, it's an opportunity for them to see what exactly they need to put in place. Mr. Speaker, these are some of the things that are happening in sports, Mr. Speaker. There is also a youth captain training program that is being rolled out maybe in the next month or so, over six weeks where we're looking to provide an opportunity for youngsters that we identify um, that can benefit from this particular program, who we see as future captains of cricket teams. And, and I think that this will all go well for the development of cricket. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister mentioned the community block tournament that we're looking to stage early um, in the new financial year. What is this going to do? Mr. Speaker, it is going to provide an opportunity for those youngsters who are on the blocks across Barbados to merge and to engage with other individuals to be involved in this process. Two things. It is looking to provide that structured sporting activity, but it is also an opportunity to rekindle and to give some new life to the BCL um, cricket program, Mr. Speaker, and I really look forward to doing that. Mr. Speaker, like I said, this is a list of things that are happening in the new financial year. We're expanding some of the things that are in this current financial year. Our mentorship program, Mr. Speaker, um, we launched this last year. We had an excess of 50 persons registered, but then we came down to 47 persons, 47 mentors, 47 mentees. We are looking to more than double that this year. I'm pushing maybe for 100 mentors to assist our young people on a journey that we believe they need to be on 
a path of growth and development, and this mentorship program is one such initiative coming from the ministry that I know will help to guide the process. Mr. Speaker, this financial year, for the first time, we launched as well our Moving On project. The Moving On project is targeting those persons in the class fours who are now exiting the primary school system and going into the secondary. And this is providing an opportunity for them to take some skills with them that will allow them to be able to function inside of the secondary um, system, but also to impact some of the others who are in that particular program. Money management, anger management, conflict resolution, leadership. These are the programs that are embedded in this moving on program. Mr. Speaker, Project Dawn. And we had a situation where <clears throat> this Democratic Labour Party that got in St. John and said that there's nothing <clears throat> for unstructured persons on this island. And hence, when I started, Mr. Speaker, I said dogs bark at people they don't know. And we have a situation where in 2008, they killed Project Oasis. Absolutely shut down Project Oasis. And all of those guys who reside on the blocks or who lie across the blocks in this island were forgotten. But then they tell you that they care. And then they produced this in 2008, this nonsense that they call a youth manifesto. But I speak to Project Dawn, a new initiative. There's a block committee at the ministry, three-man block committee, Marcus Stephen, Shane Haynes, sorry, Mr. Speaker, I know, and Hassani Newton. And these guys are tasked with going on blocks across this island to ascertain the needs of those youngsters on the blocks, to gather information in terms of how we should treat to these guys and ladies who are on the blocks across this island. Mr. Speaker, today I am pleased to report that almost 200 blocks were visited on this island. 17 businesses were started out of this particular program from youngsters on the blocks. We launched this program in the Honorable Member for St. Andrew's constituency where 20 plus acres of land were provided to men on the blocks at Bell Plain to farm. He will speak to what is happening at that location. Mr. Speaker, we have provided technical assistance where those guys who want to get involved in landscaping were provided with an opportunity to source equipment for their landscaping project. The only thing we ask is that they register a business and come back to us. Let us see that you are serious and this is something that we will assist you with. Mr. Speaker, sir, similar to Project Oasis where the Democratic Labour Party said that all of the guys who we gave landscaping equipment to sold the equipment as soon as we turn our back. At the time, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education asked us to go to the same youngsters that we assisted to help with cleaning the schools for this new school term. Every single block turned up to clean schools. The same people that sold the equipment turned up to clean schools, Mr. Speaker. But what is happening this year? We are now tasked with assisting the Honorable Minister of Education with cleaning her school plants. And we have reached out to those guys who we have provided landscaping equipment to. Mr. Speaker, they are now engaged, some of them engaged at the National Sports Council to assist us with cleaning those schools. The Honorable Member has two more minutes. Wow, Mr. Speaker. Time flies, my friend. I am now getting started. I don't remember time flies. No, I, I, I understand that. Mr. Speaker, this program will be expanded, and I know that we will see the benefits. For the first time in 12 years last year, Mr. Speaker, we had a National Youth Award that will be repeated this year. 
because we need to highlight the positive things that our young people are doing on island. And I take this opportunity to invite the nation to nominate those persons who you think are fit to be involved in our National Youth Awards. The Youth Hotline, Mr. Speaker, is another initiative that is happening. Mr. Speaker, there's a, MC, a youth MC program that we are initiating at the ministry started last year to provide an opportunity for our young people to be able to stand up and to present at any function on this island. And that is something, Mr. Speaker, that I am looking forward to seeing again. All of our, all of our programs, Mr. Speaker, are going to be expanded through additional satellite locations across the country. The Youth Achieving Results, um, the National Summer Camp Program, we provide leadership training to youth and community organizations. The Barbados National Youth Parliament comes under us as well, Mr. Speaker. We have gone into the prison system to provide an opportunity for those persons who are in our target population to reintegrate into the mainstream society by providing training in programs that are coming from Paul Marine, Mr. Speaker, and these programs are oversubscribed. So, Mr. Speaker, we do not need a fake manifesto in order to impact the lives of our young people on island. We are doing it on a day-by-day -day basis at the Ministry of Youth, Sports, and Community Empowerment. And we will continue. The Honorable Member um, would have mentioned that there's a brain dream. Mr. Speaker, my ministry is also the Ministry of Aviation because I don't understand how you can give the young people in Barbados wings and then you're telling them, don't fly. It don't make any sense to me, Mr. Speaker. So we will continue and I want to thank the staff at the ministry for the hard work that they're doing year in and year out to impact the lives of our young people because our mantra there is that we must facilitate the needs and aspirations of all young people on this island. Mr. Speaker, I am obliged. Honorable Member St. Thomas. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I want to take this opportunity to say we are extremely proud today in Barbados for the astute leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, that the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast. And if I had my own way, she will now be called the Right Honorable Prime Minister because she deserves it. And when you put a woman in front, Mr. Speaker, that woman with the support of all of those around her, male, female, the young, and so on, and she continues to do a good job, she should be honored and respected. I hail her as the first female prime minister in this country who has come and made excellent progress in the development of this country when we, she took over in the harshest of times, financially and otherwise. I say kudos to her and the team not only the team that are members of parliament, but the people of Barbados who had put confidence in her to be able to win all 30 seats in the government, not once, but twice, her performance will have to be excellent. And that of the people of Barbados, and we are proud, Mr. Speaker. And I say that from my heart because we just celebrated International Women's Day last week, and we have to hail our female leaders as we have our males in this society and wherever else in the world. She is a prime minister of class who is recognized across the world for her role, particularly in the climate change fight. And every community, every society that she has visited and those who do not even know her, but have read it in the, on the internet, are talking about this honorable member of the prime minister of Barbados. May God continue to bless her and the people of this country and the rest of the world. Mr. Speaker, sir, I also want to indicate, sir, that the legacy of the Barbados Labour Party continues. We have had astute leaders of the past who built this society, and I must say, the Right Honorable 
Errol Walton Barrow, if you let me call his name, sir, was a member of the Barbados Labor Party too. But when he changed, he made a tremendous difference in this country. And now today we are saddled with a member who would be here with us. And I'm not even going to go down the world to talk about how often he has been in this honorable chamber defending and lending support to those wonderful people of Christ Church South who were always accustomed to proper representation by their members of parliament. Right. Mr. Speaker, sir, I am not happy today. Our leaders of this Barbados Labour Party of the past were visionary. They were honest and upright. They were progressive. They were astute leaders. And I don't have to call their names, you know, all of them within the past many years. I also want to say, Mr. Speaker, sir, our leader continues to lead by example, and the people of Barbados are extremely proud to have a leader of the caliber of the honorable member for St. Michael Northeast. Mr. Speaker, sir, we, are, we saw articles in the paper last week about persons who have criticized this Barbados Labour Party and some of those Democratic Labour Party members who went on the ground for the past six or so years are now coming like flies in the night. <laughs> to be able to say what they did, that honorable member of the Democratic Labour Party who became the Minister of Youth had a project called Endless Possibilities. And I always call it here, sir, Endless Impossibilities because we can't talk of young people who got employed. If it is a handful, Mr. Speaker, they were locked. That honorable member, sir, almost gave me connections. When that honorable member with his team went to Rock Hall Freedom Village with teams of people from his constituency in Christchurch, and not a boy or girl, woman or man got a piece of employment in extending that Rock Hall Freedom Village. And that Freedom Village, by the time two years had elapsed thereafter, everything with the handrails and everything started to fall apart, Mr. Speaker. More millions of dollars belonging to the government would have gone into that failed project because it was not properly done or managed. So when I hear of those things, I could also talk, Mr. Speaker, sir, of a number of other areas where we had challenges because the housing neighborhood, uh, excuse me, the housing neighborhood project that was assigned for green fields, the garden land, Allen View, and there was one other community in the St. Michael community, sir. The Cass Castle, sir. The millions of dollars, I think there were 30 million US dollars, 60 million, million Barbados dollars. None was spent at Allen View, Mr. Speaker, sir. Green's fields be, 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 remain the same way, sir. Cass Castle without, and the then Minister, Member of Parliament for the city told his constituents, and they have the correspondence, say which part of your house won't fix in. We're going to change the roof. They were not a part of it in that way. And those communities remain impoverished until this Barbados Labour Party came and said, we are of refurbishing people's houses. Rural development and urban development will undertake upgrading because those people deserve waterborne facilities, sir. They deserved all the services that we enjoy because we have the position with the funding that we work for daily to be able to do it, but those persons don't have the employment. This Barbados Labour Party in 2018, Mr. Speaker, came in as a government and transformed and changed the all the realm. We heard about the sewage already on the streets in Christchurch. I'm not going to talk about that. We had buses that were breaking down here, there, and everywhere. Roads falling apart, Mr. Speaker, now drive through Barbados. I became a little confused at first, about two years ago, because I saw St. Andrew getting something, St. Peter getting something with the roads and projects. I am thankful today, sir, the people of St. Thomas who have sent me here to represent their interests not once or twice or three or four times or five times, sir, six times because I am committed to the cause. 
And I will come here to this honorable chamber, sir, every week, every month, every time that we are meeting because I have the interests of the people who put me here at heart. The honorable member is absent again today. We came here yesterday and sat to listen to him for, for five hours and did not even have the courtesy to be here as the honorable leader of the opposition. But you know what? If he had had the common sense that I do not have, or I, I had not, have not gotten, having never ever sat in a fist form in a school yet, the reasoning would have said, make the president that you have just superseded a senator. It would have made a difference. Mr. Speaker, sir, they walked out yesterday. Two ladies remain, perhaps like me, out of respect, faithful to the cause. And therefore, I am hurting today to see and to hear some of what was said yesterday about this budget that has transformed the Barbados under the Barbados Labour Party that has had a track record, record of the highway to way, tenantries first before purchase act. And now these projects that are coming up, the Youth Advanced Corps, to lift our young people out of crime and violence and poverty and putting them on platform. The training programs, and I am so proud, Mr. Speaker, today, I spoke last week, I spoke last month, I spoke last year, I spoke four years ago to ordinary police officers, and I'm not saying that in any derogatory way. I said, sir, I have so many young people who would love, who would love to join the police force, but you know what? They say, ma'am, the salary ain't nothing. The salary ain't saying much, and you work too hard. I am proud to see the changes that this honorable member, our prime minister, has put in place to ensure that there's security for the police officers. Not only for them, sir, but also for the nurses and the doctors and the teachers and all others who deserve to get an opportunity to improve themselves. We know, Mr. Speaker, sir, of some experiences in the last administration too, because you know, Mr. Speaker, sir, I keep my notes. Mm -hmm. And I would remember a disabled man who was robbed, according to what the record said, of his property. So we can't talk character and all that, and don't make sure that we look after our own and that we live that upright life, that as leaders in this society, people can say, especially young people, and um, bright people, they don't have to be rich because we have not come from any rich environments. You remember for St. Peter came through the harm pipe like us. But we are here to represent the interests of all Barbadians. And let that, St. Lucy, sir, St. Peter too. But we are here to let people know we can come here and be honest and forthright and represent your interests because we understand we have been there we have worked along with others, and we are going to make the tremendous change. And it is happening, sir, you look around here. All of us, or the majority of us, have come out of poverty. But we have determined when we reach here, we are going to reach back into society and uplift these young people, uplift these older people, and give them an opportunity or lay a platform that they can build on. So when I speak, Mr. Speaker, sir, and people talk about, the honorable member for the, the, the Christchurch South talked about corruption. I have in my hand, sir, and if I had the opportunity to go to the campaign house to search the box, I would have brought a file of things in here today that tells me, uh, tell me what is maintenance and home services, sir. The chandeliers that were at government house are still missing. And the document is here. Where are they now? Honorable, there's a document. The house, you make this a document. I the house. can make it a document of the house, sir. I believe it does have it already because it was not easy, especially when they had my parliamentary questions. Because I know what it is like to be in poverty, and I know what it's like to be honest and upright. Because our parents and four parents and the villages taught us to be honest and upright and godly more than anything Honourable else. Honorable, you're making a document. I have it here, sir. You I, can have what it. What year as is it? Huh? What year, sir? Yes, please. 2012, sir. Oh, I just want for the record. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I, and then we hear about a trans tech document here again for one vehicle for somebody. Another one here again, Mr. Speaker. The honorable member for the opposition cannot come in here and speak that, sir. And I have a whole lot of things, sir. Notes and everything else. And I came with parliamentary questions to question the summer camps that were free. When a member of parliament, we understood 
was able to raise 300 and something thousand dollars over a five week period for feeding young children. All kinds of corruption went wrong, went on. And we have come in here as honest white members of this society to serve the people of Barbados. So I am proud, Mr. Speaker, this evening, sir, to be able to associate myself with the wonderful things that this government have, has done with the vision and the guidance and the collaborative approach by an honorable prime minister who understands her role and has worked with us together as a team to make a difference in the lives of Barbadians. Mr. Speaker, sir, the police, I said, are happy to have known that they are being recognized and they're they going to be given opportunities that they can excel. The nurses, mm -hmm. the teachers, the disabled, and not, not, not only that, sir, my favorite people that I am in the category two, the, 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 the aged, sir, I might be a little disabled sometimes, and that comes with the age, but sir, I'm talking about the aged, our senior citizens who have built this country, who are out there suffering in a way. And the Democratic Labour Party never ever, it was this Barbados Labour Party under the astute leadership of the former member and right honorable member for St. Peter, who helped to start up a project called, a ministry called Social Transformation. And out of it has come the senior games where seniors go and enjoy themselves every year, and the BAMSAC and this person and the next group and so are all in it together because our seniors must remain healthy. We are suffering with too many comorbidities, too many diseases that are brought on in old age in particular. We want our older people to remain healthy because they are living longer and better. And therefore, that, is, that touched my heart. When we see the Youth Advanced Corps and to hear the results of those young people who never had a chance to be able to go out there and be properly disciplined. Who never got a chance to write a CXC because their parents were so impoverished like mine that they could not even pay for the CXCs. We heard about the results last week, Mr. Speaker, sir, and the great performance of those young people in their studies, not only in the academics, but their discipline and the ideas they have, and the young bus businesses they're trying to develop. That is what I got called progressive development of a party, the Barbados Labour Party, that means a better life for our people as it lives to that motto that has been there for many, many years. God bless our pioneers, because without them, the pioneers in the Labour Party in particular, but then again, when I studied the right the excellent um, uh, Walton Barrow, he was a Barbados Labour Party supporter too, but he came here with a different vision and he developed the Democratic Labour Party different and contrary to the Honourable Member for Christchurch South, who has not been in this Honourable Chamber for so many times before he demitted office without even giving us the courtesy or telling his constituency, I gone. He would say, I am going, I, I, I beg your pardon, sir. He wouldn't say it in slang like me. I am going, I have had enough of the Barbados Labour Party. Already the Democratic Labour Party has shown him, I have had enough of you too, because they walked out yesterday evening. I left two decent ladies there, not that the others weren't decent, but left them there because they were like me, faithful to the end. Faithful to the end. Mr. Speaker, sir, the unemployed, they get the benefits too. And all sectors in this society have been able to benefit by this Barbados Labour Party because we have a compassionate, caring government under the astute leadership of the Honourable Member for St. Michael Northeast. Mr. Speaker, sir, I also want to say that the projects that are going now, let, let me get to the disabled or the differently able, because they too are the ones that deserve extra attention and this Labour Party has been extending it to them and their parents and recognizing it is not easy to raise a child that is challenged. The Honourable Minister for Education, who is carrying on the mantra that was left by then, the member, Honourable uh, member, uh, Minister, in the times when we were there, when we have started to look at reform, and that's where EduTech came from. That is where the testing for those children who were hard of hearing came about with Dr. Ben Stabler. Those are the areas when we looked at upgrading school meals and what was being offered to our children as meals. That is when we were paying the fees for university of the West Indies students, particularly poor people's children like we were. 
And that government came in 2008 and turned everything around. And now we are here again today, sitting and talking, all of us on this honorable side of the chamber, sir, and the leader of the opposition that has not been there three weeks, has not stepped in here yet today, it shows the callous-minded disrespect for this honorable chamber and for the people of Barbados, but more particularly, the people of Christchurch South who will speak with their mouths and write with their pens when the time comes, if he will last that long, sir. Mrs. Speaker, two more minutes. Yes, sir, two more minutes. Yes, sir, that's all right. I just want to say, I should have remembered earlier, too, that before Barbados was dismantled on the Democratic Labour Party, where those persons were cleaning the area of Harrison's Cave, the Project House at Sturges, cleaning all over Barbados, and they were dismantled. And apparently somebody who is now long gone would have been responsible for building a house over, a, a, a building, excuse me, sir, over in Vaucluse, a six-story building that not even the floors on some of the levels had even little concrete uh, or tiles. And I believe it is a sick building because I passed there this morning, it's empty. I am saying, and then they heard the person has millions of dollars that were in their bank account and all that. We are not a government or a party, sir, that looks after material things. And I believe that all these honorable members here will continue to carry that mantra of the Labour Party to serve, not to take for ourselves, to serve and to share and live with integrity in this particular society of ours. If politicians have to continue to be recognized and acknowledged and respected, they have to live up to a standard that when people look up to them, I want to be like him. I want to be like her because they know that we carry character after our names in this Barbados Labour Party. We shall continue to do it, Mr. Speaker. And we know that you, with your legal training, will help to guide us along as well to make sure that persons like myself, and I can't speak for the honorable member for St. Peter, but we will not be so familiar with the law. But we want to live within the law and serve the people of Barbados. I'm and so, Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to thank the honorable member uh, uh, for St. Michael Northeast. And I want to thank the people of Barbados for the confidence that they have bestowed in this Barbados Labour Party to be able to make a difference because at this time in our history, the upgrades to our worlds and all that, that is necessary if we are to be able to contribute to the growth and the development of this country and the stability that is necessary and the security that will come from the same armed forces and others to be able to let our visitors come to this island and to let us sleep in our beds and go to our various institutions knowing that we are safe and that there is prosperity, not only for us who are older, but for our youth who will come, because the platform has been laid by this Labour Party. May it continue forever. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm obliged to you. Thank you. Honourable Ramp, please sit here, Bridgestone. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I rise, I obviously want to express gratitude to God, my family, and of course, the people of the city of Bridgetown and wider Barbados for the opportunity and support to be here to speak to you this afternoon. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I send a special sh shout out to those around me in my constituency office my branch, the executive, because a lot of the times people see us stand here and they think we stand here alone. But we really stand here on the backs and the shoulders of those who support us. Mr. Speaker, my plan today really is to reply to the budget and not to reply to the reply of the budget. But I must start and say a little bit about that. I don't want to get too deep in it. I want to deal with people today because my heart is a little heavy, sir. But for me, I was a little disappointed in the reply to the budget. Because, sir, I was looking for constructive critique. I was looking for alternatives and solutions and suggestions that really as a listening and caring government that we could go back to the drawing board and make some adjustments. But sir, I was thoroughly disappointed because the individual knows better. I have heard many speeches from the individual 
and I have been impressed. And I don't believe just because you switch a chair, switch a chair, or switch a seat, that it should mean that that should diminish your presentation. Because if it was not on parliamentary, I believe you would have to rename him Ral Rambling Ralph, sir. Because while he was rambling, the rest of the LP was scrambling to get out of here. And I believe that for me, I came to hear, to digest, to be able to learn something and take it from heights to heights. But instead, we got rambling, sir. So I want to say from the outset that I support this appropriation bill, this financial and budgetary proposal exercise. Not because I am on this side, sir. Not only because I believe that it was a balanced budget for the right time, but because I feel an additional strength in supporting it because I got the privilege and opportunity of holding a small focus group within my constituency and I am the voice that they have sent in here and I want to talk a bit about what we spoke about in that focus group. So I want to start that on their behalf, sir, that they want to thank this administration and they want to thank the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast for no new taxes. That is the first thing the discussion started on. They want to thank her and us for good economic management. They are concerned, though, about the pass down effect. They said to me, the government is putting in effort at the port to save some money. They're easing the VAT and freezing some things and reducing some things, but they don't feel that they pass on. And they said, we got to get creative. I said, right around the world, governments struggle with that. How to get retailers to pass on their savings to the people and not put it in their profit margins. I confess to them right away, I don't have the answer. I don't, unless you're going to price controls, but that is a different story, sir. They want to say they are happy with the fact that we had 11 quarters of growth as opposed to 11 downgrades or even 23. So they want to thank the economic team for that. Sir, I explained to them that what that does is not only give us confidence in the investment market, but what that does is that allows for the government to have more fiscal, financial, elbow room, space for more social and economic activity, that which means more social and economic investment in them, that we are in a position to put programs in place for them to ensure that they have a better life. They talked about the continued ease on VAT on light bills. And they said not to September, sir. They said we would like to see it done as long as humanly possible or as long as economically possible. So I will advocate for that on their behalf. I don't know how successful I will be, but I will continue to advocate on it nonetheless. Sir, I would admit to the fact that they were not excited about the water saving devices but I had to explain to them and remind them two things. The precious nature of water, no matter the cost, but also the fact what my grandmother taught me, a dollar saved is a dollar earned. So it may not give you money up front, but it saves you money, which is money that you have earned. And I believe the majority of them understood. They sent out a special thank you for the increase they had in welfare during the time of COVID. A special thank you for the Adopt a Family program that provided $600 for the most vulnerable in this country. And a special thank you for the One, one Family program, which is now targeting a thousand of the most vulnerable families to bring them out of poverty. The former member for St. Peter, the former Prime Minister, as he said, our mission here is to do what? Stop poor people from being poor. And that program seeks to make sure that a thousand families are brought out of poverty. For me, sir, I know that the police, the artists, the students, the workers, the seniors, the nurses, all of them send their thank you. And they say thank you to the honorable member, the dear member from St. Michael Northeast for bringing up the right budget at the right time. So I want to say that this 2024 budget, when dissected, it is clear that not Barbados in general, but I want to talk about the city of Bridgetown. And its people will continue on a path for more development and more empowerment. With the upcoming World Cup, 
Bishop will speak to. I am very happy, Mr. Speaker, that since recent announcements, I've been able to meet with the National Organizing Committee, and I am a happy representative, a happy MP to know that the city of Bridgetown and Barbados will be benefiting directly from the World Cup through jobs, through vending opportunities, through enhancement in roads, in signage, and in some properties. And there will be some legacy events. And what do legacy events mean? It means that beyond World Cup, there are activities that will be started because of World Cup, but even after the last ball is bowled, that they will be seeing the benefits of World Cup. I will speak more to that at the right time in the right place. What I want to underscore is the Urban Renewal Project and also government's general plan to continue to improve the city of Bridgetown and its people. Because, Mr. Speaker, sir, I know that, I know the rules in relation to newspapers in the House of Parliament. I do. I was in youth parliament, sir. So I know that I laminate it, and it's a no, no longer a newspaper, it's a poster. And in the, on these posters, sir, in 1976, the 5th of May to be exact, we had an election coming up, and MP Craig, he was talking about a new life for Bridgetown residents. City slums must go. And we talked about Emerton, and how it was condemned to die. And since then, if you check the development of Bridgetown, whether it was the mayor of Bridgetown, whether it was Dame Billy Miller, whether it was Lieutenant Colonel, the most honorable Jeffrey Boston, and now this member for the city of Bridgetown, you can trace back and see that Bridgetown is on the up and on, the on and up. And it ain't done yet, sir, because what we are about to see is the type of urban rene renewal that we not only need, but that we deserve. Mr. Speaker, sir, when we talk about the Bridgetown Redevelopment Plan, what does this mean? It means social and economic upliftment for the people. It means housing redevelopment. It means roads and drainage improvement. It means climate resilient urban cities. It sounds like a fancy word, but it means that what we will do is ensure that as we build and as we develop, that we can withstand what the climate change and climate crisis has in store for us. If you look around, you would see the continued investment in the Constitution River project, Fairchild Street, Temple Yard, Pelican Village, the building blocks, and so many more. And these are areas that we know that we not only need, but that we deserve. My major development for development, sir, is not just development for development's sake but development to provide employment and economic opportunities for the people. It is not about the concrete. It is not about the steel. It is not about the galvanized. It is not about the nails. But it is about the young men and women, senior men and women, and middle-aged men and women getting that opportunity to live their best lives. I move on quickly, sir, because I don't want you to have to tell me about the time. But I want to tell you that jobs and houses and housing is the two biggest concerns expressed to me by my people, and I have redoubled my efforts to do my best to make sure that as many of my constituencies or, or constituents are properly housed and properly employed. That is the mission. Mr. Speaker, sir, I quickly turn to crime prevention. I am happy to hear about the step in the right direction for the police, and I know many more steps will come. But I like to connect the dots. I like to think critically. I like to think deeply. And therefore, I put to the people of Barbados that crime prevention platform of this administration, it goes deep and it goes wide. That is why the ramping up of poverty alleviation by the Honorable Member from SMS, St. Michael South, is linked to the idea of crime prevention. The work of the Honorable Member from St. Philip West in relation to education transformation is linked to crime prevention. The excellent work and the confidence-led investment led by the economic and finance team are all exciting to me because these help treat to the secondary level root causes and the social determinants of crime. At the deep root cause level, I believe that we are on the right track tackling the issues such as parenting, childhood and other traumas, low self-esteem, boredom, 
lack of motivation, and other deep-rooted causes. Working closely with the Youth Development and the Honorable Member from St. John, we are moving forward to ensure that we have exciting programs. I give an example, the National Peace Program, which is anchored in the Office of the Attorney General Crime Prevention. And I invite the public to judge it for yourselves. Judge the results, honestly. In that program, we have six pillars, sir, and a three-phase approach, utilizing, utilizing some time and tested and proven concepts. The three phases really was to reduce the heat on the street. You can judge that for yourself. Prevent criminal activity where we can see the introduce, we make sure that the Ministry of Environment is cutting the grass, the lights, the cameras are there, that we can prevent criminal activity. But the major one, the third one, sir, is to prevent criminals in the first place. And that is why we have to work with the parents and work with the young people of this country to ensure that they don't get involved in crime in the first place. And how do we do that, sir? We do that by using a concept we call entertain, brand, train, and sustain. Entertain to bring them in, then work on the brain, personal development, that mindset change, and then we train them, and then we put them into sustainable activity. They don't want nothing to do with crime anymore, sir, because they got a job, they got a career, they got employment. Therefore, they can feed themselves and their family, and they feel like they're somebody in this country. They got self-esteem, and they're on a path of progress, a path that this administration will give to its people. And that is what we are doing. Sir, we live in a region where the top 10 islands of the Caribbean have seen between 21 murders in every 100,000, up to 50, over 50 murders for every 100,000. We in this paradise have now recently moved from a high of 17 murders in every 100,000, sir, to seven in every 100,000, putting us up there with the more developed world. But however, we will not rest on this reduction because the 10 Lewis stand between 0 0.1 to 0 0.6, or the other way around, 0 0.6 up to 0 0.1. We had a prison all and new with inmates ranging from 1,000 almost going to 1,200. Today, it stands about in the high 600s to the low 700s. So it tells me that we are doing something right and we are moving in the right direction. The National Crime Prevention Plan, Project 180, has identified 180 things that this country can do in a serious way towards crime prevention over the next three years. 67 of those are located in the Office of the Attorney General Crime Prevention, and 25 have been completed thus far. It is only because of the economy of time that it falls upon me that I could not list them right now. But I am sure that the time is coming close where I can put it in a document and have it as a document of the House. We at the Attorney General, sir, will continue to work to ensure that Barbados is a peaceful, safe, secure, and just society. In closing, as we continue to put people first, each and every one of us, all 29, 30 of us, to put people first, I believe that we are transforming Barbados to be a better place for all of our people. Let us stay the course towards a morally grounded, socially cohesive, economically prosperous, technologically sensible, environmentally friendly, and people-centered paradise. Mr. Speaker, sir, I support this Appropriation Bill 2024, and I am obliged. I thank you. Honorary Member, Mr. Microsoft Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, I intend to go directly to the meat of the issue. Perhaps as a vegetarian, I shouldn't use that analogy. But to the heart of the conversation in this honorable place. First, to address some of what we were forced to endure by way of a budget reply yesterday. And then, to be able to reflect on some of the measures in the Honorable Prime Minister's budgetary
proposals and financial statement. Sir, there has been much discussion about the question of debt. And while others have addressed it in various ways, I think it is extremely important because debt and the way we manage it will continue to be a part of our economic management program in this country. And there were certain representations made in this honorable place yesterday by the leader of the opposition that suggests to me that he perhaps was somewhere else while this country and all Barbadians were holding on, hanging on to at the precipice for dear life for a decade. And it is something that, it is something that I do not take lightly. And, and when the Honorable Member for Christchurch East Central spoke yesterday, perhaps what you perceived in his reaction, the passion and the outrage in some regard, comes from the fact that it has been no easy task to repair the damage that was done by a Democratic Labour Party administration. And, and, and people like the Honorable Member for Christchurch East Central and I often feel as if we were sitting in our various places almost minding our own business. But embarrassed to be Barbadian economists in an economy that was being flushed completely down the toilet while we watched. And that is perhaps the reason that you see us in this honorable place today. Not unlike the member for Christchurch South, driven by any aspirations for high office, but driven only by the desperate situation in which we found our country. And so we heard yesterday, sir, that debt reprofiling, the debt reprofiling that the Democratic Labour Party and the then Minister of Finance wanted to do is gentle. <laughs> debt reprofiling is gentle. And, the, and, and, and the, the, the suggestion was that what we had to do to rescue the economy by way of debt restructuring is not gentle. But you know what, is, what else is gentle, sir? Gentleness is often used as, ex as an excuse for the impotent. Impotence is full of gentle, flaccid, good intent <laughs> that can neither meet the circumstances of the moment nor rise to the occasion. <laughs> that is some of what we heard in here yesterday. <laughs> and that was regrettably the approach and the orientation of the former Minister of Finance for the Democratic Labour Party in his approach to debt reprofiling. This is a man and an administration that created $18.1 billion in debt and then came to the people of Barbados and said, this is what you're going to do for you. I'm going to reprofile the debt gently, gently, sir, and I'm going to save $70 million. The grand plan that the former Minister of Finance had to save the country from $18.1 billion in debt was to gently reprofile it to the tune of $70 million out of an $18.1 billion debt. Yes, reprofiling is gentle and impotent and flaccid. And that was all that the then Democratic Labour Party could bring to address the debt overhang and the crisis that existed at the time. And then we keep hearing about this notion that the debt restructuring destroyed the sustainability of the national insurance scheme. You know, there are those who start fires 
watch the fire catch, and then run outside and start screaming, there's a fire. And that is exactly what this represents. Because the only reason that the national insurance scheme was hit so hard by a debt restructuring was that it was overexposed to government borrowing in the first place against the warning of those from the investment committee who said to the then government, this is too much borrowing, this is too far, this is going to threaten our sustainability. And having ignored that warning, then we are being told that the debt restructuring that we had to do destroyed the sustainability of the NIS, which is also false. So the debt restructuring cost $805 million to the NIS because of its overexposure. Now, and we've heard before as we went through the process of putting forward proposals for how we keep the NIS sustainable, National Insurance Fund, if that 0.8 billion or so had been saved, it would have grown to about 1.9 billion. But even that 1.9 billion could only have saved the National Insurance Fund three years in terms of sustainability. So the straw man that is being set up is really to suggest that this Barbados Civil Party administration and our economic management team caused harm. When really the harm was caused by people who did not understand that you cannot keep borrowing over and over again from your domestic institutions like the National Insurance Scheme and the Central Bank without putting them under threat. And then when we had to come and take a bold decision to restructure domestic and external debt, we are, it is suggested that that was too far. But I want to go a little bit further on that matter. We were told similarly in this chamber yesterday that the letter regarding the decision to restructure the debt and the engagement of the parties who supported us in that endeavor was signed five days after the Prime Minister was sworn in. And yes, it is true that the debt restructuring was announced on the 1st of June 2018. But I want the Honorable Leader of the Opposition to then count the days before the payment was due in that same month that would have wiped out by half the little bit of reserves that the Democratic Labour Party had left. The reserves stood at 220 million or about five weeks. The payment that was due to credit on that Credit Suisse loan by the end of that month, would have cut that out by half. That would have put us at two weeks of reserves. But some people just go on vacation for more than that, sir. <laughs> Not anybody in here. But I'm going to go further with this, with this Credit Suisse loan, sir. Because There is something called a collective action clause that is sometimes enacted in debt instruments. And all that means is that in the event of a debt restructuring, a collective action clause means that only 75% of the creditors have to agree to a way forward, and that will bind the other creditors to an agreement on what they will accept in the restructuring. I want to say something about the Credit Suisse facility that was agreed by the government of Barbados in late 2013. It was for the amount of US 150 million. So when they done rent out the NIS and they done rent out the central bank, it was for US 150 million. With a five year maturity, sir, well, by the time you blink, it's time to pay that back. So I don't know who negotiate that. A five year maturity, it was increased to 225 million in 2014 and the maturity was extended by one year to 2019. The interest payable on it was linked to Barbados's credit rating. And it had therefore increased significantly over the years with numerous downgrades to 12% and climbing at the end of 2017. That was 
the loan that would have come due in a significant payment by the end of June, and that was the way that it was negotiated. But sir, the irony of it is that the same people that we were supposed to not have paid for their work to restructure the debt were the same ones that managed to achieve the following. Remember, the Credit Suisse loan did not have in those collective action clauses that would have meant that once you get 75% of the creditors to agree, everybody has to agree. The Credit Suisse loan didn't have that. It was not negotiated with that. So it meant that everybody involved had to agree to the terms. Sir, I am quoting from an IMF report of 2020 that makes an assessment of Barbados's debt restructuring. I encourage everybody to read it. It says that in November 2013 press release, the government announced overwhelming creditor support for the debt exchange with participation well above the 75% threshold for the three outstanding euro bonds. But I want to make this point about the people that were maligned in here for doing the work to bring about one of the most successful debt restructurings in debt history. Not in the Caribbean, not in the Western Hemisphere, but in the world, independently assessed to be so. The participation rate in the Credit Suisse facility, these people did not have to agree because it, it had no collective action clause. They could have held out, sir, for the next 40 years. The participation rate in the Credit Suisse facility, based on negotiation of the team that was representing Barbados, came in at 100%. On December 11, 2019, the transaction closed with full creditor participation. Yeah. Sir, on the same day and in response to the completion of the debt exchange, Standard & Poor's upgraded Barbados's foreign currency sovereign credit rating from selective default to B negative. And these are the people. Nobody thought it could be done. These are the people that, 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 that you come in here and malign and suggest that they took advantage of a government. It is not they who took advantage of a government or the people of Barbados. It was a Democratic Labour Party administration in this country. But sir, there's something else that I want to get to. And it is the notion represented in here yesterday that we've had no capital expenditure. I, I, you know, I really believe sometimes in just getting yourself ready for battle. Because you are facing a Barbados Labour Party administration that has done the work and that has the receipts. And you come in here ill-informed, having just woken up, not ready to have a real conversation. So let us have a real conversation, sir. In 10 years of capital expenditure by a Democratic Labour Party government, and when we talk about capital expenditure, what we're trying to say is this. How do we spend the money, expend the resources to be able to make sure that people are employed, to make sure that we create the infrastructure to build confidence and, 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 and get people to invest and, and make sure that business works, things like roads and, and mobile networks and so on. Houses, schools, the things that Barbadians determine are important in the way of capital works to their lives and to the expansion of their choices. And that is why capital expenditure is important to an economy. In 10 years of a Democratic Labour Party government, they were able to achieve, the highest capital expenditure they were able to achieve was 2.6. Actually, their highest capital expenditure 
interestingly, came on the heels of a, of a, of a Barbados Labour Party government. 2.6 in 2008-9, which means they were picking up some of the projects that a Barbados Labour Party government had started, and that was the highest number. You see, sir, the peak at the beginning, that's a bad sign. That, that is a bad sign, as most in here would appreciate. You be need careful. to finish strong, sir. I remember we care for you analogies. Just be careful. I feel I'm still on the right side, sir, but I'll take your guidance. I remember, I fully understand you. So they only managed to, they got that high on the back of our CapEx program coming out of 2007. They got to 2.6. This is as a percent of GDP, sir. Now, sir, the highest that this Barbados Labour Party government was able to achieve over the last six years is a high of 4.1% of GDP over the last six years. In fact, in fact, our highest expenditure came in circumstances where the country was at a standstill. The country was shutting down. It was during COVID. We saw that we had 425 million dollars in capex in 21, 22, and 476 million in 22, 23. So our and furthermore, they never even managed to reach the expenditure that we saw in the height of COVID. This is a Democratic Labour Party administration that had 10 years to get themselves together. But sir, the final point I want to make in this, on this is this. Over the last six years, the CapEx for this administration has reached 1,835 million over six years. Over 10 years, with four more years, they didn't even manage to get that high. Coming in only at 1,800 million. And they had 10 years to do it. So even not having gotten to the 10 year mark, we are still far far ahead. And, 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 and that is why I don't understand how a leader of the opposition can leave a side where he, will, he would have had a record of which, not to boast, but with which to demonstrate sound leadership and good management, but instead he chooses to associate himself with the worst results, arguably, that this country has ever seen by any economic team or any government since independence. Why would why we choose to associate in that way? Sir, I want to turn to the budget, budgetary proposals and the financial statement that we heard from the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast, the Honorable Prime Minister, on Monday. And you know what strikes me, sir, is this is not an ordinary budget. I don't know how many people realize that. This, having gone through Bert Wan, Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Plan, the first iteration, where we were focused on stabilization. Now that we are at BERT 2, this is the platform for growth. But you know, sir, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition talked about wanting to remove elitist structures. I don't know how a man could want to remove elitist structures and holding on so desperately to King's Council after his name. Don't want to get rid of KC at all, at all, at all. In this new republic that he's so proud of. Maybe these things jump me every time I look at the TV. That's how we want to associate, and you're talking about removing elitist structures? But sir, if there has ever 
been any example of a rebalancing and redistribution of resources and opportunity in a budget. It is in this budget. And I'll tell you what I mean. These budgetary proposals have managed in regularizing these legacy concessional arrangements that we heard the Honorable Prime Minister talk about, where people are coming with tight set agreements and saying, I am still entitled to concessions, not having proven how many jobs you've brought or continue to bring, not having proven how much foreign exchange, not having proven how you're upgrading the plant, or making sure that workers' rights are protected. But you believe that you can hold on to concessions for 30 and 40 years, and we are saying no. It is not an anti-investment posture at all. It is a pro-investment posture that seeks to make sure that government is investing its tax expenditure where it matters and where it helps people. And so we require those people to reapply and to be reassessed while we do what, sir? While we bring that concessionary space to the groups and sectors that most need it and that can least afford to go without it. And so we see, sir, that we have, for example, not legacy concessions to large, big, in some cases, foreign business, but 25% tax credit to boost the 50% research and development tax that already exists, research and development tax credit that already exists for oceans and greening the economy. 50% tax credit on centers that are offering artificial intelligence, coding, robotics, and digital training. 50% 50, 50 tax credit for laboratories. And then there's the range of tax credits and other concessions that relate to the community of people living with disabilities, that relate to centers that offer care. This is what a redistributive budget that is focused not on consolidating wealth into the hands of those who already have, but on making sure that those who we must involve in the growth path are set up to thrive and prosper. I dare say, sir, I have worked throughout the region, throughout an American and Caribbean. You know, <laughs> some say that there is one of our characters in Barbadian lore that says famously, I have been all over the world and other places too. And I feel as if I've had enough exposure to economic policy to know that this is an unusual thing. A government that seeks out, that tries to find all of the ways in which people may be missing the best of the opportunity and then writes that into its financial proposals. You know, we say in public finance that you can tell a country's priorities by its budget. And look at the priorities that have been outlined. Care, people with disabilities, the innovation sector, young people, small business. This is the platform for growth here, sir. And I want to say that the Ministry of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology is perhaps not to boast, but perhaps one of the sectors that is most poised to be able to deliver that. We determined, sir, that one of the only ways that we are going to get out of inflationary cycles, get out of the trap where you are moving wages, but then prices follow. That's what happens, you know. You try to move wages along to try and match inflation, but guess what? Wages are, wages are a price. The other prices are going to follow. So how do we seek to index wages then to growth and productivity? Which is one of the things we have to figure out. But the way to, to, to settle this once and for all, really, is to increase wages organically. To be able to say, actually, we're creating high income sectors. Everybody who works in these sectors will be making more money because of the nature of the sector. The data and technology sector 
has to be that sector. So that we're not just buying software and putting in immigration or putting in the office of the Attorney General, so that we are creating an ecosystem of startups and scale-ups and other local and regional companies that are building for us, that are solving local problems, and then saying to the rest of the world, look, we solved this problem for Barbados, we solved this problem for Jamaica, we're gonna come and solve it for you. That is the industry that we have to create. The reason the data center is going to be built is that that data center is gonna power that industry. Now, we have some work to do, and I very much appreciate the posture of the Honorable Minister in the other place, the Minister for Health and Wellness, when he came to this place and he said, I am not happy with everything at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. I am not happy with everything in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast, the Honorable Prime Minister, mm. had a similar approach when she said, look, I'm gonna call it as I see it. What do we have to clean up? What do we have to do better? What do we have to fix? Mist is in a similar place where we have to say simply, look, we have created GovTech, brand new agency that is going to be responsible for the execution of online services to all people. And then the ministry will be responsible for policy, regulation, the directorate to say, what are the policy orientations that we take while that agency is delivering to various ministries, departments, and agencies? Your Honor, remember has two more minutes. So, sir, one of the things that we have to, I thank you, one of the things that we have to realize, though, is that there is a lot of work to be done. And this is the kind of area where we have to bring everybody along. One of my very talented officers, he's not my officer, but he's one of the officers of the ministry. My team members, I like to feel like we are a team, was discussing with me yesterday the need for public key infrastructure. What is that? That is going to, that is the entire building out of a digital trust service framework. That means what? The only way that we can really move fully to an online environment for all documents is to have digital signatures and certificates. Right now, people sign things, use a seal, all kinds of fancy ways to use paper. The only way that we're gonna move away from that is to bring in this infrastructure and it calls for all of us to be there. So whether it is the Trident ID, the cybersecurity, the cybercrime legislation, which we need to keep people safe, the Electronic Transactions Act, which we have to revisit, the Data Protection Act of 2019, which we have to perhaps build out, this is going to be an ongoing conversation in this country, but I want Barbadians to understand that just like with a hurricane, just like with the climate crisis, the, 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 the action is not to do nothing. If we do nothing, we are going to be caught unawares and we are going to be at risk to the worst elements out there. I'm asking Barbadians to come along with the Ministry of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology, to come along with the government of Barbados, to have the important conversations about what is the balance of data privacy and protection along with the need for services and the enjoyment of all of our choices in this new and growing Barbados. Barbados is a buzz, sir. It is a buzz. It is not just a buzz with economic activity, but with the conversations on transformation that are gonna allow us to take full advantage of that economic activity with all Barbadians involved. I dare us to dream, not to hope, but to dream and to execute together. Sir, I'm obliged to you. I member Christchurch by Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. First, allow me the opportunity to thank God Almighty uh, for being here. I want to also, in the same voice, express my gratitude to the good people of the epicenter of Christchurch, Christchurch. West Central, who basked in the sun two days ago to ensure that they were there to support me. I want to also thank my family for being um, the strength to help me in my efforts. But not only did they come to support me on Monday, 
but they also give me a message today to give the rest of Barbados. They have told me in an unequivocal voice that they found Monday's presentation, budgetary proposal, to be a current proposal. They told me, in their opinion, it was compassionate. And they also told me that it was comforting for them, their families, and their extended friends. That is what the good people of Christ Church West Central asked me to say on their behalf. And I want Mr. Speaker to say that the budget delivered on Monday was a budget for every single day of the week. It was magnificent on Monday as it relates to how we treat to the most vulnerable in this country. There was something for the young people as it relates to education with the master teachers. The, for the disabled, you get you understand that their non-contributory um, arrangement for persons with special um, conditions will be extended to that group. And of course, for the people who touch my heart and titillate me more than anybody else, the elderly. And we recognize that there are no tax credits for those persons who are in the twilight of their years when it comes to building elder care facilities. Mr. Speaker, sir, it was a well-balanced budget. F, it was as balanced as nature itself when it's not interfered with by certain people. Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to say to you that it was the budget um, executed and articulated by the Member of Parliament for St. Michael Northeast at the right time for the right occasion. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to say, because there are a lot of atmospheric, I will call it atmospheric noise, it may be mesospheric because it's gone beyond the atmosphere. In Barbados, as it relates to the travel, and especially the travel of the Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, prior to 2018, Barbados looked at way off the cuff. There was no mention of Barbados, no place in the world. And what has the Prime Minister done and this government done since coming to office post-2018? You've now heard about a debt for nature climate swap, which would free up in terms of savings on our debt, the better part of $50 million for marine conservation and built out over the next 10, 15 years. Mr. Speaker, the work and effort of our Prime Minister who has traveled the length of breath of this world to ensure that Barbados has a voice and a space. Mr. Speaker, sir, the much talk about Bridgetown Initiative and I want us to understand, and you can change the name because for me it's a Bayesian initiative. The Bridgetown Initiative, articulated and put together by a group of Barbadians, homegrown talent, a, a, an initiative that seeks to disrupt that which was normal, that, artificial, that uh, architecture, that financial architecture, which um, seeks to dissipate our small and developing states and disadvantage us. Where those big financial institutions, multilateral development banks as we know it, where that we would, they would allow by opening their arms to us, using special drawing rights and special instruments so that we can be able to ascertain loans at the two and three percent, like the other big countries. Right now, we are paying the better part of 15 something, between 15 to 20 percent, where these same loans are paid, to, are given to other countries at two and three percent. And we say that that was not fair to the two billion people who live in the tropics. Remember, Mr. Speaker, there are two billion people every single day that can't get a drink of uh, fresh water. Two billion people in the tropics who contribute very little to the climate change and the disaster are feeling the worst effects of it. And we are saying that the way how the financial architecture was constructed, it was not fair for the people who live in the tropics or the small and the developing states. We were saying so. And this prime minister championed the Bridgetown Initiative so that we in the small and developing states 
will have a say in the way how we are able to treat the natural disasters. And Mr. Speaker, sir, when we talk about the work that the Prime Minister has done in terms of bringing recognition to this country, the amount of grants that we have been able to get since she has come to office. In my ministry, Mr. Speaker, we were able, and I must talk about it, to get $450,000 for our biosecure fence of our leaf toll gecko. Very endemic to our country, very important part of our biological diversity. Mr. Speaker, sir, the soil care pro project that we are doing currently, because we recognize that the Minister of Agriculture, the Member of Parliament for St. Philip South, will not be able to ensure our food security if we don't have arable land and arable soil. And so we started a project getting grant funding from Jeff where we are trying to rehabilitate that first 12 inches or so of soil so that it can have its organic purpose. Because the reality on the current trajectory is that within the next 60 years, the world as we know in terms of soil and being able to be fertile for agricultural purposes and bio biological diversity, et cetera, will not be um, the, the way how we expect it to be. It will be a, a, a serious, serious, serious destruction in terms of how um, we treat the, the productivity of our sectors. I am saying, Mr. Speaker, sir, this is the work of a prime minister who cares about <coughs> the country. And, you know, when I sit and reflect on what she's doing, and hearing the naysayers and fear mongers, there's only one song that comes to mind, but it would change up the lyrics. That's the song by Ernie Smith, which says, keep on doing what you're doing. I want to say, keep on doing what you're doing, Motley. You're making the people happy, Motley, because everything is going to be all right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 and, and, and when you reflect on the things that are happening in this country, and I, I didn't reflect, I didn't want to reflect on a lady who come from the Fulcrum of Christ Church, the lady by none other than Shirley Chisholm. She said that you don't wait till the table is pulled for you to sit in. You bring your own food and chair. That is what she said. And that is what this Prime Minister has done in the international sphere. She has allowed Barbados to have a seat at the table, and not only a seat at the table, but a seat in a leadership position at the international table. That is what she has done. So I don't mind the atmospheric noise as I see it. But Mr. Speaker, and I really um, need to talk about the mandate that was given to me. And I know you are a man who understands the color spectrum pretty well. I am minister responsible for both green and blue economy. Some may be um, able to say the turquoise economy, if you look at the mixture and the collage. My ministry, Mr. Speaker, is responsible for ensuring that the threat, that, as we know as the triple planetary threat, that threat which seeks to destroy life as we know it, the threat of climate change, Mr. Speaker. Biodiversity laws, you heard me speak about all that, many occasions, and pollution. Mr. Speaker, I want to say today that we have another threat too, and that is the rise of sea level because of the melting in the southern hemisphere. Mr. Speaker, if we are not resilient and fit for our purpose, this Barbados as we know it will be no more, and that is why it is so important that we start doing the right things from our biosphere, which is the land, to the hydrosphere, which is the sea and our coastal environment. That is why a budget that speaks to a tax credit where persons are encouraged to come with um, they call marine infrastructure work, whether it is revetment with grounds and breakwaters and other reef restoration and coral that type of work and activity once approved by the Coastal Zone Unit, a budget that incentivizes persons to do that sort of work, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker, sir, is a budget that is fit for a purpose. And when you are speaking about my ministry, Mr. Speaker, I want to report today 
that I said to Barbadians in 2020, when I became Minister of the Environment, that there must be a clean and green part, um, 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 conversation that will become part of, of the Barbadian vernacular. I started out at zero. I know you play cricket, Mr. Speaker, sir. I, you probably got out at zero too. But I want to report today. <laughs> I want to report today because I like to deal with the higher numbers that today we have established 101 clean and green sites across Barbados. 101 clean and green sites. And what? When it's 101, somebody said me it's a centennial moment for me. It is a century. As, as a cricketer, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, you may not. I like those like numbers. You may not even imagine to get there. A hundred and one. You're not mistaking me for some person on the other side. A hundred and one clean and green sites, Mr. Speaker, where we took land that was just um, follow land that was bush. And we say to ourselves that we must be able to beautify communities where we give Barbados the opportunity to balance their humors, to become part of a holistic project to green and beautify their environment. Mr. Speaker, sir, along with that, what we are doing now is putting up lights so that we can have commercial activities day and night. I want to encourage Barbadians to use those sites for green commercial activity because it is to allow communities to have a tangible state in this country. That is what the clean and green sites is for, uh, are used for. And Mr. Speaker, sir, we started, because you heard the Prime Minister talk about it, a robust exercise where we started to plant trees around Barbados. The Prime Minister said a million trees. I want to report today that the tree planting project has planted 560,000 trees across Barbados, not only for food security, but to become part of the larger carbon sink, Mr. Speaker, sir. 560,000 trees. I'll bet that we had our challenges with COVID and there was a shutdown during that period of time. And I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, that within now and in the end of the financial year, we are expected to plant 100,000 more trees, Mr. Speaker, sir. In terms of EPD and what we do in terms of the uh, Environmental Protection Department, we will continue with our um, derelict program because we recognize that Barbados must be kept clean, it must be um, kept healthy, and we understand the problems associated with those vehicles derelict and the properties that are derelict. And we are saying that over the next couple of months, we will up the ante as it relates to that program to ensure we have a safe Barbados. That is from EPD. I said before that NHD, the National Heritage Department, has embarked on a soil and a soil rehabilitation program along with the Ministry of um, Agriculture, where we are looking at rehabilitating that soil so that it can have the value, the arable value that is needed in this new dimension that we call the climate change. And I know that the Minister, um, the Member of Parliament for St. Philip South spoke earlier about agro-resistant um, crops and plants. Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to get now, because I know time is against me, on the botanical garden, the old, the natural oasis, the beauty of the boulevard. Mr. Speaker, sir, we started, and I want to thank the Member of Parliament for St. Michael East, who started this project. The baton was passed to me. The, the, the baton was passed to me, and I was able to have that Usain Bolt moment too, because I said, when I started um, the project after the Member of Parliament for St. Michael East, that over the next couple of years, that must be the most pristine environment ever seen in Barbados. Where we marriage, um, we are able to marry um, science and ecology. We are able to marry the fact that it's able to bring about that cycle, social balance to people's <coughs> life. I want to say today that although it is not finished, we have started the Richard Stout Amphitheatre. We have started the Seniors Garden and completed the Seniors Garden, Woodland Gardens. We are in the process of building out the, the infrastructure, the roads, the parkings, the, um, the facilities, the comfort zones. The, by the time, Mr. Speaker, the end of this financial year, we are saying that the Botanical Garden will be 
the crown jewel in Waterford. And you know it, it kisses your constituency, Minister Speaker, sir, and you are happy to be able to go and have your parties, and et cetera, in the gardens. The botanical gardens, Mr. Speaker. I want, and I want to thank um, the dendrologist who works hard on there, Mr. Nigel Jones, for, for, for leading the charge and helping develop the botanical garden. Mr. Speaker, we have in the coastal zone unit, because our coastal protection must become an important part of the conversation. We have said already that we are basically an ocean state. A little sea level rise will probably devastate our lives. We have a water uh, sailing intrusion in our aqu near shore aquifers. It is a reality, a lived reality for us. And so, over the next seven years, the Coastal Zone Management Unit, with the assistance of the IDB, will be run up a project from Clinkett and St. Lucy all the way to Oysins in Christchurch. A resilient project, a project that seeks to look at how we mitigate against the climate change and the vagaries thereof. As a project that looks at adaptation to, 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 to these vagaries and these changes. This is a holistic project, Mr. Speaker, and I want to say that I am quietly confident that those in the coastal zone unit, zone unit will be able to do such. Mr. Speaker, the ministry that I lead is on the cusp of rolling out a fisheries management project because we understand that fishing is part of our vernacular. It is part of our history. It is part of our culture. It is part of our ability to sustain ourselves. Many families, Mr. Speaker, will tell you that they were able to build their homes from the fishing industry. They were able to get a tangible stake in this country from an industry. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, sir, that with this management plan, we are looking to introduce, Mr. Speaker, aquaculture and mariculture, where we have the sustainable management of an industry for not only our locals, Mr. Speaker, but for the export potential that we know that it truly has. It is part of having that financial um, reserve and they allow us to get that much needed financial foreign reserves in our country by extending the sector away from our shores and allowing Barbados to have a tangible state in it. Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to say to you that in the biodiversity section, you all often hear me talk about biodiversity and the importance thereof. Since the industrial era, 250 years ago, we have lost, 250 years, industrial era, we have lost over 530 species of plants, Mr. Speaker, over 600 species of animals. When you talk about biodiversity loss, and the threat to life on this part and this um, world, it is serious. We are talking about the basis of life itself. I coined a phrase when I went to a, the bio, last biological diversity conference that life on this earth began with diverse biodiversity. It will end abruptly without it. I don't want to say, Mr. Speaker, sir, that we have started the action plan the National Biological Diversity Action Plan, which is the action plan that seeks with a 12-point theme that seeks to preserve the biological diversity in this country so that Barbados can say to the rest of the world, we are protecting that which will eventually protect us and our children. Biological um, diversity. And I want to say to you, Mr. Speaker, that Nature Conservancy was able to see the hard work of the good officers in the ministry because the praise don't only go to the minister, it goes to the hard working officers in the ministry and award Barbados as one of the leaders in terms of the small and development state and, and, and as, as it relates to biodiversity. And we were given an award last December for that work. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, in the project manager coordinating unit, you hear about integrated solid waste management the way how we treat to our waste. Very important. We have said that waste must be uh, um, a part of the, the conversation, the way how we reduce it. Reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, and now one more, Mr. Speaker, sir, repair. 
And we understand you, when you were a youngster, you do some repair bicycle tires. They don't do it anymore. But that must, if you are serious about integrated solid waste management, and the way we treat to that waste, we must be able to utilize every single thing in a circle of Barbados, which will have benefits in the long run. Out of every single ton that is scary the landfill, we can create three or four green jobs. Out of every single one. And I want you to be mindful of that, Mr. Speaker, because this is important work. Mr. Speaker, at the NCC, I want to say today that we have started to produce, propagate those seeds that I spoke about last budget. And that those seeds are the seeds for the citronella grass and those things that will help us with the fight for our um, biodiversity, the fight against the mosquito population and the threat of dengue. I said already that we have to look at natural ways rather than losing all the pollutants so that we can have a fight for against these um, common threats. I remember has two more minutes. Mr. Speaker, and I will use that two minutes to go quickly to the Sanitation Service Authority, Mr. Speaker. I want to say that when this government came to power in 2018, we had 12 garbage trucks. I want you to hear me good. 12 garbage trucks. If I was sitting as a member of the Stockholm Convention, I would say it would call it the dirty dozen because those are the chemicals that destroy the world. The dirty dozen. The fellows at sanitation were calling them that as well. We were paying, Mr. Speaker, sir, $250,000 a month Contracting persons to do the work which sanitation was naturally supposed to do. I want to report today, Mr. Speaker, that in the period that 2019 to 2023, we have now bought 33 compactors. I want to repeat, man. The Sanitation Service Authority has bought 33 compactors with a further seven arriving in the next six to nine months. I want to repeat that. 30 three compactors and this is in comparison because the mass sometimes on the other side there's an like calmonics it goes it says that 20 percent is greater than 80. so i uh, don't allow me to make the mistake colleagues to say that 11 compactors were purchased between 2008 and 2018. so 11 i know is less than 33. for my mass and the mass on this side with the member of parliament for Christchurch, essential, I know he will correct me. 11 is less. So during the period 2019 to 20 to present, we have purchased 22 more in that short period of time. Mr. Speaker, sir, I ain't gonna mask. We started a residential waste improvement project with technology being used as part of bringing a level of efficiency to the Sanitation Service Authority and allowing the men to have an ease with lifting those big, heavy um, garbage cans. It is a part of showing that we care for those workers so they won't end up with the rheumatoid arthritis and the other, and, uh, the other physiological problems associated with lifting those big, heavy beams. We also say that we will put the, um, the RFID readers on the bin so we can trace and be able to know how much garbage is being collected so we can optimize routes. It is part of bringing technology to the whole operationalization of the Sanitation Service Authority. Mr. Speaker, sir, and what we say too, because we care, and this government cares about the workers of this country. You, you heard it from the member of parliament of St. Peter. And as a caring government, we say for the first time in the history of this country that the SSUA workers must have medical insurance, and that's what we did. So that if they get injured on the job, they'll be able to get a little financial assistance, go and pay for the prescription, get a teeth pulled if they need to. And if by any, happen, by any chance that they have a fatality, their family will be looked after. This is a government that cares, Mr. Speaker, sir. And I want to say, Mr. Speaker, we have also increased the allowances, the allowances for our workers, yeah, the allowances that they will be in on the same scale as other persons in the civil service, Mr. Speaker, sir. We have also constructed a center, a recreational center at the facility in just any point. Mr. Speaker, there is a lot that has been done on behalf 
of the workers in this country by this government and by my ministry. And we will continue to do right by the people of this country who give us the mandate to do it. In closing, Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to just say to you that... I remember, you, you, I don't understand, you just spoke about Kelbonomics, right? Or Kelbonomics. I said two. But that, you, you, you want but, 22. But, 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 <laughs> as, 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 excuse me, Kelbonomics, I want to say that today and now, five is probably less, probably five is probably less than two. I see. <laughs> right, I but see. Mr. Speaker, just in closing, I just want to say, um, Mr. Speaker, sir, that... The book of Proverbs 29, verse 18, the member of parliament could correct me if I'm wrong for St. Peter, says that without vision, people will perish. I want to say equally that without vision and good leadership, the people will perish. I want to give Barbians the calm, quiet, rested assurance that they don't not only have a vision for the next financial year, but they have leadership on this side which will ensure that they have prosperity in this land. Ladies and gentlemen, I pledge. Honorary Member for St. Michael South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, sir. I want to begin by commending my colleagues who spoke before. I naturally want to support the budget. And all those who spoke before me, sir, who spoke so well, and eloquently in relation to their projects and the things that they're doing. So I listened to the speakers, all of them, including the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, sir. And while I, too, am a man prone to like poetry and so on, so I recognize the reference to Julius Caesar when he spoke about stabbing your mother, sir. Julius Caesar, sir, is one of the tragedies in Shakespeare, sir, that is filled with deceit, betrayal, and perfidy. I also listened, sir, to the opposition leader. As he made reference to the Bible, he took us to Genesis. He spoke of the voice of Jacob, the hand of Esau. Sir, a passage filled with betrayal, <laughs> deceit, and perfidy. The question, sir, that we must ask the opposition leader to reflect on is why his bosom is so burdened with deceit, betrayal, and perfidy. <laughs> Sir, this is a very serious discussion, sir. And this budget, sir, is perhaps the most important budget of our time. I listen, sir, to the Honorable Prime Minister sir, and that this budget, sir, will lead to inclusive growth, as the Honorable Member for St. Michael South Central just said, is extremely clear to me. While I was in the well, sir, I made great pain, sir, and effort to ensure, to make, to connect the dots, sir, between why economic growth is important. You need the growth, sir, to create some fiscal space, to engage in social programming, sir, that allows you, sir, to move a people forward, sir. And, and this is important because this is what is really going to break the cycle of poverty, sir, and transform a nation. I heard the opposition leader, sir, offer me, sir, as a minister of people of empowerment, people empowerment of some money. He would give me more money, sir, but to do it, he proposed to cut cadets, cut urban, cut, urban, cut UDC, Cut the defense, the security and defense. So my mother was a government security guard after she stopped being a bus conductress, conductress, sir. So he planned to send home people like my mother. After the Dems sent her home in 1992 when they cut programming, sir. That is blood money. He can keep it. I'm not interested in that kind of money, sir. This budget, sir, will stimulate growth. The kind of growth, sir, that is necessary to propel a nation forward, sir. You must also remember, sir, that when the Democrat Labour Party was in, sir, when they were borrowing, that they were borrowing to pay recurrent expenditure. They were borrowing, sir, to pay wages and to pay salaries and to put on the light, not to pay the NAS, because we heard yesterday that they didn't pay the NAS for government workers, sir. But when this government is engaging in reasonable borrowing, 
It is to do things, sir, that you will be able to see increase your fit's assets, improve the country. There is a big difference between us and them. Sir, I had the privilege years ago when I was with Global Affairs Canada of managing a public finance project, public financial management project led by the IMF, but I was team lead for Jamaica. And the things that we are doing is what Jamaica has been trying to do. And other countries across the region has been trying to do. So to come here, sir, and to try to break down a whole project, sir, because he does not understand basic economics, regrettably, it's unfortunate. And I, I do not mean to cast aspersions on the honorable member, sir. He isn't here. I wouldn't do it when he's not present. But it's important for us to have these conversations, sir. And so I introduced while I was in the world the concept of inclusive prosperity. It is a concept that I want the nation to come to be familiar with, sir. That all of us must be able to benefit from the things that will redound to the country, sir, if we are able to manage this country right. People who traditionally have not been involved in the development process, sir, must be able to get something. There must be something in the deal for every Barbadian, sir. That is why we go to work every day, sir. That is why I am confident that my colleagues are working so hard, sir. And when I look across my ministry, I cannot name a single group that has not seen more. I cannot name one, sir. And I will explain that perhaps in a little bit more detail, sir, if time permits me, sir. But if you look at these estimates, which is the funny thing, you know, the honorable leader of the opposition was saying they got 104 million and da da da. Sir, if you look at when the Democratic Labour Party was in, they never saw that kind of money. This is the most money that was ever offered to the social services sector. This government, sir. And I am happy to report that I know, sir, before we end this financial year, sir, when we bring back in for the move-ins and so on, sir, we anticipate even more, we anticipate an additional six or seven million more to build up facilities for the elderly, sir, in this country. Because we recognize that there is a problem coming that we always say you have to face it and fix it, sir. I anticipate, sir, an additional two or three million dollars for children to build that facility that we described in the child protection legislation that is going to be so important, sir, to allow us, sir, to work with children. Work with children, sir, so that we can save some of them. You saw there's a video circulating this morning, sir. There are children in this country who need help. And I do hope, sir, when the child protection bill comes back to this parliament that the honorable member takes the high road. But that's up to him. But I do hope when it comes back, sir, the honorable member takes the high road. The honorable member, sir, also quoted during his rant, the former member for St. Peter, the Prime Minister of Barbados, sir. He said, the Prime Minister said he came to stop poor people from being poor. But I remember, sir, that that Prime Minister also said you cannot take the low road to high office, but yet he's the opposition leader. You cannot take the low road to high office, yet he's the opposition leader. Tell me which road, sir. And it's important, sir, that when we try to call on the names of great people, that the principles on which we stand align with the principles on which they stood, sir. It is important. And I, I come to this house, sir, having done a lot of work so my entire life in communities, sir, in social policy, sir, community development and engagement, sir. These are important things. And it's going to be very important that when we start speaking about those who are vulnerable, we do not do it so, sir, for political mileage. And when I listen, sir, to the vitriol that was spouted all yesterday, sir, and the accusations, the innuendo, and the conjecture, it was an unfortunate presentation. The most vituperative things that you could imagine to be said about honorable members, sir. For what? For what? This country, sir, is too precious to all of us, sir. I believe, sir, that there were things that the Democratic Labour Party, not the last set, but the traditionally, would have done for Barbados to propel this country forward. You have to be able to say that there were some things that were done that were good things. And 
And sir, if you do not say so, sir, something is wrong. I mean, all of us, we have to be able to say there were some things that the Labour Party did that were good. There were some things that the Democratic Labour Party did that were good. Because, sir, governance and government is a continuum. We build on what the other party would have done. Unfortunately, sir, when we went through the figures yesterday, you would have heard that the Democratic Labour Party between 2008 and 2018 is one of the few governments that did not build the economy. They did not build on what they were given. In fact, sir, the Bible speaks of talents. I, would, I don't know if they're buried there, sir, but they surely did not do anything with it. Sir, I also feel very concerned, sir, that yesterday everything in the Barbados Labour Party government was wrong. Everything. They could, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition could not find anything that the Barbados Labour Party did that was good. And, and you know, sir, the Bible teaches us in John, sir, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Then it seems to me that he thinks the Democratic Labour Party has no sin. Sir, and that all the sin is located here in the Barbados Labour Party. But when you look at what we've done, when you listen to members, sir, each of them one by one, individual by individual, talking about the things that they would have done, sir. When you look at the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister, and you compare that to the leadership of the Honorable Former Prime Minister of this country, sir, chalk and cheese, I ask honorable members in this place, sir, to remember what it was like when we were approaching the election in 2018, sir. We could not recognize our own country. You know the song, sir, taken from the Bible verse, sir, by the rivers of Babylon? When they asked us to come and sing, sir, songs, uh, we asked how can we sing songs, sir, in this strange land? It was a strange land, sir. We now remember what Barbados was like, sir. Children have hope. I remember having conversations with some of my constituents, having to decide if they're going to send school their son or if they're going to send school their daughter. Not so long ago, sir. We came in, sir, and we made a lot of difference in this country, sir. It is a shameful thing when we take these things for political mileage, sir. In my ministry, sir, I'll be very quick. In my ministry, sir, I have had responsibility now for leading the Ministry of People Empowerment, sir. We began yesterday, sir, when the Honorable Leader of the Opposition spoke by making reference to the Down Syndrome Association, sir, for persons with Down Syndrome. But by then, we'd already spoken to the Down Syndrome Association. I'd already spoken to the member for St. James North. We'd already spoken to the Prime Minister, and we'd already agreed that we were going to rectify it so that any person with a disability who cannot function, sir, and who needs the financial support would get that support. This government has done more for persons with disabilities than any other government. That is a fact. It is clear, sir, in the policy that we have, that we've established, sir, that will be coming to this house for debate, it is clear, sir, in the, in the Hinkson Commission, in the work that would have been done, sir, in the 60 to 70 meetings that we had with the community, sir. It is clear, sir, in all of the legislative work that will be coming here, sir, to protect persons with disabilities. It is clear in the 40% increase that we gave to all of the NGOs associated with the ministry that do work for persons with disabilities, sir. It is clear in the vehicles that we bought and the tool that we will buy every year for the next three, year to make, three years to make sure that they can travel, sir, safely, sir. This government, without question, has done more for persons with disabilities than any other government, sir, on the elderly. On the elderly, sir. This government, sir, has finished its policy. The legislation is in draft. You just heard me say we're putting $7 million more into facilities. We built, sir, this, the old Barbados Labour Party built Vauxhall. We came back and we renovated Vauxhall. You have to go see it. Brand new. We are working, sir, with the NGOs in that space, too, to be able to make sure, sir, that as our population ages, that we put in place the systems to be able to protect them. Sir, we cannot play politics. With the lives of people, sir, I've met so many old people, seniors, I should say, who have seen me on the road, sir, and have said to me, Kurt Humphrey, or Minister, 
I want to thank you. I want to thank the government for what they're doing, sir. You see this elder care program, sir? And you must remember, sir, that during COVID, when people were sending home people, this government brought on 420 persons to look after the elderly, sir. 420. And when people were saying they were going to be sent home because the opposition leader has convenient memory, he doesn't want to talk about these things, you see? Sir, it was this government that said, we are not sending home a single one of them. They are all working today with NAS being paid. They get sick days, vacation days, and in this budget, sir, they get in uniform, sir. This government looking after the workers, sir, who have to take care of the older person, sir. I want to thank the staff at the National Assistance Board and the National Disabilities Unit. I want to thank the staff in the Ministry of People Empowerment. They've been outstanding, sir in the way that they have delivered to the people who are hurt in this country. Yesterday, my phone was on fire. I could use the word buzz, but anything that buzzes bothers the member for Christ itself. But the country, sir, is a buzz like my phone was. People calling me, sir, members of the disabled community, one in particular, sir, I have to, to tell you about, sir, said to me, I have been hoping for this moment for over 20 years. We have negotiated with other governments, hoping to get a chance where persons in this country, so who have disabilities, can get some financial support because it has been hard. We never thought it was going to happen in our lifetime, sir. The person messaged me and said, I am sending you this message with tears in my eyes, sir. This government, this government, sir, cares about the most vulnerable, sir. We then expanded, sir, to make sure that we have taken on a new Department, sir, that we call the resilience and reintegration, sir, to be able to cope with persons who are displaced, sir, because we live in a climate crisis. And we are dealing with people, sir, who are burdened. The number of persons, sir, that since we started this unit that we have been able to help, sir, is surprisingly large. And they keep asking my staff, sir, every day, I know you're tired. I know that some of these people can be difficult and hard to deal with, sir, because hurting people hurt people. The workers in the Ministry of People Empowerment are humans too. But I've said to them, sir, just dig a little bit deeper. Give a little bit more. Because the transformation that is necessary, the transformation that will take us from where we are, sir, where people are broken and need help, sir, requires that the staff and that the ministry digs a little bit deeper, sir. I am proud of the staff in the ministry. There are some who came here yesterday and called public servants liars. You are not going to hear that from me. I am proud. This government is proud of the public service in this country. <laughs> so I cannot say that we have been perfect, but no government is. But we have done a lot to support this country. We have done a lot, sir, to propel the country. We have done a lot, sir, to take care of the most vulnerable in this country, sir. I've asked some of my colleagues, sir, I won't name them, but I've asked some of my colleagues in the Thousand Family Program, sir, to support, as we've asked the wider public, to support some of the more vulnerable families. Give a little something. Give a chicken. If you can, put some financial assistance if you can, sir. And most of the ones that I have asked, sir, have already stood up and more are coming. I put the challenge, sir, to the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Stop talking. Do something for the people, sir because it is the people of this country that need help. It is the people who put us here, sir. We did not come here, sir, most of us anyway. We did not take these positions, sir, by betrayal and deceit and perfidy, sir. My conscience, like the colleagues that I sit with, like their conscience, my conscience is clear, sir. And I know, sir, that we are working every single day to make life better for people. Yesterday, the PM said, as I close, sir, that this budget has to be about growth, it has to be about resilience, and it has to be people-centric, sir. This country, sir, must think about these things. If COVID were to come tomorrow, would you trust what you've seen of the opposition? I have said, sir, during the estimates debate that we are pretty much guaranteed another pandemic at some time. And the world has predicted it so. Will you trust the future of your children to what you have seen, sir? 
Or do you trust a government, sir, that can come here and say to you that I've bought garbage trucks, bought buses, you can see us paving the roads, making efforts, sir, to reform the Ministry of Education. And don't let nobody fool you. We have to reform the Ministry of Education. And I, sir, I'm a beneficiary of free education, sir. I am not like the Dems. I will not kick down the ladder on which I was able to rise, sir. But I do know that if it stays the way it is, we will not be able to reap the most of what Barbados has to offer. And that is all that we are saying, sir. When I was a student of leadership, my professor used to say that leadership is an improvisational art. It is an improvisation. You've got to try a thing. If it doesn't work, you try something else. But you have to ask the people that you're leading to trust you enough to give you the space to engineer, to try things. Sir, we know for sure that if we stay on this course, peril is before us, sir, in terms of education. I commend the Honorable Leader of, the edu of Education, the Minister of Education, for the work that she is doing, sir. It will save this country. Sir, it will save this country. Sir, as I close, sir, I just want to remind the people of Barbados, sir, that it is a very dangerous thing when someone tries to paint an entire picture of disenchantment for an entire nation in the hope that on that wave of disenchantment, they can serve float to high office, sir. Because what you do, sir, you know when you sow the wind, you gotta reap the whirlwind. And when, sir, you let go the chickens, you know the chickens will come home to roost. All I am saying, sir, is that this country, sir, is too near and too dear to my heart, sir. Every day in the ministry, sir, I am hearing people saying that they're seeing some changes, sir. Things are happening. And I want to commend all of my colleagues, sir. I want to commend the Honorable uh, Prime Minister, sir, for the budget that she brought before this house, sir. You know, it must be a difficult thing, sir, after COVID in an IMF program, sir, to bring two consecutive budgets of no new taxes. It's not easy. And when we do things that are so good for the country and make them look easy, sir, sir, perhaps that is the problem. But this, sir, is one of the best budgets, sir. You've heard it, sir, from the Private Sector Association. You've heard it from the persons with disabilities, sir. You've heard it from people on the blocks I just came from in town. You heard it from the people in town. The only person who don't think it was a good budget, sir, is the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. I want to close, sir, absolutely no, sir, by reminding the Honorable Leader, because he said we did nothing. Now, when I was Minister of Maritime, sir, did we not fix Oystein's Market? Is there not a plaque with my name and his in Oystein's Market? Did we not put on, sir, count to top, sir, that was able to make sure we met phytosanitary standards? Sir, did we not put some renovations, sir, totally nearly $2 million to fix the jetty in Oysens for fishermen? Are those not ordinary people? Didn't we put photovoltaic uh, panels on the roof, sir, for the people in Oysens? Are those not ordinary people, sir? So when you tell me that we didn't do anything for ordinary people, you probably don't know what we did for the people in Oysens, or you don't know you don't go in Oysens. <laughs> At the end of the day, sir, this government has done more for ordinary people, sir, than any other government. I am proud to be associated with it, and I fully support this essence. Honorary Member for St. George South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to join the debate to offer my words of support to these budgetary proposals laid in this chamber two days ago by the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast. But I will join my good friend for St. Michael South and offer the congratulations to my colleagues who, in my view, and in others who messaged me to give various comments on those who spoke before me, including the member who just sat down. But Mr. Speaker, it gives me great honor as a product of my community
to stand here representing my constituents in St. George South. For the 10th time in this Lord Chamber. It's indeed an honor, Mr. Speaker, that I know some members don't have, but they represent people too. But to represent where you are from is indeed an honor. And I hold this honor very close to my heart and there. As I listened yesterday to the tirade of the current and soon to be outgoing member of Christchurch South, I took the measure of the moment and recognized that I had two choices in my response today. To be, ang to be angry and indignant at the blatant political posturing and scurrility of the former colleague, or to be more measured and strategic in directing the public's attention to the work we are doing in housing on behalf of the people of St. George South and White of Barbados. But Mr. Speaker, it, it home to me while traveling last night behind the member for St. Peter and the member for St. Michael's South. My good friend, the member for St. Philip South and I, we left together following those two members. And it hit home to me that I have a number of persons who have shaped my value system. And for me, Mr. Speaker and colleagues, to come here and to disrespect the late Rock Sisters and the late Groveners and the late and present Lashleys at the Elton Wesley Holiness Church, to disrespect our spiritual coaches, and to disrespect the members of the church community would indeed be an injustice to who I am as a person. So Mr. Speaker, I got the answer while driving home. And Mr. Speaker, Galatians 5, Verses 22 and 23 is what I will premise my presentation on and be resilient, focused, and stoic today. And it goes like this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And that is where I am. I am so settled in my choice, Mr. Speaker, is to be obedient to the Word of God and address the concerns raised in a spirit of kindness, sympathy, and empathy. As it is clear, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the opposition is out to sea in shark-infested waters. He's in shark-infested waters. And he's very much still in, church, in search of a safe harbor if we are to go by the sensationalism. Member for Christchurch, West Central, and the hyperbole that he engaged in yesterday. Mr. Speaker, that is where I am. So with my time, let me begin briefly by clarifying a few matters, Mr. Speaker, for the public especially, and to reinforce for the members in this chamber who know differently. Mr. Speaker, hope ain't hope ownership providing energy. And the member for Christchurch West, he started it yesterday, was set up by the government of Barbados to provide housing for ordinary Barbadians in this country. Ordinary Barbadians. And the acronym HOPE came from this government, Home Ownership Providing Energy. And the member for St. Michael South spoke to growth, resilient, and people-centered. And that's what the member for St. Michael Northeast premised this budget on. And the acronym acutely represents every single one of those strategic intents. Home Ownership Providing Energy. Homes to provide growth, resilient, the energy aspect of it, utilizing 
photovoltaic to drive the cost down for home ownership. And indeed, people centered in that it will empower and enfranchise the ordinary Barbadians. But Mr. Speaker, these people or the persons that we set up hope to cater to are ordinary Barbadians, teachers, nurses, nurses, firemen, policemen, gas station workers, teachers. Mr. Speaker, at the announcement that this government intends to build the 10,000 homes that the member scoff at, and I'm going to speak to that later. The project at Vesper Gardens, and he was wrong when he spoke to 133 houses. We are building 154 houses at Vesper Gardens. He was wrong about most things, and I will correct him this afternoon. Over 4,000 applicants, the said ordinary Barbadians that he claimed to love, and he's cursing the housing program, it showed to me that he don't love these ordinary Barbadians. 4,000 applicants applied for the 154 housing solutions at Vesper Gardens. I will repeat for the public, 4,000 plus applicants applied for those houses at Vesper Gardens, 154 houses. And Mr. Speaker, hope is such a revolution that there's nowhere other than in Barbados that you can own a two-bedroom wall house for $172,000. There's nowhere in the world except in Barbados that you can own a three-bedroom wall house for $227,500. We took the opportunity to invest in our people by saying to these people, you will pay for the house, but we will utilize photovoltaic to finance and pay for the land and the infrastructure by taking the roofs. And I'm pleased to report to the public today that we have formed the whole SPV to focus on the photovoltaics on the roof so that these ordinary Barbadians can live the dream of owning a piece of this rock. But Mr. Speaker, the honorable member and soon to be former member for Sin for Christchurch South said that Hope was a private company. Let me tell the public and remind the chamber that Hope is a commercial state-owned enterprise with government being the only and sole shareholder of that state-owned enterprise, commercial state-owned enterprise, and it is not a private company. Mr. Speaker, I will repeat this. Hope ain't for ownership providing energy. is a commercial state-owned enterprise with the government of Barbados being the sole shareholder, and it is not a private company. It has a board of directors that were set up by the cabinet of Barbados, where we don't intervene in the daily operations. It is similar to Grantley Adams International Airport. It is similar to Barbados Tourism Investment Inc. It is similar to the QEH. So I listened yesterday, some interruptions I must say, by me and by others because we like to correct. But that is what was said yesterday that Hope is a private company. Member for St. Joseph, you recall being part of this? And we know that it was grossly misleading and erroneous to the public of Barbados when the member for Christ Church South and soon to be former member got in this chamber and misled the public. He misled the public. 
and he has to come back to the public and say sorry. But then again, he does things without recognizing the people. So I don't expect him to come and say, I misled the public. We will correct, we will correct the public. He went on further to say, Mr. Speaker, that the land is given to hope. Mr. Speaker, the state land is vested in hope. Yes, it's not given to hope. Land vested in any NHC is converted or transferred to hope at a cost $2.50 per square foot. But why are we doing this? We are doing this to keep the cost of home ownership down for the ordinary Barbadian. We recognize as a government we have to subsidize, I hate to use the word, but we have to make it affordable. So we decided to cap the cost of services and the cost of land. We are not selling at market value. We are transferring the lands to hope so that the persons I just mentioned, the ordinary barbarians that he disassociated himself from yesterday, on the one hand, he wants to talk about class and color and social divide. And at the other hand, he wants to disassociate himself from the ordinary people as it relates to housing. He don't know whether he's fish or frog. Or oh, good red herring. He has a problem. So Mr. Speaker, he went on further. And Mr. Speaker, I want to make this letter that he referred to a letter insinuating that there's something nefarious or sinister with respect to this letter that he read yesterday and claim he don't want to call names. I am going to call names because, Mr. Speaker, this letter is a letter that I can give to my good friend, my goddaughter, she can take to her school and she can share with any single member of the public to say that the chief executive officer there, sir, lands to be allocated to who under the 10,000 housing project. There's no secret to this letter. We come here every week, member for Christchurch East mostly, and we vest land. Well, we know he only comes to mark his, his name and then he leaves. Or at lunchtime. I won't go further with that. Because I don't think he's a hungry man, but it's very strange he, he, he comes here during lunchtime. <laughs> All the time. Only during lunchtime. But he has been absent from this chamber, so when I come here, you can refer to the answer and you can see that most of our debates relate to vesting of lands in Hope or National Housing Corporation. Member for Christchurch, see on my line? He lied to the public yesterday. But this so-called nefarious and sinister letter that he produced was written by the general manager of NHC to say to Hope and member for St. Michael Southeast, you know which land is in here too? Hmm? Low Burnie. Low Burnie is in here, 20 acres. It has 15 sites identified by the general manager of NHC, he was transparent to allow Hope to know these are the lands that we'll invest in Hope. Why? Because Hope will build houses for the ordinary people in this country. That is why we come to this chamber to vest. It speaks to Brantsbury West, member for St. George, if you know this place? Yes, sir. Brantsbury West, member for St. Lucie, you know Bright Hall, St. Lucie? 40 acres. Member for St. John, you know Collerton St. John? 27 acres, thumbs up. Member for St. George, you know Cottage St. George? Yep. Member for St. Philip, you know Golden Grove St. Philip? Yep. Guinea St. John again? Yep. Harmony Cottage St. George? Low Burnie member for St. Michael South East? Lowlands again in St. Lucie? Marchfield in St. Philip? Yep. Market Hill in St. George? Nestfield in St. Lucie? Padmore Village in St. Philip, Shorey Village in St. Andrew, Collerton in St. Lucie again. Okay. Okay. Member for, Land Mr. Speaker, 
47, 470 acres that can translate into 5,579 housing solutions for ordinary Barbadians. And he is referring to this as some sinister and nefarious document. Well, I have made it a document to the House. And I want to thank the General Manager for NHC for indeed be transparent and above board and letting hope know that these are the lands we will transfer to them. But we ain't finished there, you know. We ain't finished there. That is only half the amount of land that we will transfer to hope. That is only half the amount of land we will transfer to hope. And we can't bring all one time minister within the Ministry of Finance, you know. We bring some now and we bring some later. But these are 5,000 housing solutions. Pepper might get one of these houses. But Mr. Speaker, this is a level of transparency. There's nothing nefarious and sinister about what was done by the general manager. But that is what the public servants fear. Because when the member for Christchurch South can come in here and try to unfair a general manager of a national housing corporation, that is the cynicism that the, that the public servants have with people like the member for St. Michael South. Not St. Michael. For Christchurch South. When you can do stuff like this, read out a letter and insinuate that there was something nefarious with what was done by the general manager of the National Housing Corporation. He was above board. But Mr. Speaker, you know, <laughs> this, this member for St. Michael South interfered with me. Uh, St. Michael South, I remember. For Christchurch South. The member for St. Michael South is my good friend. The member for Christchurch South interfered with me. And the member for St. Michael South gave me good advice on how to deal with him. That's why I'm calling the member for St. Michael South. That's my good friend. But Mr. Speaker, I heard the member mention that Hope Inc. got $40 million from the Housing Credit Fund. But Mr. Speaker, again, he misled the public. He misled the public again. Hope Inc. borrowed, borrowed $56 million from the Housing Credit Fund. Let me break it down. $40 million for Hope Inc., for the houses at Vesper and the other sites we have identified to build. The 154 houses at Vesper Gardens that persons will move into shortly. I will take him with me. If he's so obliged, I will take him. I will pick him up as well and take him to see the handover of keys at Vesper Gardens in less than a week. But the $40 million was borrowed from the housing credit fund, plus $16.586 million borrowed to fund the purchase of Jorvilla houses out of Guyana, makes it 56.586 million, borrowed at an interest of 1.15% to be repaired, to be repaid by the 31st of March, 2029. Why am I going there, Mr. Speaker? Why am I going there, Mr. Speaker? The member for Christchurch South has aligned himself with the Democratic Labour Party. And Mr. Speaker, the facts would have it that the Democratic Labour Party took $75 million from the Housing Credit Fund, $75 million from the Housing Credit Fund to build the grotto and to build Valerie. The money was paid directly to the builder and to date, 
they have not repaid the housing credit fund. What? Oh. Shameful. Shameful. I will repeat. Shameful. Hope Inc. has borrowed $56 million to re be repaid by Hope Incorporated, Hope Inc. Hope. They have borrowed and not 40, $56 million at an interest rate of 1.15% to be repaid due the 31st of March 2029. But the Democratic Labour Party, that the so that the member for, Saint, for Christ Church South has hitched his wagon against, borrowed $75 million from the housing credit fund to build Grotto and Valerie and has not paid it back. What year that happen? What year that happen? Under the dens between 2008 and 2018. That's about half a million now. Whoa. Mr. Speaker, the public, you must know these things. I will be sympathetic and kind to the member for Christchurch South because he's ignorant to these things. He has hitched his wagon against the Democratic Labour Party. I cannot forgive him for that. But I will let the public know the facts. But that is not all, Mr. Speaker. This member came in here to criticize Hope Inc. This member came in here to criticize we form hope because we saw the bankrupt nature of National Housing Corporation. I can get there, Mr. Speaker. I beg him for a little more time because uh -huh. I have to educate the public because again. this member came into this chamber and he said that this government is about to close down National Housing Corporation. He said that. Stick a pin on that. Stick a pin on that. Having utilized all of the general workers' loan fund, mm -hmm. the last administration, mm -hmm. the general workers' loan fund was a fund that any person who was building a home, it was administered by, by National Housing Corporation, can indeed borrow money from that fund to put on a little toilet and bath member for, for the city. We understand this thing because we talk about this regular. They can take, borrow the money to buy land. They can borrow the money to do home improvement. The Democratic Labour Party that the member for Christchurch South has hitched his wagon against spent 10 million of the general workers loan fund money to the point now that it is bankrupt. And the workers can't get any funding to do any home improvement. That is what happened at NHC. Shameful. That is what happened at NHC. So when he talk about forming hope, Shameful. because what hope will do, and hope has started to do, to drop the cost of building in this country to affordable levels so that persons can own their own home. You know how much the Grotto and Valerie were built at? Do you know how much? Oh, Let me tell you all. Oh, $653 per square foot. Ooh. And one at $651 a square foot. That is Sandy Lane prices. Oh, Under the last administration that the member for Christchurch South has hitched his wagon against. He hitched his wagon against the Dems. You know what's six hundred and fifty-one dollars a square foot back in twenty fourteen? Look at inflation and see how much that is now. Ask me how much we are building at. Hope. Ask me how much we are building at. How much we're building at? How much yes, building at? members and the public, we are building at less than three hundred and eighty dollars a square foot. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this government has made it easier for persons to own their own home. And I'm going now to the issues 
Mr. Speaker, bear with me, huh? I am going out to the issues that the member for St. Michael Northeast has placed in her budgetary proposals. She has placed in her budgetary proposals the challenges that we face in housing in this country. In terms of access to mortgages, timely access, the ease of doing business in terms of land transactions in this country. When we have 119 mortgage applicants over the last six months with the lending institutions and persons can't get into their home, when we have another 39 with another lending institution and there's liquidity from what you can see in the estimates, over 2 billion member for Christ Church Essential, the liquidity in this system and the banking system, there's access to money. But because of the bureaucracy with the transfer of titles and land in this country and convincing, that's the challenge with ownership. And, and, and let me say this to you, this government has a different policy with respect to home ownership than the last administration. The last administration focused on rental. This government focuses on empowerment and enfranchisement of giving persons the opportunity to own their own home and not just renting it. And that's the fundamental difference, you know, because you can build the high rise like they did at 651 dollars per square foot and you can put people in them to rent. Yeah. Mind you, they have bankrupt national housing because when we came to office, the rent, the old persons owed national housing over seven million dollars in rental arrears. So when we talk about farming hope and when we talk about addressing the issues at national housing, and the member for Christchurch South can come in here and tell a blatant lie that we are about to shut down national housing. The fear mongering among the staff he's trying to create. And I came here today to clear it up. Because how you can want to shut down national housing when we have forecast some $43.4 million from joint venture arrangement, private public partnerships to build houses in this country. And I can talk about them. I can talk about them. I remember you have, you have five more minutes. Mr. Speaker, we have here listed joint ventures for national housing cooperation for the year 2024, 2025. Projected revenue of 2.156 million. 2.156 million from joint venture partnerships. In that national housing, skin in the game is the land. And the private investor do the infrastructure and build the houses and we sell. We keep using the word off budget because we're not utilizing the consolidated fund to build homes in this country. We are utilizing the liquidity in the banking sector. And national housing is compensated for the land while the investor sells the home and he or she is paid at the sale of the land, at the sale of the house. 2024, 2025, we are projecting some 154 housing solutions. Brighton, St. George, St. Bartholomew, Christ Church, Coveley, Christ Church, Ebenezer, St. Philip, Johnson, Christ Church, Vesters, and St. James. We are projecting 154 housing solutions. And the member for Christ Church South don't like the word solutions because that's why they're where they are because they never are for any solutions to this country to solve any of its problems. So he has a problem with the word solutions, whether it's housing, it's agriculture, whether it is investment. He has a problem, whether it is roads, he has a problem with the word solutions. But National Housing Corporation is a viable entity. And we have repurposed national housing to focus on maintenance of estates. And we have started with discussions with the trade union movement, both unions. We have recognized both bargaining units, the NUPW and the Barbados Workers Union. We have had 
discussions, preliminary discussions, and NHC will be repurposed, and NHC will become financially viable without the drain or the strain on the consolidated fund. And that is what we are doing at National Housing. So when the honorable member, the opposition leader, soon to be former member for Christchurch South, gets in here and speaks to shutting down national housing and trying to create the fear mongering among the staff, it's, it is not a good thing to do. That is not what we are about. We are about offering solutions and repurposing institutions fit for purpose fit for purpose. And I will end on one other strategic intent listed in the budgetary proposals, the use of derelict and vacant lots. We have some 29,000 applicants for houses at National Housing Corporation. Huh? So I don't know how we can shut down an institution. We want to build so many houses and National Housing alone cannot do it. That's why hope was formed. That's why we have offered, like, gas steel houses. That's why we have offered Joe Villa houses. That's why we have offered several options for ordinary Barbadians so that they can choose what they want to fit their pockets. That's why we have done it. But, Mr. Speaker, these different options that we have offered the citizens of this country were never offered before in the history of politics in this country. This is the first government I want to thank the member for St. Michael Northeast. And as the member just sat down, the other member misled the chamber, member for Christchurch East, by saying that the new CEO doesn't have a work permit. Member, does he have a work permit? Christchurch, so sorry, he has a work permit. The CEO of Hope has a work permit. He misled the chamber again and the public. And the member for Christchurch East can tell you, he presides over that ministry, he can tell you when the work permit was granted to the new CEO. I remember it's time to wind it. Dishonorable conduct in this chamber. I will have more time to speak in this chamber on the honorable member for, for Christchurch South soon to be former member for Christchurch South. And I keep repeating that because we have a plan for him. Speeding up the conveyancing, rehabilitation of derelict properties. We have over 25,000 derelict and vacant lot properties on, the, on these lands. And the reason why we are focusing in the budget on derelict properties because the derelict properties are located where sites and services are in abundance. So the cost of providing a housing solution, or as he wants me to say, a home, will indeed be reduced because we don't have to focus on the high infrastructure costs that we otherwise would have to focus on when we are going into greenfield ventures for housing. I don't remember. So Mr. Speaker, it gives me pleasure this afternoon to be part of the budgetary proposals. While my time was limited, Mr. Speaker. It was? I have several. It, I, remember, I, I didn't hear. I didn't hear you just say that. What short time was what? I remember. Well, my time could have been a bit more. I, I didn't know that. I didn't hear that either. <laughs> I didn't Mr. hear Mr. Speaker, that nonetheless, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. I didn't get into the strategic objectives that I listed, five of them, but I want to say that housing is in good hands in this country under the Barbados Labour Party. Yeah. And I want to say and echo the words from Pike Corner to Bayfield, to the city, to St. George, to St. Joseph. We have housing solutions for, from St. James to St. John. We have housing solutions for our people in this country and we will not be short of providing them either through NHC or through hope. I want to thank you and with those words, Mr. Speaker, I'm obliged. I don't really the government business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move the suspension of the House until 10 minutes past five. The question is that this honorable chairman be suspended until 10 minutes after five. All of our members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the ice have it.
Ms. Jefferson suspended in 10 minutes after the fight.
our member for St. Michael East. Madam Chair, let me thank you for giving me the opportunity once more at this checkpoint of my long journey in the politics of Barbados. And I must congratulate you. I think this is the first time, Madam, that I'll be addressing you um, as a deputy speaker. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that if you stay a little longer, you can never tell you're likely to become the first female speaker of the House of Assembly. Thank you for your kind words, but I know when I should go. <laughs> well, <laughs> Madam, <laughs> Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I don't want to trouble you in any way. Please do not. Um, I, I, I'm a little flat in spirit um, because I regret that sometimes my colleagues don't have equal time. I don't know what the standard orders say. Uh, other people are likely to overrule the standard orders and decide on how long, I don't know. Um, so out of ignorance, I'm a little concerned about that. And I will, I will abide by the dictates of whoever is in authority. I remember, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you have 20 minutes, as I did, yeah. and most others did, but the honorable members who are ministers, they got an additional five minutes because they have ministries. So if you can abide with the 20 minutes, please, sir. Thank you. Yes, madam. I, I just wanted some guidance to know what is the principle or what is the tenant within the standard orders of the House of Assembly that give the right to any individual to make a decision without any consultation. But then it's a matter that needs to be addressed. And I hope that in the form of governance that we will see coming from this, this new republic, that at least people who are classified in the manner in which we are classified as backbenchers, um, elected by the people of Barbados, not selected by anybody, that we would be able to play a more meaningful role. And, and, and Madam, since I believe that I have been in this place for a long time, I don't believe that my first point of communication about any decision making should be when I come to the House of Assembly or on any kind of or what do you call it? WhatsApp. <laughs> Parliamentary WhatsApp. Or, or anybody telling me about any Zoom. I, I don't even know if the rules were modified or amended subsequent to the coming in of these new digital tenants. Honorable member. Um, but no, I'm just telling you, this is... I, I'm following I the rules, as you know. Yes, yes. I'm, and um, it's I'm about not, time that you get your daughter and some others to teach you about the technology. Yeah, well, so I'm you get a better understanding. Madam, You're not too old to learn. Yeah, but madam, and I'm here working with the elderly, sir. Yeah. But madam, I am more into the books. Use your time, sir. Some people like pressing me. buttons but don't know the English language. And I know sometimes they use the technology, but when they get to the grammar, they don't know if it has or have. So these things occur. I, I prefer to understand these structures and while gradually coming to the point yes. where these things are happening. But I have a genuine, genuine concern. And, um, I think this, is, this concern mushroom even more severely since we reached the stage of Republican status, that we should look back at the structures that came from Westminster and at least make the adjustments as we go forward. Um, so, Madam, I've also had the problem. I've also had the problem of having to face directives. Now, this is only a little preamble, baby. Uh, about, that that has almost taken five minutes of your time, yeah. sir. Yes, but I always and we have, have timelines. Thank Ma you, Madam. You know, I always have a very long run up. Yeah, it can't be too long tonight. And uh, then, it, then the pace follows. May I have another long run, <laughs> another place, but yeah, okay. Yet. But, Madam, sorry again. But yes. uh, I, am, I, am, I want to focus a little different because 
everybody, everybody made their little contributions, looking at the body of the economy of Barbados, and everybody, all those who never even studied the subject in any serious way, oh, not, never even went beyond arithmetic, all of a sudden become experts on the subject matter of economics. Um, I prefer to, to follow the road or the directions of Kwame Nkrumah. So I, I prefer to seek ye first the political kingdom, and that is the way I enter into politics. Right. And all other things will come unto thee. Um, I believe that the politician is the decision maker. And I believe that the politician must shape the kind of politics. But you can only shape the kind of politics if you have a clear trajectory in the philosophy that underpins the, the form of governance. And, um, so therefore, I feel that the state has to play an important role at all times. Um, I, am, I am not one of those people who will tell you that the, it might be so, but it's not what I agree on, um, that those who control the economy shape the direction of the state. The ministers must know that they have power. I am not going to water down the word power by using any term about any authority. It's because people don't respect the authority that you have. So if you have power, you have to learn to assert yourself as a minister. I, for a considerable time, those faces of people who look like me in here and outside been given political power. And there's an expectation, especially as a consequence of the historic journey that we have had, there's, a, there's, there's an expectation but that we will see great economic transformation. There's an expectation that capital will not always dominate. And there emerge the labor's institution of a workers' union. But in addition to that, MPs must understand the importance of developing an economy that the landless people, the people devoid of capital, after 1834, that is time that we do all that we can, even if you expand the economy or not, but to ensure that the black intelligent people, not the ones that don't accept that they have intelligence, but the black intelligent people becomes owners of wealth and business. So I, I want to put it on the table very early. Very, very, very early. I don't get into a state of euphoria over my traditional slave master expand its economy and start adding the word us to it. That we this and we that, and you have nothing but the salary that you get from here. I expect that members in this parliament would understand that when we talk about economic restructuring, all this economic restructuring and debt restructuring and so on, I don't want to see black businesses declining at a rapid rate in the society because the politician has done nothing of the time if under a regime, the black businesses declined. I came up hearing people saying that the whole of Robert Street was below. But wait, what is it called now? Not the re any reconstruction period. You used to call it Black Wall Street. And I know how it was destroyed. I know how it was destroyed, Black Wall Street. But I also know Black Robert Street. And that is no more. 
I also know through the street and through the street produce many black people that occupy the halls of parliament. How do we feel with all of these skills in our hands? That people who stole the land, the people who exploit us, never pay a cent for labor. That we know glorifying and continue to, continue to have an economy that is still dominated by those same people. They will hate me till eternity. But I know this is the role that I will play. I'm not stopping anybody else from being an agent of whoever they want to. I am not saying that other people should not survive on the face of the earth. But I say, how do we redress these, these, these serious imbalances in our economy if we do not understand the, the priorities that must be given to the political energy of the politician over those who control the economy and work assiduously for the transformation of the economy into the hands of our people. Look, I had some friends. They're no, they're no longer around. Some of them. They had hotels on the south coast. Their families struggling to keep the hotels. I saw there was a big um, industry. What do we call it? Industry with the clothes that make clothing. Textile industry, no more around. I, 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 I bleed and cry for these people, the families. The children could not inherit anything because black businesses collapsed in this country. I know you can't do it the way it was done with the highway to where. I know that. Because I understand how the law is structured and how the international institutions exist and how they direct small states, especially state, third world states, that we must follow their directives. And when you don't, they end up even paying people when they have not even done the work because they have to come to some kind of legal settlement because of the language that you use here. I'm not going to use language that will cause such. But I want to say, for a long time, I have seen the wayside group of companies. As a black man, I felt very proud to know that a black man was in control of that. I have seen the Jose Jose company grow. And I felt proud of that. And I would like to continue to remain feeling proud of that. There's nothing that these people did that was worse than these particular social types. That was in procession of wealth for all of these years. There's nothing that these men did or is doing at this specific time that, should, that they should be experiencing the challenges that they are experiencing. And I, and I, I want to, I want to, I want to at least be a voice not for corruption, not for being subjective in my view because I'm a black man, but I believe that any one of us with a conscience understands very well 
that we have to do something to help these people. These people should not want to run from this country to go to other parts of the region in order to survive. I remember, have me excuse, you have three minutes to go, please. Madam, I really want to get to St. Michael's East, and that is why I was very concerned about these rules, you know. I, 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 I would never... Please don't shoot the messenger. Well, no, I would never, madam, never at any time, especially now that you have that honorable standing in here, I would never like to know that I feel unhappy about any ruling that you give. You give. Ma'am? Honorable member, none of us has been unhappy. Yeah. Those are the schedules that were set. Yeah. Everybody has conformed as far. And you see, Would you please, uh, sir, continue? Yes, madam, I will. Uh, Thank you. As, especially if it pleases you. And I, I know that you are, you are not going to be a dictator from the chair. Right? As long as it pleases you, madam. My view, and then and let me say this to all of you. I don't want to make a fuss out of anything. You know? But I am, as a backbencher, I believe that I am deprived on many occasions, as I said, at the inception from participating. I have to go cap in hand and beg somebody to fix a road. A man that spent all of these years in the House of Assembly. I got to go and ask, can I get a house? And I don't know for a woman who doesn't have anywhere to live. There's no policy that tells me if you build houses in my community, how much houses I will get. I have people that don't have food. It might not be the minister, but I have to face playing a role walking through the door of the welfare department and answering the head of a department. These things are wrong. The structures must be changed. I have to wait till a minister that did not face the electorate in this country approve sometimes things that I asked for and could justify and approve. And that's why I said, in a calm way, I would love to be able to say something from a political perspective about the governance of Barbados, where we are now, not because of any particular prime minister or party. I live in a constituency for years. I come here every day and talk about Zone 1 and whether the only change that has occurred is it change from Zone 1 to Zone A, what that means to me and the people who are suffering in the bell. What that means to the people or the children going to school at Belmont School, class, the environment is choked and clustered. I'm a member, I hate to interrupt you, but I have been given the schedule because all the other members have their opportunity to speak for the limited but time as well. I, I if you would so kind, sir, to wrap up. I will never disrespect you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disrespect so you. I, I, what I want to say to you is that those who believe that they could do to the honorable member from St. Michael's East what they do to other people who love the name backbencher, who love the name backbencher, if you do it to me here, I don't have to even come back in here. I can go to the people with a branch meeting or community meeting and speak my position on these issues. It is not right to come in here and nobody give me the equivalent of an introduction in time. I am restricted by the constraints of time in which I had no say. It does not conform. I doubt very much. I don't know the standing law is that great. Some people come to Parliament and learn more standing law and have basic inputs into discussions. I want to have discussion. I want to engage. Madam, no. Honorable member, I, I understand I, I, what I, you are saying, sir. I will but I will wish you to conform yes, in the I light will. I will. And, and uh, to trust just me. let you know, I agree with you about the branch meetings and so on, to be able to reach your residents and your constituents, because I conformed with the same limited time you Ma have, Madam, and I'm a backbencher. Uh, so will you please wrap uh, up, sir? And I'm going to do that now. Thank Madam, you. Thank you. I just give you notice in advance. Thank you, sir. That I will His go, will, will go to the people you. that I represent. 
Because this thing about giving people special slots deliberately, because I am not a significant other. So if you give me a slot at a specific time, and other people speak, everybody can see them, because them is significant others. I am not. All I'm saying, Madam, I can only put it to you. And if it was any other person, I would put it to them as well. Madam, I am not satisfied with the manner in which the parliamentary proceedings are being governed by leader of the House or whoever, or deputy prime minister, or whoever am not satisfied with this happening to me without any form of consultation. Thank you very much for the time you allow. Your most welcome honorable member, there was a communication sent to inform us before yesterday evening. But thank you, sir, and um, I appreciate it. Honorable member for Christchurch East. East. Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you for allowing me the opportunity. And I plan to make full use of my 20 minutes and get all my points in. Um, first, I'd like to thank the people of Christchurch East who continue to support and who placed me here to do the business of Christchurch East and the business of the White of Barbados. This year, Madam, was a particularly difficult year, and there was a lot of anticipation coming up to the budget. I must say that the Honorable Prime Minister delivered a budget that met with pretty much universal acclaim. Normally, after budget, you get the dissection of the budget, and people saying what hardships it created, what was wrong, what was right. But from the majority of the commentators, there seemed to have been an overall sense of this was as fair a budget as could be expected with the reality of the circumstances that Barbados faces. Madam, today is a day for serious business. Talk a sheep. Molly. <laughs> Molly. Empty accusations and ill-researched presentations. Madam Deputy, are not for today. Why? Why is today not the day? Because yesterday we had to endure a presentation from the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the member for Christchurch South, that has left me wondering as to which Ralph is the real Ralph. I'm not supposed to refer to him by name. As to which persona is the real persona. If this budget had occurred six weeks ago, that same member would have voted to pass the budget. That same member sat through five budgets before as a member of the government and passed every single one. He voted to pass every single one. To hear the same member come in and pillory decisions made while he was a part of the fold and lambasted this government for things that he had a say in and policies that he helped to form as a member of the parliamentary party to complain about the dictatorship and the exclusion, having been a member of the same parliamentary party that I am, having had the same opportunities that I had to weigh in on policies, having had the same opportunities that I had to go to understand how to read estimates, to undergo estimates, preparations, and other budgetary explanations that made us be able to come in here and speak with some degree of understanding as the policies being presented by the Prime Minister. If this budget had occurred six weeks ago, the Honorable Member for Christchurch South would have been thumping and say, I at the end of the whole thing. Prime Minister, sorry, 
Madam Chair. <laughs> Six weeks later, the honorable member can find nothing good at all to say about the budget. Nothing good at all. I come in here and I try to be balanced. And I'm going to show my balance later. I try to be balanced in what I say. Sometimes we do things that may hurt, but are for the greater good. And I will acknowledge the pain. Sometimes when the honorable leader has spoken, the opposition has spoken, I may not agree with everything he says, but if he says something that makes sense, I will, I will agree with what he said that makes sense. I find it beyond reasonable and honest comprehension that the honorable member could have listened through four hours by the honorable prime minister and then responded for in excess of five hours and in that dissection and response could find not one good thing, not one thing that appealed to him, not the provisions in support of the police officers, not the provisions in support of the nurses, not the provisions in support of the disabled, not the provisions in support of whoever. Not one thing. Almost everybody in the private sector who weighed in, the business owners, labor, said it was a fair budget, no new taxes. If the Honorable Prime Minister had levied one more tax, she would have been the devil incarnate. She didn't level any. She's still the devil incarnate. However, despite all the commendations of the budget from people saying that it was balanced, it encouraged growth, it provided a way forward, it allows for the development of business, it shows capital expansion, despite all those comments. However, if you listened to what was said by the Honorable Leader Opposition, Barbados is worse off than ever before, ever. People are suffering and the end is near. The government, the end is near. Madam Deputy Speaker, this government is not unfeeling. It is not uncaring. But we had to grapple with unprecedented challenges. Challenges that no government in the history of Barbados had to deal with one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, enough to cripple any other government that this country has ever had. We're not making excuses. We're being real. We're being practical. The dollar is still stable. Our dollar is stable and capital works are still ongoing. It was a few years ago, six years ago, every Barbadian was living in dread that the dollar was going to be devalued. We were on the edge of devaluation. Most people could not see a way out. Thousands were scheduled to go home. People could not see a way out. Now, the economy is growing. The dollar is still stable. For anybody who said, I'm not pointing back to what they did, because you know what? History will judge them. Is there, people say Bajan's memories are short, but I don't think they're that short. For all who say that nothing is happening in Barbados, for all who say where the money is going, let me, let's, let's, just, let's just take you on a visual journey. You cannot drive through Waterford Bottom and look left and look right and not see that a change has happened in Barbados, and I want to big up the Honorable Member for Christchurch um, West Central. I, I want to big up the Honorable Member for his Clean and Green project. The visual representation, the visual representation of a country that is turning around. Here's 101 clean and green sites, a number of them, and God bless you, a number of them in Christchurch East. A number of them in Christchurch East. Madam Deputy, for anybody who says that the government has done nothing and we're worse off, then 
I just said, look out for the electric buses. We had a shortage of PSVs, a shortage of public service vehicles across the board in Barbados. We had a shortage of government buses. We could not, the transport board could not muster a proper complement to service its obligations. Now we have electric buses. Now the biggest complaint is one I heard recently that the AC wasn't working in a bus. That's the complaint now. Not that the buses don't come. And you can actually get a schedule. You can actually call the bus terminals. You can call Oisins. The people from Christchurch East can call Oisins to find out when a bus is coming. When is the bus scheduled to leave? We ain't had that before. Madam Deputy Speaker, you remember the garbage was piling up? Every which way we look, the garbage was piling up. Now we have garbage trucks to properly service Barbados. We now have more roads being fixed than in the history of Barbados. This is probably the most aggressive road program in the history of Barbados. People complain about the potholes, you know, having the road surface all over the place. And yet, nothing good has happened. The government is not doing anything. More houses are now being built for low-income persons in Barbados than in the history of Barbados. More housing solutions are going on at this point in time than ever before. But yet to hear him, nothing has been done. And solutions turn The ELSA. The ELSA repairs and rebuilds the most aggressive post-disaster social improvement program in the history of Barbados. The government undertook a mammoth task not to make a profit, not to put money in anybody's pockets, but to help the people who were ravaged, who suffered at the hand of a natural disaster, to ensure we improve our housing stock. I mean, quite frankly, Madam Deputy, I'm in charge of disaster management. I don't think the government can ever undertake a program like that again. But at the time, it was critical. At the time, it was necessary. And it was done. It is disingenuous to sit in his five hours. He could not find one good thing that this government has done. We have, Madam Deputy, we have more upgrades and refurbishments of pavilions and, and community centers and lighting areas than ever before. I have one in, in Schmarlow in Christchurch, and God bless you. God bless you too. I have one in, in Schmarlow that allows people to use that field on the evening, that field that nobody ever used to use. is now in constant use. Three football teams have made that their home field. You drive around Barbados, you see people out exercising, utilizing the fields. But nothing was done. This budget, Madam Deputy, is not about promises and unrealistic plans. This is real talk and real works within the context of what can be achieved given the current circumstances here and abroad. Ultimately, we're in this house to serve people, not to grandstand and spew propaganda and conspiracy theories. It is the height of hypocrisy to support policies one day and then come back the next day and criticize the same policies that you supported and you had a hand in backing. It is the height of hypocrisy. As soon as you jump ship and return to where you really belong, you can find fault with everything, even the things that you supported. The programs of this budget Madam Deputy, we'll be successful if we explain them to our constituents and then encourage them to make the greatest use of the opportunities and benefits. And I challenge my colleagues, and I also challenge the Honorable Member for Christchurch South. If you are honest with your constituents, wherever it is that you line up, if you're honest with them and you explain to them the budgetary provisions and what is in store for them and how they can make use of what is being provided to advance themselves and their families, we will all be better off. But that requires an honesty from everybody. I'm sure we're going to get it from this side. And persons talking to their constituents, I hope we can get it from the other side. Because it is not about self-aggrandizement. It is about helping and supporting your constituents. Madam Deputy, I said I going to be honest. Every man thinks his burden is the heaviest. 
right? No matter how much is going on in Barbados, there's some people who have not felt it. Let's be, let's be honest. There's some people who have not felt it. There's some businesses that have not recovered from COVID. There's some persons who have not yet caught their feet. It is our responsibility as a government that if the country is buzzing, that we have to find ways to get that money to trickle all the way down to those who need it. It is a particularly sore feeling for somebody. If you look at somebody who is now doing well and prospering, and you're in the same position, that is our role as a government. We have to get the money trickling down to the small entrepreneurs looking for a break. But Madam, Madam Deputy, the money can't trickle down if there's no money. We had to first right size our economy. We had to get it going back in the right direction. If Barbados is on the rebound, but your business is still suffering, then your perspective and your pain is real. And we as a government have to help you realize your fullest potential. So let's be real. Is it hard? Yes. But we're also coming from a long way back. Is the cost of living high? Yes. But the government is doing what it can to try to bring that down. Are some people suffering? Yes. But equally, is the dollar stable? Yes. Is there confidence in the economy? Yes. Is there real growth in the economy? Yes. Are we seeing a real turnaround? Yes. It's not going to happen overnight, but we're on the right track. And as I said, the only way that we can get money to trickle down is for there to be money in the first place. Madam Dep Deputy, let me just go really quickly to hurricane preparedness. The Prime Minister in her budget provided over $4 million to the Met Services Department. I didn't want to big up all the staff at the Met Services. The Barbados Met Services is doing well. It is actually establishing itself as one of the foremost Met Services in this hemisphere. So we no longer are relying on the models and things that you used to get from the National Hurricane Center. We've developed our own models. I say we because I talked to the, the director of Met, Mr. Sabu Bess. I talk to him probably every single day, multiple times a day in hurricane season. And we have a progressive department that is on the cutting edge. It actually filled my heart with pride early this week to see Cuba, the Met Services in Cuba, using a Barbadian developed model to actually deal with their weather and their weather situations. Why is this important? The one thing that can wipe out every single thing that we've achieved all of the gains that we've made as a government, all of the things we've tried to do, all of our capital projects, the one thing that can wipe us out in the blink of an eye is a hurricane. It's a natural disaster. And we have, we, this government has put money into the UN-backed philosophy of an early warning system for all. We've put a lot of money in to make sure that Barbadians get the best chance and the earliest possible warning. Barbadians must admit that last hurricane season they never got as many updates about anything as they got then. It was explained chapter and verse. Explained chapter and verse. Every Bajan now knows what is going on and we're actually so accurate with it. With the weather stations that we put up around the country, almost 100. To allow us to even pinpoint where it's going to flood. We no longer do a general flood warning. We no longer do a general warning. We are actually in a position to say you expect these rains a flood warning for St. Lucie with a, a, a red alert, a, a yellow alert for St. Peter and whatnot. Down, down to the parish and sometimes even the district, we can actually give people forewarning. And this, madam, is a, is a good thing. But in the area of resilience, in addition, I want to commend the Honorable Prime Minister for removing, keeping the VAT and the duties off of the generators because that is going to help people to be able to manage the after effects of a disaster. I also want to thank her for keeping the duties off of the water tanks, of the water tanks. A lot of people don't yet have them and their facilities there through the Water Authority to enable you to get some assistance in purchasing water tanks. But if we cast our mind back to what happened when Elsa swung through. Elsa was a Category 1 hurricane for two hours. It, it barely crest, crested Category 1 hurricane. 
but it caused tremendous damage across Barbados. People were without water, without water for a significant period and people were without electricity for a couple of days. We recovered quickly in the grand scheme of things. Within a week, almost everybody in Barbados was connected back to electricity. Most people got it back within two days. But I want people to remember the hardship that they went through for the two days to the week. I want to remember the difficulty that they had when the, water was, when the electricity was not on to the pumping stations and they couldn't get the water. I want to thank the water authority for actually doing their own independent generation to be able to power the pumping stations even if the national grid is down. But for all Barbadians, we are coming into that time of the year. Hurricane season generally begins, it begins on the 1st of June, but nationally and internally because we're being affected by systems as early as May, we the government in Barbados are treating the hurricane season as actually beginning on the 1st of May. I'm asking people who are in a position to do so Look out for yourself. Put on the hurricane straps. There's a hurricane strap program as well provided under this budget. Do what you can to minimize any effects to yourself. It is easy to pay it forward than try to do it on the back end. Madam, Madam Chair, my last point. We have to look at initiatives to help people. We, we, we've heard about the most vulnerable. We've heard about those who are in difficulty. We've heard we know, we know. I want to urge Barbadians as well to take advantage of the opportunities that, prevent, that present themselves. Never before has there been this level of training opportunities provided to persons to better themselves, whether through the CBQs, the NTA programs, all the other retraining and retooling programs done by the government to help those who were laid off. All of these programs exist. Madam Deputy, I urge people to take advantage of it. In our own, in my own constituency, we just did a CXC Second Chance program where we provided scholarships effectively for 30 persons. If you have no CXC certificates, this allows you the opportunity to be fully funded, to undertake the courses and to take the exams for 30 persons. I'm happy to say it was fully subscribed. Can I afford to do it at this point in time? No, truthfully, it was real hard. But can my constituents afford to wait until another time? No, they can't. So we have to find ways, innovative and creative ways to reach each other and be each other's keeper. So having said all of that, my conscience is clear with the provisions in this budget, in this budget and these budgetary proposals. My conscience is clear having come out of the estimates and the honorable ministers who presented and were subject to the scrutiny of the, the leader of the opposition and the public of Barbados, I am comfortable and satisfied that we are on the right track. It is not going to be easy. We have been through a lot. We've been through 10 years of wastage and squandering and corruption. We have been through natural disasters back to back to back to back to back to back but we have turned the corner and we are still here. This budget is going to help us to continue further on that road to see real growth, real prosperity, and real development for the people of Barbados. All we have to do now is make sure that what is happening above trickles down to those who need it most. And I'm comfortable that this budget will help us to get there. Madam Deputy, I thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I want to, at this time, also thank the wonderful people of St. Michael West Central who sent me to this chamber initially to serve their interests as a backbencher, and then later, of course, I joined the cabinet. But in thanking them, I want to say what I always say in every um, budget speech, that whenever given an opportunity to serve in the government, or in a cabinet certainly, that I would give it my best shot. And I stand here today 
with that same mantra that I will continue to give this Ministry of Tourism my very best shot. Mr. Madam Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member for St. Michael Northeast and her able economic team, also greatly assisted by the Honorable Member for Christchurch East Central, must be thanked for the budget presentation which she delivered in here on Monday. Mr. Speaker, the budget was a no-tax budget. It was one focusing on growth and development of the Barbados economy. And for that, we have to thank them. Madam Deputy Speaker, I should also thank the Leader of the Opposition, because the Leader of the Opposition has certainly <laughs> um, expressed his concern about the continued rel uh, reliance on, uh, that Barbados has on tourism as a major economic driver of the economy. Um, he himself, Madam Deputy Speaker, complimented the Ministry of Tourism and certainly uh, the team by uh, extension for the success being enjoyed in Barbados by the Ministry under my leadership. And clearly, if you have policies within a government, those policies are within the government. And therefore, he's also, by extension, congratulating the government. But I want to uh, assure him that um, our best efforts and his best wishes certainly expressed for the support of the tourism sector uh, will not go to waste. I can assure him of that. Because, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Barbados economy, when it had sugar as king, sugar led the economic growth in this country. With the reduce or the reduction of sugar as king in the economy, tourism stepped in, Madam Deputy Speaker, and filled that void. So even though we rely heavily on tourism, it must be established and context has to be set. That you had sugar, it was king, and there was much reliance on sugar. But today, as we evolve and we move, we have now tourism playing its role. So I am happy that the leader of the opposition has associated himself with one of the successful policies of the Barbados Labour Party, and that tourism is on its way. Mr. <laughs> Speaker, I also am very happy to announce that the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. is set to welcome on April the 2nd, I believe that's the Monday, contractually the first, but first workday is the second, its new chief executive officer and its new chief operating officer, both of whom are highly qualified Barbadians, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the success of the tourism sector. In fact, I'm, last year I was in um, St. Lawrence Gap when we had a water issue. And whilst I was there, the operators and the workers told me, Minister, the winter season has started early. It has started in November. And that continues, Madam Deputy Speaker, to this day. We are operators in the industry wherever you go are complimenting the government and the tourism policies for what they are earning. And I might also add that the workers in the tourism industry are telling us how about their service charge and the fact that they're enjoying a bigger service charge and more tips, ladies and gentlemen, and that is what is happening in Barbados. So it is important that we join the national debate, but it is also important that I also acknowledge the team that I have working for me, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I give you the assurance that the team working at the ministry and all the agencies supporting the ministry will continue to do so in earnest because we recognize the value of tourism 
But furthermore, we recognize the value that of the sector that employs thousands of Barbadians. And I remain conscious of this. And that is why I've always said, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, that I will always ensure, as long as I am Minister of Tourism, that there will be no trickling down, but we will ensure that we pour down and pour through to bring about personal development out of economic growth and development in this country, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm committed to that, and I will ensure that we do everything possible to ensure that the trickle down gives way to flow through and proper development. In other words, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to see us moving beyond celebrating growth to experiencing growth and development in the livelihoods and lives of all workers at all levels within the tourism sector. And I will do everything, like I said, to ensure that we do so. Madam Deputy Speaker, you know, the Barbados Labour Party has a very strong philosophy. It has an objective, in fact, such a philosophy and, 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 and objective are already captured and expressed in the Barbados Labour Party's motto. That long-standing BLP motto, a better life for our people. And this is what the Barbados Labour Party has been doing. And as we approach our 86th year in April, we will clearly show and continue to show that the mission at hand that was established long time ago, it is, has nothing to do with the lofty rhetoric, Madam Deputy Speaker, but practical realization that we will make life better for our people. And I say all of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, because something that I refer to as the AAA leadership, we had the right excellent Sir Grantley Herbert Adams, his son Tom Adams, and Owen Arthur. Of course, we have our current Prime Minister. The effect of the triple air leadership that has from within the Barbados Labour Party that has caused us to be where we are and to help define us as a people. Now, Mr. Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me go straight to the point because I'm conscious of the time. The UK market delivered last year over 243,000 visitors to Barbados. The market surpassed the pre-COVID numbers at 110% of the pre-COVID number. The United States market is gradually recovering to almost pre-COVID numbers. The Canadian market almost did the same along with Europe and of course the Caribbean. But Madam Deputy Speaker, all of this was driven because we, as I've said before, relaxed all of our protocols in September of 2022. And having relaxed our protocols in September of 2022, airline schedules would have been, and the network planners would have already uh, announced their schedules. The cruise ships would have built their itineraries. But Madam Deputy Speaker, in 2023, we know we realize the rebound that we were looking for. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that the outlook is very, very encouraging for the tourism industry. The seat capacity for 2024-2025 is expanded to expand by over 85,000 seats. In other words, Madam Deputy Speaker, next season, we will, in Barbados, have seat, extra seat capacity of over 85,000 seats in this destination. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, the growth is led largely by the reintroduction of Delta Airlines from Atlanta, New York, and American Airlines from New York and Philadelphia gateways, and of course, Delta will be flying to Barbados from November the 21st of this year. 
from New York, that is out of Atlanta, from New York on December the 23rd. 30,000 seats coming from that market. American Airlines from JFK, 30,000 seats. And from Philadelphia next winter, 4,750 seats. In fact, to recognize the historical significance of the return of American Airlines to Barbados, the flight numbers from JFK to Barbados will be flight 585. And, from the, and the return flight from Barbados to JFK will be 707. And let me give you history. Flight 585 was the first American Airlines flight to Barbados touching down at the then Seawell on November 1st, 1975. And flight 707 was the silver American Airlines jet that, left Bar that came into Barbados and left Barbados. The Canadian market, next winter, and it's important for me to tell what we're doing ahead. Next winter, the forecast is that we are going to increase by 9.2%. The UK, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have done well and we will continue well and we are going to surpass next winter the, level, the targets that we, set, that we set for this um, winter season. So the, the market will experience growth and we are going to increase by over 44,000 the number of seats into this destination. Aer Lingus, the winter season from Manchester service will continue in the next winter season. The BA will operate their largest and newest aircraft into Barbados. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner into Barbados with a 10% increase in capacity for this summer to coincide with World Cup. World Cup. Virgin, as we all know, introduce a double daily from March, from January to March, and, we, and their forecast was, perhaps, was lower, and I am pleased to inform this chamber that Virgin told me two weeks ago that they beat the forecast and we can count on them next winter season. United Airlines announced a year-round service from New Jersey and also from Washington, D.C., resulting in increased capacity. JetBlue launched their first ever midweek service from Boston into Barbados. And American Airlines, as we all know, now has three daily flights out of Miami and one daily service out of Charlotte. Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt and to show the stark contrast between this Barbados Labour Party and the Democratic Labour Party when it comes to tourism, let me highlight some things. The Democratic Labour Party was in control of this government from 2008 until 2018. And Madam Deputy Speaker, can I tell you that the, under the Democratic Labour Party's watch, and I can call them out, they lost American Airlines from Puerto Rico into Barbados April 2011. They lost Dallas Fort Worth on August 2012. They lost the American Airlines New York flight on the 14th of January 2014. They lost Gold Airways on the 27th of August 2016. They lost Delta New York on the 2nd of April 2016. They lost Avianca on the 31st of July 2017. And they lost Delta Atlantic on the 12th of August 2017. And the Democratic Labour Party want to talk about empty seats. Well, I am ready for the discussion and I have not revealed my hand yet. I am not a lawyer, but I have not revealed my hand. <laughs> Miss Madam Deputy Speaker, and they want to talk about gall and empty seats and paying for empty seats. But let me tell the House this. They paid up, and we had to pay the bill, Madam Deputy Speaker, 13 and a half million dollars that they owe gold that they didn't pay. And we, this Barbados Labour Party, along with millions of other debts that they left for us, had to settle. And they're talking about, want to show examples? Well, I've said that the Democratic Labour Party lost at least seven, seat, seven flights into Barbados. I told you about the Puerto Rico, I told you about Dallas, I told you about New York, I told you about Gaul in Brazil, New York, uh, Delta, New York, Atlanta, Delta, and also, sorry, uh, Delta and Avianca. Mr. Speaker, Stark contrast, what have we done? Since we came to office, this Barbados Labour Party government, we added 
Aer Lingus from Manchester. It is now, it's going to be on its third rotation into Barbados next winter season. We brought Copa Airlines from Panama to Barbados, started with one flight. Now we have four flights, Madam Deputy Speaker. We have Conviesa from Venezuela. We have Inter-Caribbean with multiple flights throughout the Caribbean to supplement a lot of the loss that, reductions that we had for Leah. We have Suriname Airways from Suriname and Guyana. United Airlines, we brought from New Jersey and Washington. And of course, Cayman Islands. But Miss Madam Deputy Speaker, in addition, you know what we did? We reversed the flights that the Democratic Labour Party lost. And we are reintroducing Delta from New York and Atlanta and American from New York for the next winter season. I tell you when we're going to bring over 85,000 seats and I'm being charitable because I may soon have some other announcements to make. And next winter season, we are opening up the gateway from Philadelphia through American Airlines. That all the work that I did with my team when we went through the sweltering heat in Dallas and all across the United States last summer, that when you got on the airplane, the heat hit in your chest, almost to give you a cold. We did it on behalf of Barbados. And I might add, Madam Deputy Chair, that we are working on other initiatives. I would like some traction out of Puerto Rico. I want some traction out of Chicago. I want some traction out of Houston. I want some traction out of Africa. And I also want some more out of Latin and Central America. And I also I want to put this foolishness about the number of flights and that. We have some people in the car and other car. I mean, countries getting more flights out of Barbados. And I can quickly give you this, Madam Deputy Chief, um, Speaker. Look at the average weekly flights. And I can make mention this. Barbados from Canada, 15. Antigua and Barbados, 7. Grenada, 5. St. Lucia, 8. And St. Vincent, 4. Europe, Barbados, 2. Latin America, Barbados, 6. All the other, 0. United States, 43 flights a week into Barbados. Compared with 27 into Antigua, 21 into Grenada, 36 into St. Lucia, and 4 into St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the UK, and the UK, Madam Deputy Speaker, 35 flights into Barbados compared to 9 into Antigua. The tag flights that this Barbados Labour Party sanctioned to help St. Vincent and Grenada, so they were going, but also to build out additional regional travel for Barbados' destination. And I can tell you the secret what we're working towards. We want to build out a hub in Barbados. And therefore, you can see, even though we have the tag flights, there is a strategy behind that. And we don't expand, I'm not going to expound on it today for the interest of time, but we are developing a strategy compared to other destinations. And I don't want to remind the country that the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. and Barbados as a destination won Barbados Best Tourist Board at 2024 Globes. And I'm not going to tell you about the Star Winter Destination Award that we won. And I'm going to tell the country that in cruise, this cruise season, we have rebounded, Madam Deputy um, Speaker. This cruise season, we will, we will have 406 vessels calling here over 742,000 passengers, an increase of 6% year on year. And in the summer, I am pleased to let the country know that summer cruise has returned, and therefore we anticipate 24 calls with close to 50,000 cruise passengers this summer. I can also tell you that the cruise ships, and when I met with the pres four presidents about two, two and a half weeks ago, they told us, don't worry, we love your destination, we love your people. Norwegian Cruise Line, the newest prima vessel, came to Barbados with 3,000 plus. Virgin Voyages came to Barbados for the first time with their first inaugural call on January 16th, and MSC Explorer and the Norwegian Viva as well. And talking about home porting, to help build out the economic state of this country, in home porting, we had 184 calls last season. This season, we have 178 calls. 
growth uh, registered 26% growth in the home porting market. And of course, down the road, forward thinking. I can also tell you, and the Prime Minister also had a statement in the comment issued by PNO that the iconic Cunard Queen Elizabeth will visit Barbados throughout 2025 and 2026. And we are also seeing increased demand for luxury yachts in Barbados, the Rick Skerton luxury yacht. And of course, we are going to soon welcome a very special one that I cannot announce. I'm um, not going to talk about all the developments. Remember, you have two minutes, sir. Thank you. But, Madam, I have two minutes. But I'm not going to tell you about the hotels and what we're doing. That will come another time. And that how profitable we have been at Needham's Point. We are moved from a profit of $3 million in 2017 under the Dems to $9 million under the Barbados Labour Party. But, Madam, Madam Deputy, I want to tell you that I will ensure that this Barbados Labour Party continues to do very well in tourism. I am not going to rest until we turn every stone to ensure we get the best bang for our buck. And I want to say to you that the Democratic Labour Party has no moral position to come in here or elsewhere and tell the country that they have done better than us. Let the record reflect that the DLP's record on tourism can best be de 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 uh, described as ineffective. Okay. That the Barbados Labour Party has restored airlift to Barbados. The Democratic okay. Labour Party lost airlift into Barbados. At, and I can repeat it finally. The lost American Airlines out of Puerto Rico. Yes. American Airlines out of Dallas. American Airlines out of New York. Avianca, Gold. Delta out of New York, Delta out of Atlantic. Not only did the former Minister of Tourism elected to give away and, to, uh, and cause us to lose those flights, Mr. Speaker, we also lost earnings. But, Mrs. Madam Deputy Speaker, as I conclude, let me assure this country that tourism is in safe and productive hands with this minister assisted by a first-rate team. I want to thank all of those who work in the tourism industry for their contributions. We have seen the difference. The country is a buzz. People are making money. And I believe that all players in the tourism sector are happy. And I want to thank them. But to give this house the further assurance that we will continue to grow tourism under this Barbados Labour Party. I'm obliged. Honourable Member for St. Joseph. Mr. Speaker, thank you for according me again the privilege of speaking in this chamber. And um, this particular budget is of especially great interest given the entrance of a new player on the landscape. Mr. Speaker, it would have been easy to ignore the speech of the Honorable Member for Christchurch South. It would be. It was remarkable only for its length. He, he's, the Honorable Member um, waxed philosophical and cited all kinds of classical scholars, and he, he told the, lead, the leader of this party, the Prime Minister, I am better at English than you. Well, I would like to refresh his memory about something called a brutum fulmin, a thing full of sound and fury signifying nothing. We had five hours of that yesterday. Truth is, Mr. Speaker, it was even embarrassing for those people who came here to support him because one by one by one, they all slunk away out of the chamber in total, total 
discuss. The Honorable Member what's biblical. And um, I feel he must point out to him that his speech was characterized by three of the seven deadly sins. And when taken as a whole, it added a fourth. Mr. Speaker, those deadly sins, um, I think you would recall the deadly sin of pride. And throughout his speech, it was clear that there was an excessive belief in his own abilities and to his skill and qualifications, the sin of pride. And the sin of envy, I feel, was perhaps more obvious than any other because he couldn't keep the title Attorney General out of his mouth. Every eight words, he was referring to the Attorney General. So it must be that there's something that I have that he wants. So he's guilty of the sin of envy. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> he's also guilty of the sin of sloth. <laughs> the sin of sloth, Mr. Speaker, is the sin of laziness. But we are not surprised because when he sat on this side of the chamber, he was never here. When he was here, he was sleeping. He showed no, no interest in following any of the things that the government was doing. And in fact, in fact, Mr. Speaker, you know that it is sloth when he does not even remember that the former leader of the opposition read the same article about a white oak in a budget not long ago. His speech characterized laziness of thought and absence of duty. Mr. Speaker, the member for Christchurch South quoted Shakespeare many times, and I, there are two other quotes that are, attributable, that are attributed to Shakespeare, Mr. Speaker. One of them is that talkers are not generally good doers. That's a warning. But the other quote attributed to Shakespeare, better to be king of your own silence than slave of your word. Mr. Speaker, the Bible, which he also quoted freely, has a passage where he said, by your words you will be condemned. The honorable member had everything negative to say about this administration. He had everything negative to say about everything that we've done. In the words of the member for St. George South, the young member has hitched his wagon to the horses of the Democratic Labour Party. And he's done so with great pride and aplomb. But there's a downside to that, Mr. Speaker. Having hitched his wagons to the horses of the Democratic Labour Party, he has become the face of the Democratic Labour Party, not just in this chamber, but also in the country. He has become the face of the most corrupt political party in modern Barbados history. He has become the face of wastefulness, callousness, and mismanagement. So the Honorable Member for Christchurch South must now claim everything that the Democratic Labour Party did as his own. But that's the great irony, you see. This party has worked hard for five years to turn around all the wrong things that they did. And for some bizarre reason, he, can't, he, he wants to disavow everything we've done. What we have done and achieved for this country is not worthy of him saying, I want to own this. Instead, he wants to own all the wrong things that were done by the last administration. Mr. Speaker, he doesn't want to claim the success of White Oak. And I, I, I'm a little bit worried because the other members sat in this chamber when we talked about White Oak. He sat in this chamber when we passed legislation for our debt restructuring. And in every speech we went through methodically exactly what was done and why. We went through the fact, Mr. Speaker, that our national debt was at a whopping $18 billion. 
when the Dems left. And at the end of White Oak's hard work, it was down to $12, million, $12 billion. Now, Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I don't think the Honourable Member understands what it means to save $6 billion. $6 billion. And it is the fact that we were able to save $6 billion that was able to put this country on a good footing. But you know what? The Honourable Member would have preferred us not to pay White Oak and keep that debt hanging around our neck. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? It means that he also owning the $18 billion in debt that we were left with. I was dismayed. I was dismayed, Mr. Speaker, at the fact that the Honourable Member could talk about White Oak's fee. But let me tell the Honourable Member what I want him to own today. Because under the last administration, a lawyer did work for a corporation, a statutory corporation. The transaction was cancelled after a few months. You know how much the lawyer charged? Five million dollars. Five million dollars the lawyer charged. And another lawyer did no work at all, no work at all in relation to um, the Four Seasons. Did no work. He was asked to sit on a committee. The committee met once. And he sent an invoice to the Ministry of Finance for $1.6 million to sit on a committee that met once. And another lawyer in their ranks did a little project for the port. Charged $3 million. And up to today, he can't justify even $100,000 of it. And then there are other lawyers that he now has to own as his kindred spirits who charge another 1.6 and another 1.6 there. The difference between White Oak and his friends, Mr. Speaker, is that White Oak worked. They work hard. We can identify what White Oak charged for. We can identify what, they, what we paid them for. And today, the work of White Oak is what has enabled us to have an economy with a future. But that is what the Honorable Member wants to disavow. Mr. Speaker, it took him 30 minutes to read one article in the Financial Times. I believe he was trying to fill up his speech. It took the form leader, the opposition, who read it three minutes. But we understand, we understand his difficulty. You know, Mr. Speaker, when he was on this side, we explained that the critics of White Oak were the very people who did not want us to restructure the debt. Isn't that a strategy that we know? They didn't want us to restructure the debt because it meant they all had to take a haircut. So you know what you do? You curse the people who are doing the work. Oh, you're paying them too much. You're paying them too much. They never said that we were paying them too much as banks. But they curse White Oak. And we explained that on this side. And somehow the Honorable Member still does not have a clue. Well, there are some more things that I want the Honorable Member to own. I want him to own the two 5 Series BMWs that a contractor in this country gave to two of his ministers. Two of his ministers. And they parked them in Parliament Yard. I want him to own that too. You don't want to own anything we do, we we'll own everything that they did. I want him to own, Mr. Speaker, the results of the special audit of the Barbados Water Authority. I want him to own the paragraph which says, the audit office reviewed 10 contracts with a value of over $700 million. How much we pay away to? 20, 27 million? The audit 
of the Barbados Water Authority under their administration, his administration, sir, because he belonged to them. The audit office reviewed 10 contracts with a value of over $700 million. And it was observed that the majority of these contracts did not go to tender as required by the Barbados Water Authority procurement rules and the Financial Management Audit Act, another act that had been adopted by the authority. It has been observed that firms were being engaged with no evidence of how the engagement was initiated. Millions of dollars in contracts were being awarded without evidence that the service was reasonably priced. There was also, in one instance, the absence of any written contract. In short, the procurement process lacked transparency. Own that too, member for Christchurch South. Those are the things that the member on that side, the member over there, railed against night after night after night, the corruption, the dishonesty, the wastefulness, night after night, when he was in the good company of these righteous, decent people. But he's, he's abandoned us now. Well, um, I have no regrets about his departure. I don't think anybody on this side does. We are happy to see you over there. But Mr. Speaker, I said that it was easy to ignore it, so I have to, I have to caution myself not to pay him too much attention. I am proud to own what we have done as a government for the last six years. And I am proud of this budget. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that this is probably the third consecutive budget that we've been able to say to the people of Barbados, no new taxes. When I was trying to stay awake while the honorable member was speaking last night, I went back to the nine or 10 budget speeches given by his party when they formed the last administration. In every single one, Mr. Speaker, it was tax, 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 and more tax. Our country was on its knees. We were buckling, Mr. Speaker, and his ministers of finance were imposing tax after tax after tax. We have come yet again to this country to give, as we have to the disabled, to give as we have, as we have given to the police, to give to people who want to invest. And we're saying we're not going to extract a single tax from you in return. And your member finds nothing commendable about that. Well, I am proud, and I know that we are all proud to own, to own the achievements of this government, which could see us year after year after year saying to the people of Barbados, we will not burden you further. We will achieve the growth we want by being more efficient in our dealings, by being more transparent in how we conduct business, by encouraging people to come to our shores and help us to grow. That has been our strategy. Not taxing, relieving people of the burdens of taxes. But these fundamentals elude the member for Christchurch South. You know, Mr. Speaker, I, there were a few things that I had to restrain myself from laughing. Um, Yahoo member said that there are police constables, because I, I am proud to own what we do about them too. He said there are police constables in the service for um, 30 years or 39 years or something like that, and um, can't even make a corporal. Well, I understand his problem. You see, the Yahoo member was a them first. And then when he lost the nomination, against the future prime minister, because he was a dem first, then he became a B and sought the nomination. Then he get vexed and went back and joined the dems again and ran in two elections for them and came back over as a B. The problem is that he's such, he's been around with so much, it's difficult for him to focus and to remember who did what then. <laughs> I believe that when he was a dem back then, Henry Ford, abolish the rank of corporal. <laughs> Henry Ford abolished the rank of corporal. 
Oh, and before I left this, left being a team, Ben. But I, I would like the member. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to use the allegory of the sheep. But I, I would like the honourable member to name one of these corporals. <laughs> Tell me which station he works at. Tell me which station he works at, Mr. Speaker. I am proud to own the initiatives that we have put in place, Mr. Speaker, for our teachers, for our nurses, and for our police officers. You know, I, I don't know, again, I don't know what he reads. Perhaps he's reading too much Shakespeare, not the Daily Nation. The honorable member said that uh, uh, he listed 15 disincentives to investment in Barbados, and he said one of them is crime, and crime is rampant. Well, I, I, Shakespeare reading, see, because everybody knows that crime has been going down, and he talked about homicides, and homicides are half of what they were in the previous year and have been on a steady downward trajectory. But we understand his strategy, you see. He is the boy who cried wolf. He sits or stands. And he says, all is not well. But he can't tell what it is that isn't well. Name one thing that isn't well, and we give you a little reward. Ralphie boy. But he can't name one. So instead of dealing with particulars, he throws all these things out there and he said, oh, the members of, you, of, of that administration are guilty of, of um, misconduct with, with public funds. Name one. Tell us one. He cited the public, the, 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 the um, anti-corruption act. Yes, we passed it. His prime minister, the former prime minister, the one he now owns and claims as his own. When we talked about needing a new legislation to deal with public with corruption in public life and so on, he said, oh, but we have an act. It was, it was passed in 1919. And he was comfortable with that. But where's the corruption that he's talking about? Barbados had a sordid reputation for corrupt practices in every level of our government, in every level of our society. A taint, Mr. Speaker, that we have systematically worked at removing. And we are now, we are now, we are now ranked perhaps as the, as the least corrupt country in the region. Not because we say so, but because the international community has been able to look to see exactly what we've done and what we've been doing. I know, I know your signal that I, I need to hurry along, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've begun to make important changes to a category of people that for too long governments have flirted with. When we talk about nurses, teachers, and police, I remember Oinatha was pilloried for making a comment that police are not special. And I think I understood what Oinatha was trying to say. But the fact of the matter is that those three professions really are the pillars of our society. It is like a tripod. I'm not trying to suggest that other people are not important, Mr. Speaker. Not at all suggesting that sanitation workers are not important, or that the BDF are not important, or that the watchmen at the school are not important. We all are. But when we take those that, that oh, well, you know, the, the honorable member um, talked about the duumvirate. Well, we would rank those three professions in the hierarchy of careers as being the triumvirate. Those, those are three pillars that allow this country to stand, Mr. Speaker. And we have begun the effort, we've begun the work of changing how they function. I am so proud, Mr. Speaker, of our initiative to, to make loans available to sergeants, station sergeants, and detectives. I am proud, Mr. Speaker, of the fact that we are, we are willing to give a special allowance for the criminal investigators. Mr. Speaker, all of these are initiatives in this budget 
that the honorable member seems to have found fault with. I am sorry if I've offended him, because, but I shouldn't, I sh it is unparliamentary to make any comment about where people are. But you know, it is so disrespectful. It is so disrespectful, Mr. Speaker, that he called my name if he, if he said 10 words AG was to them. It is so disrespectful. He doesn't have the, even the decency to sit down in here and listen to what I'm saying. Mr. Speaker, um, we, I'm going to wrap up now. Mr. Speaker, we have committed in this year's estimates a significant increase for the police service. Last year, we had an unprecedented $135 million. We have never had so much money voted in the estimates for the police service that we did last year. But this year, sir, we have surpassed it by yet another $10 million. So when the other honorable member tries to scare taxes about crime, we are grappling with the root causes of crime and we are putting our money where our mouth is. But we're also putting our money where our mouth is in tourism. We're putting our money where our mouth is in agriculture. We are putting it where it counts, Mr. Speaker. The next 12 months is going to be an exciting period for this administration. The Prime Minister said that it's a buzz. I believe that is a pun on the bees, and it's one that I like. So I will help to own that too. The next 12 months will, in fact, determine where we are, not at the end of the next financial year, but where we are in 10 years and in 15 years. And we have a competent team of individuals. We have a competent team of individuals who are well poised, Mr. Speaker, to make the difference in the lives of Barbadians. Every single initiative in this budget has a target audience, and we are going to deliver. We've left no one out. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry that I, I can't go on for any longer, but out of fairness to my colleagues, let me thank the people of St. Joseph. Let me thank you for your patience. And um, uh, most of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that uh, we stand unified mm -hmm. and committed to the causes that are important to this party. Good governance and a people-centered governance. I am obliged to you. Honourable Member St. James Central. Mr. Speaker, sir, um, I rise to share a few thoughts and a few perspectives on this very important matter. And as with my colleague who just took his seat, um, I, I think I should say this, read it just into the record of the House, sir, because there are those who will wonder why the Honourable Member of St. Joseph and myself, and indeed the Honourable um, Deputy Prime Minister, will only speak for 20 minutes. And that is because, sir, we want to demonstrate the discipline necessary in order to enable the Right Honourable Prime Minister to be able to take, um, to make her presentation at a specific time. I, I make that point mindful that there has also been a, a need to remind colleagues about the, the burden at whatsoever level of experience and whatsoever rank you may carry of carrying and committing oneself to that discipline. Sir, I felt a sense of unbridled revulsion. <laughs> unbridled revulsion. Did, did you feel it, Mr. Speaker? When the Honorable Member for Christchurch South spoke in this place yesterday evening. And you, because you sit in the throne, might have been immune from it, sir. But there were periods of time, sir, when I feel that ingratitude stronger than traitor's arms would have burst the mighty hearts of men on this side. People who stood shoulder to shoulder with the Honorable Member and helped him to come to this place. When politically naked, they clothed him, treated him as a vulnerable member of the team and assisted him. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, sir, what was visited upon us was unwholesome at best and obnoxious at worst. And beneath, beneath the character that I know the honorable gentleman to be, I consider it beneath him, sir, I go further. 
I feel he did an injustice by submitting this front bench to trial by ordeal. You, sir, have sir, you, sir, are a member of the legal profession. You understand what I mean. Years ago, when you try a man by ordeal, this is the medieval way of trying somebody. So you met them, you, you stoned them, or met them walk on hot coals. And the language that was used by the honorable member for the gentleman for Christchurch South was identical. Well, I watched them writhing in their seat, sir, taking pleasure at the infliction of pain born, in this case, out of rhetorical ordeal, sullying people's reputation, Mr. Speaker, sir. Suggesting by innuendo that there are people in this place who are guilty of financial impropriety, but also a shred of evidence, Mr. Speaker, sir. Now, I, 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 I can speak Sunday in St. James, and I have unlimited time down there. So I ain't going down that road, no. But, but, Mr. Speaker, sir, wherever you want me to speak, Madam Prime Minister, I will speak. But let me say this. I feel, Mr. Speaker, that, you know, out of an element of empathy, because I know the honorable gentleman had to reply to a budget and financially unsound as he is, uh, one must feel empathy. And I know that he went to seek guidance from a chap called Eswick. And, and Mr. Speaker, sir, that would have taken him to the point where, you know, they say, ignorance, sir, is the curse of God, and knowledge is the wings on which we fly. So to relieve oneself of the burden of ignorance, one sought knowledge, but in the wrong place. And the chap to whom he went would have given him that which he gave his predecessor leader of the opposition, this white oak story. And so he comes back to relitigate the white oak story, sir. And, and, and as if not mindful of the fact that a whole general election campaign has gone since then, and, and since then, sir, 30 seats have been returned by the right-thinking people of Barbados in their judgment. And what is the fault? What is the fault, sir? An, 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 an allegation about a professional fee. Now, first of all, the allegation, sir, is made by, I can be very blunt about it, because I do not know how self-respecting black people in 2024 especially those that I hold in high regard. How do you reduce yourself to come to the people's parliament? This is no longer, sir, any extension of, of Britain. We are a republic. Let us, let us own that and own self-respect at the same time. So you come to the people's parliament to repeat, to repeat the empty racist imperialist, neo-colonial rantings of a white journalist who feels that a firm made up of people that got dark color skin ought not to be able to charge a fee. And this is made by an argument repeated in here by a professional, sir, a professional. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I don't know. I, I do not know what was visited on your chamber, on your, your house. Because the argument cannot be one of the size of the firm, that it is a two-man firm becomes an issue. Is that the substance of it? Because I would have thought it would be the competence of the two men. Uh, I, 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 Mr. Speaker, sir, I died in a little office somewhere in London. Did not the honorable gentleman for many years practice in a little office in Roebuck Street? And did not the same little, the same little office produce a, a, an attorney at law in the form of that honorable gentleman who's just walked out of here so disrespectfully? He's a senior counsel in Barbados, sir. Did his little office stand in the way of his becoming that? So what manner of fecal matter? has been visited on this place. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, I want to be very clear about the matter because we are now at a point, sir, where 61 electoral exercises have taken place in this country. And in, that six, in those 61 electoral exercises, the people of Barbados, in their wisdom, 
have determined that not a seat in this place is going to the Democratic Labour Party. By means outside of those 61 electoral exercises, the Democratic Labour Party has found itself with a seat in this place. They must be held to the standard that this place has become accustomed in their absence. And in holding them to that standard, Mr. Speaker, sir, I begin by saying that I, for one, will not be subjected to any pupillage by that honorable gentleman on this question of financial impropriety and, and what he calls the likelihood of, of corruption. I listened to him very well. He, couldn't, he didn't have any evidence, so he couldn't charge anybody with corruption. Talk about the likelihood of it. I am not submitting myself to pupillage on it, Mr. Speaker, sir. And why? Because on the evening that the gentleman from Christchurch South became leader of the Democratic Labour Party politically, because they have an administrative leader, I do not know what that means. I presume he orders the toilet paper and so on and so forth. <laughs> But on the evening that the Honourable Member became the leader of the Democratic Labour Party, his first order of public business was to go to Ellerslie School, where he shared a public platform, where he shared, hear me, sir, he shared a public platform with an ex-convict who was incarcerated for corrupt practices. I am not taking any pupillage because the very first signal that he sent was one of acceptance and association. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, I go further. I want to say that this government must take no pupillage because the Honorable General who sits to my immediate left, the Attorney General of Barbados, has presided over the most, the, the most abundant suite of anti-corruption and integrity in public life legislation. In the history of this 385 years of Parliament, sir, in the history of this 385 years of parliamentary democracy in Barbados, right here, this government, that Attorney General. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, let us be very clear on that. Now, I do not know why he would go and subject himself to pupillage from SWA. I mean, why would you reduce yourself to being called the, the pit bull's poodle? <laughs> well, why would you do that? Well, why, why, why would you subject yourself to that? And, and, and Mr. Speaker, sir, then the other indignity is one that I take personally because when you humbug my constituents, I feel it. And he should have left out Lancaster. I do not know what his vexation is, sir, before, generally, because I'm still to understand that. But I want, Mr. Speaker, sir, to say that the innuendo about land at Lancaster that originally called 80, cost $18, but I was transferred for $2. Sir, I want to understand from the honorable gentleman what is sinister about a government in the interest of the people, especially the ones in St. James who asked me to come in here and speak on their behalf. What is sinister, sir? about capping the cost of the land so as to make it more accessible by those people. What is, what is sinister, sir, about capping the cost of the land so that the total cost of the transaction is driven down, enabling ordinary people in working class and lower middle class Barbados to access piece of the rock? What is sinister about that, Mr. Speaker, sir? And then, on top of that, well, those folks go out to work by day, their roofs now will be working for them by day so that they are able to have electricity generated and sold into the grid in order to help pay off the mortgage, setting a new trend and a new standard for home ownership in Barbados, led by this government in the interest of the people of this country. What is sinister about that, sir? No, Mr. Speaker, sir, I, I, I want to say to you that I took offense, therefore, when he said that there's no hope, but there's despair. And I want to share, sir, and in anticipation of what you can ask for, I will make it a document in the House when I done. But you know, sir, on the 18th of March, while she who presides over the 
the leadership of this government was, was giving her budget speech. What was delivered to me? This epistle, dear sir, we write to inform you that we will be having a, uh, having a handing over of keys ceremony to the new homeowners at Vespera Gardens, Lancaster, St. James, which is one of the areas in the constituency that you represent. And to this end, we would be pleased if you could attend the ceremony, which will take place on Saturday, the 23rd of March, 2024. I, I, I don't worry about the postponement. I am simply saying, Mr. Speaker, sir, that these people that he says have offered no hope and only despair are at a position now where they are writing to me as the MP to say, brace yourself, star, to come and put on your finery because people in your constituency will be getting housing solutions. And what is happening down there? 161 houses in Lancaster, Mr. Speaker, sir. And on average, therefore, you may have two, probably two owners, to every, two owners to every house. So you are in a position, sir, where we're having 322 people who will now be beneficiaries. And if the honorable member wanted for a moment to live up to that which I believe he has in him, but for some strange and probably perverse reason he does not want to express. Analyze the issues in Barbados. The simple issue around this, sir, is that a year and a half ago, the Honorable Prime Minister went down there and launched that project. And within three days of the Prime Minister launching that project, sir, there were 3,000 applications for those 161 houses in the, um, in the office of the, the Minister. No, Mr. Speaker, sir, it tells us, therefore, that the ambition which the Prime Minister set for this country of 10,000 housing solutions, and we say solutions because housing is a challenge and has been a challenge for donkey years in Barbados, that the ambition of 10,000, sir, is not only valid, but it might actually be too small and that we've got to go even further because while we are going to house shortly 161 people down there, sir, there are thousands more. And I've said it on all sides of this house now, and I say again, I've said from the public platform in Barbados. Every administration, everyone has to carry an element of burden in this. I've said it in opposition, I've said it in government, I've said it publicly on the platform. Because, Mr. Speaker, sir, we knew for years, I came here in 2003, and at that time, there was a backlog of 18,000. How did I know there were 18,000 applications at National Housing, Mr. Speaker, sir? Because a lady came to me from a prospect, St. James, and told me that she, age 54 as she was then, was waiting on National Housing to, to, to provide her with a solution. And that she had been applying since she was 24 years old. That goes back to Barra. That goes back to St. John, Tom Adams. All, Sandyford, everyone. So let us take the foolish party politics out of it and face this as a mature society and recognize that we have to wrestle this problem to the ground and that the best solution to the wrestling of that problem has come from the, the Prime Minister Barbados and this front bench, the Barbados Labour Party. Well, Mr. Speaker, sir, in the absence of logical thought, the gentleman from Christchurch South often seeks to shelter himself or sought in the budget to shelter himself from public scrutiny by repeating the mantra, inflation, inflation cost, as though it is recent discovery. Now, Mr. Speaker, there is a serious issue, and it should be treated as seriously. There is a challenge facing not only Barbados, but facing the world. Inflation, sir, globally has been estimated to be running at around 10%. I mean, that's the IMF. Mr. Speaker, sir, our experience in Barbados was around 2020, 2021, we were seeing inflation at about 1.6, 1.7%. By 2022, sir, it had crept up to 4 point something percent, 
and that is largely because of the COVID challenges. And it has continued to be resilient, sir. I may have leveled off around 5% or so now. But Mr. Speaker, sir, it is a reality that hits everybody in their pocket when they go to the supermarket. It hits every one of our constituents, sir. And there's not one person in here who believes that their constituents should be suffering and paying more money if it could be avoided. So it is not a partisan political issue. And Mr. Speaker, I want to say that the, the um, disproportionate way in which inflation impacts us as a small island is because we are really net importers of everything. We're net importers of food. And the government's agricultural program has been robustly defended today by the Minister of Agriculture. Yeah. We are net importers of fuel, Mr. Speaker, so that it must drive our economy. And we have gone beyond any other country that I know of in the region to transform ourselves to being uh, renewable energy oriented and, and, and dependent. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, what has to be made clear is that Barbados has provided protection to vulnerable groups and to marginalized groups and has shielded average consumers in this country. And that the mischief that is being put abroad by the gentleman from Christchurch South in particular has now to be scotched. Because what is the record, sir? What is the record? The record is, sir, that there's now a household, has been since COVID, a household survivor, survivors program, $600 per month cash to vulnerable families, to vulnerable families. And that, Mr. Speaker, sir, since the time it was created, since its inception up until now, we are talking about $62 million provided to vulnerable families in this country. then does he stand in his place and talk about a government that doesn't care? I invite the Honorable Gentleman from Christchurch South to show me where else in the Eastern Caribbean that that has been done, or its equivalent. Mr. Speaker, sir, not satisfied. The Prime Minister of Barbados has said that she would intervene and did intervene to cap value-added tax on gas and diesel sales and reduce the amount payable to consumers in Barbados, sir, and that meant revenue foregone or rather, savings to you, the public, of $14 million in this country, sir. Not satisfied, Mr. Speaker, sir, the government of Barbados removed the VAT on personal and critical care items. Another $6 million in savings to the constituents that we represent, sir. Not satisfied, we kept the freight costs for the purposes of calculating customs duties. Another $20 million in savings to the consumer, Mr. Speaker, sir. And then, Mr. Speaker, sir, the, the compact. Well, I, I, I must defend the compact. Why help negotiate it? When you told we sat down face to face, eyeball to eyeball with big players in the private sector, in, in the supermarkets and so on, in the distributive sector, and tell them, hold down, hold down the markups. That man that had 30% markups had to bring it down to 10, and that was an agreement. But it didn't happen anywhere else in the Caribbean, Mr. Speaker, sir. It did not happen in England. It did not happen in Canada. It didn't happen in the United States of America. And as if that was not enough, Mr. Speaker, sir, then the VAT reduced on electricity bills in the last budget. And then, sir... I remember what you're saying. Oh, uh, yes. And then, sir, we intervene by way of legislation so as to ensure that those people who were being, quite frankly, exploited had an increase in minimum wage. And in a, in, a, in a month or two's time, sir, we'll see the cutting of yet another salary increase in the public sector. And Mr. Speaker, sir, you cannot, in the face of all of those things, be heard to make a case that the government has been absent on this issue of cost of living in Barbados. And sir, I want any minute left to me to speak to the most fundamental of all the issues as far as I'm concerned, and that is the issue of revenue being foregone by the government. Because we cannot advance the protection of people and shield people unless there's money to do so. And one of the things that the Prime Minister has pointed out now 
sir, has been a humbug to the IMF, a humbug to those people who come and, 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 and lend um, advice to successive governments since 2011. If you go to every Article 4 report between 2011 and 2016, sir, you can see them talking about the concessions that were given. And back then, they were saying that concessions of $400 million or $500 million was too high. But you heard what was said in the budget today that we have yesterday, day before, I beg pardon, sir, that 2020, 585 million. By 2022, it gone to 784 million in concessions. By 2023, sir, 802 million. And the Honorable Member, if he was in his chair, would have been able to reach for a pen by he on his car, in the car driving home now or wherever. So I would do the arithmetic for him. At 802 million, sir, he's talking about $67 million in concessions a month. How can this country continue on that trajectory and still protect or shield those vulnerable elements in our constituencies? It is not possible. And there's a dissonance in an argument, sir, that says that you have on one hand to be doing those things to shield people, and then on the other hand, sir, that you can continue to carry that revenue foregone. And therefore, it has to be rationalized. And there's one thing that I agree with wholeheartedly in this budget, sir. If this country is to survive, is that we've got to treat to this. And, and why? Because our tourism sector in particular has been a beneficiary of this. And let me remind the country that it was that government that the Honorable Member has now gone and associated himself with. Sir, furniture fittings, vehicles, Boats and watercraft, you understand the type of things that were being, that you, you were not paying any duty on in Barbados with your particular hotel. Boats and watercraft, that means you were taking out the people, the small men on the beach to protect a hotelier. Mr. Speaker, sir, promotional and marketing materials, taking out the marketers and people who went through UE, the same, one that you're, same people that the Honorable Member Craig Crocodile dares about. And then, Mr. Speaker, sir, um, uh, household you know and personal you know. effects and so on. I know you know time. I coming home right now, sir. And I coming home on the point that left to that government, or the, the end result of that government, was that there was a tax holiday for, for 50 years, and then a further tax holiday, sir. Sorry, tax holiday for 25 years, and a further tax holiday at one half of the, 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 the duty payable for 15 years. 40 years, a 40 year free ride on the backs of the people of Barbados. That is the legacy of the Democratic Labour Party. That is what has been embraced by the Honourable Gentleman for Christchurch South. And I want to say to you, Mr. Speaker, sir, that those are the things that we now have to wrestle with to pull back and to make sure there's balance and fairness in this economy. Because we cannot build out a diversified Barbadian economy by going so far down the road as to offer one sector or one hotel in a sector virtually everything and then there are others coming along trying to try something different to build resilience in the economy to make the economy more diversified mr speaker sir functioning better in the interest of all of us and them don't get nothing because the government can't afford to, to help them that's where we are today and that's the fight we have sir and that is one of the reasons why i am wholeheartedly and unapologetically committed to what this Prime Minister has offered us in this budget. I thank you, sir. Honourable Member, Mr. Michael Sobeys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise late in this debate, sir, um, on the eve of the Honourable Prime Minister giving her reply to this budget. Having had the opportunity to hear all of my colleagues over the course of the last two days express, as I will this afternoon, sir, my own frustrations, having to listen to the Honorable Member for Christchurch South deliver his reply to this budget. Those frustrations, sir, are very real because I know that while some will agree that everything is not perfect that we are doing, that everything that we set about to accomplish, we have not yet accomplished. It is frustrating because I think all 29 of us 
appreciate that we constantly get up every single day to support the Honourable Prime Minister in the mission and in the vision to be able to make life better for all Barbadians. It hurts, sir. It hurts from a place where we have seen what we have inherited, and it hurts from a place where we have seen the struggle to get to where we are today. It hurts when a member from this side decides that having really not spent any time in the parliamentary group contributing significantly in this parliament of Barbados, can stand yesterday and criticize every aspect of this administration's policies, everything, every proposal that was mentioned in this year's budget, sir. As if he had in no way collided with any of the policies, any of the interventions, and I want to say for the avoidance of doubt, Prime Minister says it all the time, if people don't want to speak to things that they don't agree to, that is a matter for them in the cabinet. But this Prime Minister that leads this country on many occasions will ask persons if they have a problem with anything. She will go across the room and ask each individual member, whether in cabinet or in the parliamentary group, one by one by one, how do you feel about this? What is your position on that? And give them an opportunity to say how they feel. If they choose not to say, sir, we cannot read minds and neither can the Honorable Prime Minister. But we have now had to sit in this Honorable Chamber and get this tongue lashing about the, pol the policies of the Barbados Labour Party and of this administration, sir. And it is unfair. I will not stand here and say that we have executed everything that we are supposed to do. I will not stand here and say that people out there still don't suffer. But show me an administration where people did not suffer. Show me an administration that is different to this one. Where in this administration, we are trying to transform a country against a backdrop where we have inherited significant debt, sir. Against a backdrop where we have had to work every single day to turn this economy around. Where we have, yes, engaged consultants. Because we recognize, as we have said, that we have skills deficits. And if we have to go for the best minds and the best brains, Barbadian or otherwise, sir, I believe that this administration must be unapologetic for the steps that we take to do so. We can justify the actions that we have taken to be able to turn this country around. And it may not always sit well with everybody what we may have to pay for services, sir. But the truth of the matter that I know the Prime Minister is going to deal with it. That we can see an economy that is growing. We can hear the tourism sector that in the, uh, the arrivals and the performance of the sector is doing well for this country to be able to trickle down to the other sectors so we can pay our bills, sir. I am the beneficiary through the Ministry of Public Works of the 30 million that was able to come to the ministry for us to be able to do an accelerated mill and pave program in this country. And why, sir? Because the country was able to see levels of growth. And this Prime Minister, the Honorable Member for St. Michael North East, has said to us repeatedly, if I get enough money, I'm going to give you a little bit more money to be able to do some roads, sir. And in the last two months, because we, we said repeatedly, this, the Ministry of Public Works cannot do road works between July and December because what we have seen in terms of our pattern is that we are dealing with climate change and we are getting heavy rainfall and we cannot do what we would want to do. But what we have done is we've been planning, sir. And that is why when the Prime Minister snuck up on me in the middle of the night and said, Minister, you're getting 30 million to do what you're doing, we could hit the ground running. And regardless of whether it was in the parish of St. Lucie, St. James, St. Peter, Christchurch, all across this country, sir, has been touched by the accelerated Milan Pave program. And for those who are asking the question, what happened with Highway 7? That is starting from rendezvous going towards Oyston, sir. That is starting as well. And you would have seen the works that have been done down from Holtong to Spitestown, sir. 
We have been working. We have made sure that we've got all of the, the, the designs and the tendering for the designs done and started in relation to Highway 7. We have been working on Highway 1, which regrettably didn't get off the ground when it was supposed to, but we have now been able to be able to get that process started so that as soon as we can finish the sewage project on Highway 7, we are able to be able to get going as well on developing Highway 1 and the road work, sir. Sir, it has not been easy as Minister of Public Works. I have spent the last two years out in fires with potholes. And again, we have had to outsource in order to be able to make sure that MTW becomes more efficient. And so I will just take a second to talk about this. Part of the transformation is about taking a different approach. It is about making sure we do things differently, making sure people are held accountable. That people don't just, as Prime Minister keep calling me and telling me the men throw down the, 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 um, the asphalt in the road and they didn't lay it down properly. Sir, it is about changing a culture that has been allowed to get out of control. And we are going to continue to do it and to hold people to account. Those who are getting hazard allowances and they are not involved in any hazards, it got to stop. Where they're traveling and when I drive across oh, the length and breadth of this country, they're claiming travel allowances, sir. And we are finding that people are still having problems in community. It got to stop. We are holding our people accountable because you see, this budget is about transformation. This budget, if we are able to grow the economy, will allow the Ministry of Public Works to do all the things that every single member in this chamber is constantly asking us to do on behalf of their constituents. That is why we need the growth in the economy, sir. And that is why I support this budget. But as I sat here yesterday, I had to listen to the Honorable Member for Christchurch South speak to issues, cast aspersions on people's characters. You know, they say who the cap fit, let them wear it. And sir, I felt at one point that the cap was trying to fit on my little bald head because I believe that from across the other side, he was trying to, 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 to put a cap on my head. And sir, I want to set the record straight this yes. afternoon because the Honourable Member has chosen not to be in here while any of the last set of us are speaking. He wasn't here this morning, he came for a few minutes, but this is normal, sir. The other side will come to realize that the Honourable Member is not in any way somebody who is a, a party player. He is not a, 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 an individual who is going to stay long on anything. We have that experience on this side. We know he is not going to turn up for meetings. You are lucky if he turns up for the branch meetings. You are lucky if he goes into any constituency wherever he chooses to run. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm mindful we just had to change over, so thank you for that. But Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member for Christchurch South has pulled the lioness's tail, sir. I don't trouble anybody. Members on the Democratic Labour Party side who know me know I'm fear. Anybody in this country across the length and breadth of Barbados can call me for anything. When I speak in this chamber, sir, from the time I have spoken from in the Senate, I have always said, we must get the best and the brightest for this country, regardless of whether they come from the Barbados Labour Party bosom or whether they come from the Democratic Labour Party. Sir, I stand by that. So whether it is the head of the QEH, whether it is the head of the BT, MI, whoever it is, sir, I don't care. We deserve to have the best in this country. 
But when you approach now and you start to talk and cast aspersions, sir, on my character and other members of this chamber, I take great offense, sir. And I want to take you through a few things and just bear with me for a few minutes, sir. The honorable member spoke to a matter which engaged public attention in this country. He spoke to a matter which engaged attention and was the talk of the tongue that people spoke about checks, that a matter before the criminal courts implicated a certain member in this house, sir. And all in this chamber and all who have ears know that in recent weeks, we had the situation at my constituency office where a check was delivered to the office by a person who wanted to make a donation to my charity. Didn't reach out to me, didn't say anything, sir, beforehand. But before there could be any communication with me, that individual left the check at the office and the next morning, the check was stolen, sir. I have from the outset said to the entire country, I declare my hand, I said, I do not know nothing about no check. I have never seen any check. I do not know what it looks like. I don't know what the gentleman's signature looks like, sir, because I did not see it. For the Honorable Member for Christchurch South, knowing that he has privilege in this chamber, sir, to come to this place, to pretend as though he can skip and skirt around the law and profess that he can read from the Prevention of Corruption Act, quoting Section 8.2, giving an impression that I've taken something, sir, in some way that would lead to an aspersion on my own character, sir. I say it is unfortunate. It is unfortunate, sir, because I got a grandmother who taught me that he who is without sin cast the first stone. I came up with a grandmother who told me that Yashin called the, the portion called the kettle black. He also said in this chamber, sir, that we come to this job with reputations that are not always savory. And in his very smirkish way, he said, I'm not here to embarrass anybody. We must act with a sense of decorum in this place, sir. Well, I'm going to act with a sense of decorum this evening and I'm going to act in a way where I will not embarrass any member, but I will put the facts before this house for the people who are in, in this chamber and for all Barbados to appreciate that the man who speaks needs to be unmasked in this chamber because we do not recognize him as a, a voice of the people. He was never a voice of the people on this side. He was never a voice. You heard the young lady who spoke, the old lady who spoke about how she treat, he treated to her in relation to her disability, the woman who nominated him. We heard about that. We heard within the first few days of him coming to this place, sir, the aspersions he cast on the homeless society, sir, yes, yep. on homeless people in this country, making it seem as though the work of the people at the shelter had been reduced to singing lullabies and reading bedtime stories, sir. That is the person who is the leader of the opposition and the leader of the Democratic Labour Party, sir. That is the person who I want to unmask this evening, sir. And I said, I am sorry he is not here, but I know he can hear my voice, sir. Because I have in my possession, and I must tell you that, I must tell you, that the other thing my grandmother always told me is that those who know you are not all dead. Those who know you are not all dead. And Madam Deputy Speaker, as I drove home last night, you know, I cool, I listen, I hear what you said, I sit down and I take it in. But as I drove home, I got a text message. And the text message indicated to me DPM, when you get home, something been left at the house for you. <laughs> because I don't like how the leader of the opposition behave. I don't like the allegations towards the Honorable Prime Minister that she said, case closed after you indicated you had not, no dealings with this check, that you didn't give any contract to the gentleman who made the donation, that all you tried to do from the time I have known you is to make sure that poor people in this country get a little something to eat and that they can breathe a little better, sir. So the message I'm looking at, this message, I say, what is this now? What, what God ask my security, what, what is that going on? What, what, what God be concerned about what is left? But I said to myself, you know, all who know you 
are not dead. Because as I walked into the house, I was able to pick up an envelope with a couple documents, sir. And I have a couple questions for the leader of the opposition and for the party that he serves and the people who serve with him. Because I suspect that what I'm about to disclose, sir, may be, they may have got wind of it. I don't know where else it went yesterday, but they may have got wind of it. And as I sat here, I watched each of them make an exodus out of this room before the honorable leader of the opposition finished speaking. If it, it wasn't the president of the Democratic Labour Party, it was the former president of the Democratic Labour Party, sir. It was even one of his honorable senators that he just appointed. They didn't have time to hear what he had to say. And the truth is, we sat through it painfully. But we sat through it because that is what we do. We came here to listen to the concerns that he will express in here. But the truth of the matter is, sir, that the document that I read from, and AG, um, Honorable Member for St. Joseph, I, I want to tell you that by the end of this session, I am going to have some work for your people to do. Thank you. I read from a letter dated November 29, 2009, addressed to the Commissioner of Police, Police Headquarters, Coleridge Road, Bridgetown. It says, Dear Sir, the attached mirror's report was prepared and presented to the Board of the Urban Development Commission in response to their request to investigate reports made by clients of the commission. The commission is of the view that the report points to activities that might be considered as maladministration at best. While we are aware that any accusations made that connect individuals to them may lead to conclusions about the individual's behavior or character, not to invite your investigations could deem the commission irresponsible. Some of the matters included in the report have created tension between the commission staff and the tenants, and some of them remain incomplete. We therefore urge your office to move quickly to have any matter raised in the report fully investigated so that the commission can make a determination on the way forward. Your prompt attention is appreciated and anticipated. Yours truly, Derek Aline, Director of the Urban Development Commission. And many of you may wonder where this is going. I call the names because I come to this chamber with a sense of decorum. I come here not to embarrass, but I know that the author of this letter also has supported the Honorable Leader of the Opposition and I believe was here present yesterday as well in support of his presentation and is also one of two individuals who were former General Secretaries of the Democratic Labour Party. And therefore, the report that is that I am going about to refer to um, Madam Deputy Speaker is a report which was authored by none other than Guy Samirs, also another General Secretary, former General Secretary of the Democratic Labour Party. This report concerns a number of irregularities that had developed in the handling of the transfer of title proceedings by an officer, and I'm not calling any names, Madam Deputy Speaker, but by an officer who was the principal legal counsel at the Urban Development Commission. And it was in respect of several tenantries, the transfer of several tenantries. The first one was Nurse Land, sir. Nurse Land Tenantry in St. Stephen's Hill, Black Rock. On the 9th of August, 2004, there was a check, imagine that, a check, <laughs> bearing reference number 7958, constituting a subsidy payment of $12,250, drawn on the UDC Capital Works account, paid to Mr. Ralph A. Thorne, attorney at law in respect of Lot 7 on behalf of a client of the Commission. The unsigned copy of the document bears the name of the legal officer and legal assistant who seemed to have signed on behalf of the director. On the same date, 9th of August, another check also signed prepared a subsidy of $6,705.97, 
drawn on the USDC Capital Works account paid to Mr. Ralph A. Thorne, attorney at law, in respect of Lot 3, on behalf of another client of the Commission. On the 9th of August again, another check, constituting a subsidy payment of 12500 was drawn on the UDC Capital Works account paid to Mr. Ralph A. Thorne, attorney at law, in respect of a lot four on behalf of another client of the commission. The report says, Madam Deputy Speaker, that it is of interest and probably a matter that needs further investigation, that these cases were all referred to the same attorney at law, who is known to be close to the principal legal counsel on the same date. Some considerable time has passed since these referrals without the work had been completed. However, this delay, though inordinate, may not necessarily speak to unlawfulness. However, the determinative factor is whether the attorney's inaction amounts to him assuming the role of the owner by deciding what should be done with the money in his possession. It may reasonably be assumed that if one is in possession of funds for an excess of four years, <laughs> and has done no visible work in relation to the matter referred, then one has perhaps stepped into the shoes of the owner for the purposes of the control of those funds. Madam Deputy Speaker, the report seeks to question not only the actions of the officer of the commission, but clearly establishes that there was a clear relationship with the honorable leader of the opposition, then a practicing attorney, and clearly one doing work on behalf of the commission, and certainly on behalf of its clients. The issue, however, though, was whether each of the beneficiaries freely chose Mr. Thorne as their legal representative. Because as I will go on to show to this chamber, and those who have ears, that in a few instances, the clients did not even know that Mr. Thorne was their representative in the matter. But then again, I suppose, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is similar to his constituents, because if you don't engage with your constituents, it is unlikely that in your legal profession you are engaging with who are supposedly your clients. It got so bad, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the report goes on to say, that one way to get out of the above mess might be to draw the subsidy, withdraw the subsidy support for these three beneficiaries and ask that the monies advance be returned to the commission within a set period. This would bring an end to the blame game and make the attorney fully liable for the return of the funds. Madam Deputy Speaker, why would the attorney hold the funds for four years and do nothing? It raises that question as to whether the individual freely chose the leader of the opposition, or was it the, the leader of the opposition chosen for those individuals? Questions that I ask, sir, ma'am, ma are whether or not these monies were ever paid back as well. Because as I read at the outset, the letter went to the commissioner of police for further investigation and I'm not aware that any investigation took place, but I am happy for the Honorable Leader of the Opposition to clarify otherwise. I couldn't understand in the course of the debate yesterday, Madam Deputy Speaker, why Lord Burney, the, the fact that the Honorable Member for St. George South and I had a, a meeting and we talked to the residents of Lower Burney and to the residents of St. Michael Southeast about this administration easing the pressure in the Pinelands area in particular, where it is densely populated, would offend his soul. Why was this meeting so, so important to him? But then I realized that it had nothing to do with the policy of this government as it related to hope. When I read this report, I realized that Laura Burney was also a, in, a subject in question, that there were also clients from the Laura Burney's area. And I will start here by explaining Laura Burney's was not technically part of the Urban Development Commission. But in this scenario, the commission acted along with the principal officer and the leader of the opposition to act on behalf 
of clients who were purchasing um, lots in the Lower Bernese area. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will not get into the right, rightness or the wrongness of that action. Suffice to say that clearly there was an intention to allow these persons to be able to purchase. The actions were done, and therefore those people obviously had a legitimate expectation that the leader of the opposition would so act on their behalf. The facts are, though, that Ms. the principal legal officer advanced a government subsidy of checks to Mr. Thorne on the 19th of March 2007 concerning lots 9 and 10 in Lower Burnie. The accompanying letters were signed by the legal officer who stated that the checks were expected to be held in escrow by Mr. Thorne, pending delivery of an executed copy of the conveyance in these matters. The report goes on to say, in the opinion of Mr. Geisen Mears, it is not common practice for money to be sent to another in order that it can be held in escrow pending the delivery of completed work. That this may have been peculiarly motivated may be evidenced by the fact that two years later, the documents awaited have not yet been delivered and the monies forwarded have not yet been paid to the named beneficiary. They want a sniff test, Madam Deputy Speaker, because this one is not passing the sniff test. It goes on to say that they doubted whether proper procedure had been followed. It questioned the fact that the practice at the commission was for the commission's principal legal assistance to prepare the conveyance in matters of this nature, which would then be forwarded to the attorney at law who is acting for the tenant. Mr. Mears felt that if this was true, the procedure disclosed Mr. Cummins' letters of 19th of March 2007 as being wholly inconsistent with the Commission's policy, a policy which the individual is intimately familiar. It was felt that it was hard to put this odd development down to a lack of competence or difficult to understand it as negligence, for negligent behavior grounded in carelessness would hardly give birth to an action that goes contrary to well-known existing policy. The only option left seems to be some form of dishonesty. In any event, this seems to be an inappropriate use of the Commission's funds. Madam Prime Minister, it is written by Mr. Geisen Mears. The Mears report submitted to the Urban Development Commission and submitted to the Commissioner of Police for further investigation to look into matters revolve, re, re, concerning the checks that were written to the leader of the opposition and aided and abetted clearly by an officer within the Urban Development Commission. Madam Deputy Speaker, it gets worse. There's also Taylor's Land Tenantry, and I'm going to take my time to enter this into the record because when I get to the section that I'm going to read on theft and the misappropriation of funds, I want the Honourable Member to know that he alone does not know the law. There are others who also know the law as well. On the 10th of June, 2008, a lady visited the Commission's office to inquire about the process that would enable her to purchase the lot of land she occupied on Sylvester Cumberbatch Tenantry in Taylor's Land Bank Hall oh, by UPM. Mm -hmm. Miss, the, the lady ne has never had any prior contact with the Commission about the purchase of her lot. But the file revealed that a government subsidy to the tune of $6,458.40 had been paid to Mr. Ralph Thorne on her behalf concerning lot nine of the said tenantry on the 22nd of January, 2004, four years prior. Four years prior to her even expressing an interest in the purchase of the lot. In this case, the tenant had never been in contact with her presumed attorney at law and had never had a conversation with the principal legal assistant who prepared the correspondence and facilitated the payment of the commission's funds on her behalf in circumstances that could only have properly taken place with her consent. If the facts are stated here are correct, 
This state of affairs reveals a clear case of dishonesty. It goes on, Madam Deputy Speaker, Hall's Land in Bank Hall, and it gets sweeter. On the 9th of September 2005, the Commission paid a subsidy in the amount of $17,500 to Mr. Ralph Thorne, attorney at law, on behalf of another client for Hall's Land Tenantry in St. Michael. This payment was directed to Mr. Thorne in error, as it was intended for another attorney. By letter dated the 6th of April 2006, just a year later, Mr. Thorne was informed of this error and asked to pass the 17,500 which was sent to him in error by the commission to its rightful target to date, and this was the date of 2009. It had not been honored. It was not returned. It is worth noting that the officer had directed this check to Mr. Thorne and it was not until the tenant visited the commission's office and asserted that Mr. Thorne was not her attorney but in fact that there was another attorney that was on record for her that a reversal of this transfer was attempted by the chief project officer. This raises questions as to what instructions the officer had and from whom to cause him to direct these funds to Mr. Thorne in the first place. Because when seen against the background of the facts here contemplated, Mr. Maloney indicated, Mr. Mayor, sorry, indicated that this seems to be one more event in a series that points to a special relationship with the officer of the commission and Mr. Thorne in dealing with the funds of the Urban Development Commission. There is one more, Madam Deputy Speaker, well, there's only one more in this report. I suspect that like the sure. other honorable member who spoke this morning, there may be more coming and I may get more things dropped at the house. The other matter is dated the 23rd of January, 2009, where a client visited the commission's office in connection with the Johnson land tenantries at Green Hill and White in Hall. Again, in the prime minister's constituency. The last one was the speaker. The lady was the owner of the lands, one of the owners of the lands which was being sought to be transferred to tenants. It notes that the commission started the transfer of the title deeds at two tenant trees as early as 2000. They advertised in the newspaper, surveying work was contracted for and it was completed in 2002. From what Mr. Mears could see in this, from this report and from the evidence, the first communication with the landowner came to the commission on the 7th of June, 2005. And this indicated that she would be using Mr. Ralph Thorne as her attorney at law. Now, I want to make the point that this is the first time that the, the client is saying that they are actually using the leader of the opposition as the attorney. On the 21st of July, 2005, it appears as though the son of the landowner seems to have given a purchase price of $6.50 per square foot for the lots. It came to them, we revealed that the landowner, the client of Mr. Thorne, had never given any such authority, had never given any affidavit, given anybody permission to be able to negotiate on her, her behalf, but yet another check was written. And in this case, Madam Deputy Speaker, a total of $26,683.70 had been paid on behalf of this client. Madam Deputy Speaker, the prevention of corruption legislation was read with a view to cast aspersions on my character. But as I said at the outset, everybody who know you is not dead. I want the honorable leader of the opposition, the leader of the Democratic Labour Party, political leader of the Democratic Labour Party, to answer some questions. And I'm asking the honorable member for St. Joseph. He's not going to come back in here. He's probably heard what is transpiring. He won't come. I would like on the floor of this house to request of the Honorable Attorney General to ensure that the file in this matter that was sent to the Commissioner of Police is reopened 
and that a senior officer is put in place to deal with this matter, to determine whether there is any truth to what is here. Because what disturbs me, Madam Deputy, Speak, Madam Speak, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that people can come in this place and try to cast aspersions on the characters of all of us in this place. Throw a couple sprats out and hope that something lands, that you, you make the public believe that people on this side are doing something untoward. You don't have to bring the facts anymore. You just have to throw out a couple things and hope that something sticks. It is not good enough for the young people in this chamber who are part of the youth parliament, I want to say to you, this is not the way to do politics. This is not the way. It is a style of politics, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we rejected in this country. The people rejected this approach to politics, where you can just come and, and just besmirch the characters of people at will. It needs to stop, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are people who work hard in this country to make sure that the most vulnerable are able to eat and to breathe. And I will not stand here as the Honorable Member for St. Michael Southeast on behalf of the people who sent me here and allow anybody on any side to come in this place or any other place and try to cast aspersions on my character. I am accustomed to the Democratic Labour Party trying to do it, sir, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm accustomed. I had to sit on that side and hear the Honourable Member who was then for St. John speak about how I was childless, how the, the Honourable then Leader of the Opposition was childless and we didn't know how to deal with people's children. I'm accustomed, accustomed to them telling my artists when I was heading Pyramid Entertainment, Madam Deputy Speaker, that they would be victimized if I represented them. I am accustomed to the Democratic Labour Party nastiness. I am accustomed to them trying when you go and you uh, uh, um, get grant funding to assist the artists of this country to get out of Barbados. Some of members, you will recall, they come in here and they say all kind of nasty things about you. You're working hard to put Barbados on the map and they've got time to come in here to besmirch your character. But well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I know who I am. I know from whence I have come. I know how hard I have worked to get here. I know how hard my colleagues have worked to get here. And I'm saying in this place, they got to come good. Because whatever they come with, they need to come. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition needs to come with the facts if he is bringing something to this place to discredit this Barbados Labour Party administration. But I want also, in addition to the, the, the investigation being done, I want to call on the leader, the, the party leader, for the, the, the president of the Democratic Labour Party, because he was fast to hold press conferences. He hold press conferences for the Minister of Education. He hold press conferences for me. He hold press conferences corruption. for all kinds of people because he was concerned about corruption. How does he feel about what I have just read, Madam Deputy Speaker? How do the two gen former general secretaries of the Democratic Labour Party feel? I want to hear them. I want to hear the shadow cabinet. I want to hear the former president of the Democratic Labour Party. I want to hear the voice of the leader of the opposition who has put himself over in this place as the voice of the people. Who is he, Madam Deputy Speaker, to come in this place and besmirch anybody's character? He needs to explain these documents. I, when I, I mean, there were members in here who said, Sandia, don't talk. Madam Deputy Speaker, I ain't gonna talk, nobody can't silence me. When I know I am right, I talking. And I'm going to say what I have to say, not a fella in here don't have to defend me. I will defend myself first. And, and for those who say, Sandy, you should say nothing, well, I got news for you. I will not sit back after seeing what people in this country did to my father and allow these people to discredit the Bradshaw name again. I will, I will not. Nobody understands the hurt and the pain that you go through when people do these types of things. 
But if you don't have no sins, then you should keep your mouth quiet. If you have sins, you should also keep your mouth quiet because things can come out. And it is the same lady of the opposition who wants to talk about how we giving away tickets to people for fets and we giving away hampers. The honorable leader needs to tell this place and the people of this country, what does he do for his constituents? Apart from cross the floor, apart from disrespect them, what has he done? He didn't even have the decency to say thank you for Thornberry Hill. That's what's done in his constituency. He's worried about who's, on the, who's canvassing and which side of the road is his and which is the other person's side of the road. That's what concerns him. He didn't even say thank you for the roadworks program, knowing what a Democratic Labour Party administration did in this country when it came to roadworks and bridges. And now they have the gall to talk about in this place that he hoped that the roads don't wash away. But well, I hope that he don't wash away. But I know that we're going to wash them out another 30 love when that time comes. Because this behavior is totally unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable. And we must never reduce ourselves to this in this place, Madam Deputy Speaker. I leave the honorable member for Christchurch South to respond to what I have spoken to today. I leave the people of Barbados to judge. My first day in this parliament, Madam Leader, you may recall sitting on the other side as opposition leader. I got up in this place and raised the issues of the then speaker and the behavior of the then speaker because it did not sit well with me. It did not sit well with any of my colleagues in relation to actions and, and omissions on his part. I supported the integrity in public life legislation and I still do to this day. I got nothing much, I got disclose everything. That's what this administration is about. We disclose things even when there was no legislation. Yep. The honorable leader of this party, as well as the former leader disclose. That's who we are. We don't hide up anything because we come in the name of the people. And the fact that the honorable leader could not even collide with the budget speaks volumes. I believe, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will not detain this house. The honorable prime minister will respond appropriately to all of the other matters. But let me just say, I am proud of my colleagues. I am proud of the work that my prime minister is doing. She don't get a lot of sleep. Sometimes she's a little grumpy. But we have come to accept that she does what she does in the interest of the people. And I want to say sorry to some of the people of this country as well, because you know, there are times when as ministers, as representatives, we don't always get to address the concerns that you have. I hear the cries, we all hear it. And I hope that in the course of the next few weeks, certainly as we bring this debate to a close, that members have the opportunity to be able to get back on the ground and to let the people of their constituencies know the good work that this administration is doing. Madam Deputy Speaker, I am obliged. Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, sir. This has been a long three days, but I, I'm sure that you appreciate the necessity of this exercise in this honourable chamber 
which is required by our Constitution, such that we approve the estimates of expenditure and revenue before the 31st of March of every year. This government was particularly keen when we came to office to deepen our democracy and to allow the process to move from a series of second reading speeches that invariably over the decades became very political. 15 minute speeches in and out for a whole week and very little to do with the estimates. In fact, the leader of the opposition speech yesterday was reminiscent of what used to take place in the estimates where people collided more with politics than with the substance of the estimates in that very large purple book that you see on the desk of many. And for those of us who choose to have digitized, you see in this iPad, and certainly open to the public of Barbados on the Parliament of, of Barbados's website. But sir, we took a decision that it was important that the people of Barbados receive details over the course of a four-week period as to what takes place in the functioning of ministries in this country. Because when we said that we wanted to become more accountable, we didn't need a leader of the opposition to tell us that, that we needed to become more accountable. Indeed, the leader of the opposition himself was very much absent, the leader of the Democratic Labour Party, in most of the sessions that took place in the well, and I'm therefore happy that for once the people of Christchurch South have a representative who can now ask questions on their behalf with the well because he is only now present in this honorable chamber, so to do. But I want to thank all of the ministers and all of the public officers. We take it for granted. And the extent to which they sit in the middle of this parliament and they go for days and days and days, so much so that the newspapers can't even cover all of the information that they have been given because of the sheer volume of it. Sir, we believe as a party, this is how our democracy is to function. And sir, it has culminated in the second reading speech. And let me just say before I go, because there was a lot of talk about whether I was in here for those sessions in the well. Sir, I have come up in a tradition in this parliament where you give the opportunity to ministers to show and shine during the period of the estimates because this is their opportunity to be able to share with the public of Barbados what they're doing in their ministries. And Mr. Speaker, I have continued to believe that this is the appropriate way even in years before, some years I've asked, some years I haven't asked questions. And even when I've asked, I've only done it once. Why? Because I'm deeply conscious that if I speak, it may take a lot of the oxygen out of the room and the coverage that I need to be able to have line ministries to have to share what they're doing may not be readily available. But I want to thank now for this set of second reading speeches the honorable members on this side who have spoken, for the most part, we have been very faithful to ensuring that you understand what the program of the government is, that you understand what the objective of this budget speech is, which is simply to achieve higher levels of growth and to ensure that that growth is balanced and shared and fair and to ensure that in this world where so much is happening around us over which we have little control, that we develop even greater resilience, Mr. Speaker, to be able to withstand all of the crises that we will face as a country or as a family or as a community, sir. Because crises are coming one after the other, after the other, after the other. That has been our experience. And Mr. Speaker, I truly, truly want to say to this side, that they rose to the occasion in almost every respect to be. As Matt Flingo would say, you can clap for that, yes. The truth is that from last night, when the Honorable Member for Christchurch East Central spoke and reminded this country that had it not been for COVID or the natural disasters, 
Our debt would not be two billion more than what we restructured, but it would be more like just under a billion more because we spent $1.1 billion keeping this country afloat when unemployment went over 18% and when over 50,000 people had to claim from the national insurance scheme to stay alive because not a red cent was going into those people's bank accounts or into their hands. That we had to do hampers for people when they couldn't sufficiently either earn or get to where they needed to get safely. That we had to build a hospital up in the north. That we negotiated a debt that is one of the lowest now that we own and look in the back of the estimates from the European Investment Bank. Mr. Speaker, when we went up there, the bush was over 15 foot high. The member for St. Peter spoke about it in his speech this morning because we left him from renaming the highway in St. Peter and went straight, the Attorney General and I, up to Harrison's Point at six o'clock in the evening. And by the next morning, the Ministry of Public Works and their officials were there. And within one month, we had a hospital there with over 50-something, 40-something, sorry, ICU beds, more than we had before, and others going in, sir. Sir, this is the reality of what this government has had to face. And sir, you know, I came here because I heard a lot about debt and a lot about growth and a lot. It is clear to me that the Honourable Member doesn't only know arithmetic, he knows nothing about the economy. He knows nothing and has been paying. The Member for St. James South was the one who said today that when he was finished with his slumber for the years that he had, he woke up and realized that the world had changed. I adopt her words. And I will soon adopt the words for the Member for St. Lucy too. And I will bemoan the words for the member for St. Michael Northwest. I've listened to everybody in here today, sir, carefully while doing my business. And I say to this honorable country that I am proud of the government that I lead. We may not be perfect, but these men and women in here come to work to try to do their best every day for the people of this country. And I go further, sir. I am proud for the most part of the fact that our record meets, meets our manifesto promises. They're not out of the sky. And you take up, and I defy anybody, take up our manifesto and see not just a work in progress, but you see actual achievements in a major way that have already altered the circumstances of people's lives in this country. Mr. Speaker, this is, not, this is not idle talk. And just for the record, let me also defend the public servants of this country. What I saw taking place as behavior in here when the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Democratic Labour Party was questioning people in the well, when he was doing it with the Ministry of Agriculture and doubting all that they said. And I'm gonna come to the sheep too, and I don't know which one he owns, 707, 708, Dolly or Molly. I don't know which one. I don't know the obsession either. But one day we might find out. Mr. Speaker, sir, I spoke in this country on Tuesday, on, on Monday, sir. And, and you know, sometimes the member hit home when he told me that he really didn't know arithmetic good. And I said, you know what? Bring a graph for him. And I brought the graph on the tables and he hoped that he would be there, sir. But for whatever reason, the Attorney General seems to have run him out of in here. I thought, then I thought that the Honorable Member for St. James Central, who used to be in the same chambers as him, and who lives near him, might have run him down because he well knows that the Member for St. James Central, um, that sometimes his tongue can be sharpened on both sides. And even in the middle sometimes, I would imagine, he would find out. But then I, realize that somebody may have told him that something was dropped off at the house of the Deputy Prime Minister. And that he may not want to be in this chamber for that. You say one thing for the former Prime Minister who led the Democratic Labour Party and became Prime Minister of the Democratic Labour Party, the Honorable David Thompson. He stood there and he took everything that came and he understood 
as I did yesterday. I stood and sat down here for the need of the opposition speech other than the two bathroom breaks I had because they're drinking a lot of water trying to lose weight. So uh, uh, excuse me, sir. But I sat in my seat because that is the tradition of this honorable chamber. And you can't give and not want to get. You cannot give and not want to get. And, and his absence this evening is scandalous and shameful. And I say so, sir. But if he was here, and if he isn't, I don't know these cameras can look a little thing, but I gotta make sure that they get on the internet if you can't read them. But let me just tell you, because he made a lot about nominal growth, and remember for Saint Peter had to take him through the difference between nominal and real growth, and to recognize that when we talk about real growth, we adjust it for inflation, and that what you're talking about is not the same five chocolates that the woman's selling outside the school, but it is in fact additional chocolates that she would have sold. But was he here? He could receive perhaps a little more knowledge. But then again, as you heard from every member in here, he never attended parliamentary party. He didn't like retreats. He didn't come anywhere. So that it was not a shock to any of us when it happened, but I'll come to that later, very much later. Mr. Speaker, between 1976 and 1986, this country had real growth of 2.6% and nominal growth of 15.2% as an average. Barry the Labour Party in charge. Mr. Speaker, between 1987 and 1993, there was no real growth in those years, and the nominal decline was minus 8.7%. The Democratic Labour Party in charge. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'll try to see if you can see. Come so I don't want to fall off. <laughs> Right. Between 1994 and 2007, under the leadership of the then Right Honorable Member for St. Peter, this country had growth of 2.8% again, more than the 76 to 86 period, and, Mr. Speaker, 6.1% nominal growth on average. Mr. Speaker, the Barbados Labour Party in charge. Mr. Speaker, between 2008 and 2018, the last decade, this country had negative real growth of 0.2%, minus 0.2, and nominal growth of 0.7%. Mr. Speaker, I already told you that we left an economy of 9.6 billion and came back and found one of 10, 400, 400 million more in 10 years. Next came to nothing. And that is when people's purchasing power started to reduce in this country. And that is when people lost their jobs in the thousands. We went to an IMF program, Mr. Speaker, in 2018-19. And less people went home then than went home in 2013, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this government's growth to date is at 0.6% on average in real terms and 4.5% in nominal terms. And you know why, Mr. Speaker? Because the first pandemic in 102 years happened. And this economy declined by 14%, not due to anything done by the people of Barbados, but simply, Mr. Speaker, that you could not travel in a tourism economy. That the fact of the hotels not needing to buy pork not needing to buy chickens, not needing to have anybody move goods from Brighton's or um, Stanford Scott. Massey had less to sell, no hotels opening. And in spite of that, Mr. Speaker, do you know that we don't even have the negative growth that the last decade have? And we have more growth than the Dems had between 87 and, and 1993, in spite of a pandemic. In spite of the worst ash fall the country knew in 119 years, in spite, and we're still paying the price of it, because the 38 buildings that closed down last year, owned by government, owned by the private sector, those 38 buildings, the majority of them, the member for Christchurch West will tell you that he was advisor that the fine dust from the ash 
getting into the air conditioning systems, as we knew happened up at the airport, as the member for St. Michael West Central would tell you, caused systems to fail and falter. And we therefore have to respond accordingly. But in spite, on top of all of that, having the first hurricane in 66 years, where 2,700 households in this country were affected with almost 800 losing their houses totally. A bill well in excess of 1% of GDP, well in excess of 100 million. And Mr. Speaker, this economy has still grown. Sir, there was no ash fall in the last decade. There was no pandemic in the last decade. There was no Elsa or freak storm in the last decade. There was none between 86 and 96 either, 94. But we went and had to face an 8% pay cut and 4,000 people going home. The Democratic Labour Party between 2008 and 2018 sent home near to 3,000 people. Mr. Speaker, when we came into office and you heard the member for Christchurch East Central say, the then governor of the Central Bank who continued with the foolishness that we should not restructure debt and who having racked up the debt then became the advisor to the same foreign creditors that you heard were responsible for that article in the Financial Times. I've never seen anything like it, sir. You carry us to the end, throw us into the pit of hell, and then stand up on the side and say, no, 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 I'm not going to play any part of it, and, and you can't hold me accountable for it, and you can't cut the debt from it. And those articles in the paper were intended to deal with it. By coming back to that shortly, sir, sit down and get comfortable. If you're at home, go for a little cup of tea, go for a little Milo, go for a little short thing if you want. <laughs> you sit tight. Mr. Speaker, the size of the economy. I talk about real growth. Look at it now. Everywhere you see BLP up 76 to 86. DLP goes up initially and drops back down sharp, sharp, sharp after 1991 to 94, sir. Look at it right there. Then the Labour Party comes in again. We have a little plateau at the same time that you had the dot-com bubble in 2001 and in 9-11. You remember that? And then it starts to go up again in the air. The last decade comes in and it goes in like it is a, 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 a real hole in the ground. Look at it. Right down. And then, Mr. Speaker, you have us. And this is the COVID that I'm talking about the, with the green bubble. But look where we end up again all the way back up, all the way back up from 2021 into 23. Mr. Speaker, back up again. And with God's grace and glory and blessings, I have every confidence, sir, that the budget which was presented to this house this year that is intended to secure faster growth will see Barbados rise above even that peak that was there initially because we will surpass the size of the economy that was reduced because of the, the crises. And I beg bold to say, sir, that I know that if all Barbadians, not, you can get all, but if the majority of Barbadians put their shoulder to the plow, sir, with what we have, with the confidence that people have in us, sir, the sky is the limit even in these challenging circumstances. And we will learn to surf the waves and we will learn when to duck, and we will learn when to stand up strong, because at the end of the day, sir, if you are small, use the benefit of nimbleness to your advantage, Mr. Speaker. There are other things that are not to our advantage. Mr. Speaker, I spoke to you about the nominal growth again. He was consumed with nominal and real. That, Mr. Speaker, was the real GDP just now. This is the nominal. Look and see where the inclines are least. Democratic Labour Party again right here. Look at it here again. Last decade, flat, flat, flat. And even with the nominal growth, look how much further we've gone ahead of them. Now, Mr. Speaker, we heard about unemployment too. Let's deal with unemployment. Mr. Speaker, the average unemployment rate from 2001 
to 2008 was this here, Mr. Speaker. And you can see the green line, which is the average unemployment rate in the long run, long course of this country, which is generally about 10.3%, sir. Look and see that the majority of the Labour Party is under there, with the exception of that blip with 9-11 and the dot-com bubble again. Mr. Speaker, this country is small, and therefore large, they call them exogenous, big fancy word for outside. Large shocks on the outside is what will catapult. And if you're small and the wave big, you've got to be nimble and make sure that you don't fall under or drown. And that is what we tried to do in those periods. Look at how much is above the green line in the last decade. That's when unemployment really shot up. And then when we come in, you get a blink up for when we came in here. You understand? With the, with the people going home at the end of 18, and that you get this huge, huge, huge ascent up when the country shut down in March 2020. And then again, you would recall, Mr. Speaker, the country shut again also in April 2021. This is the 21, 20 and the 21 here. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. And look where we are back now again. Look where we are back. At the end of December, 7.9%, just under, 8%, Mr. Speaker, way below. The only time lower was the September to December period under the then right excellent Owen Arthur when that quarter went, Mr. Speaker, to 6.7%. Mr. Speaker, in spite of all of the challenges, more Barbadians are working today than have been working for the majority of time since independence. Now, that is not to say, sir, that everybody's working. They're not. And that is not to say that they're not some people who are catching hell. And we get that because for whatever reason, they may be under divorce in the family. So therefore, they had a house together with the two people with two sets of income supporting the mortgage. They can't live in the same house for all kinds of reasons. You're going to get trouble. Somebody gets sick or somebody, um, the grandchild, is born disabled, you're going to get stress and things. So we have been working as a government to try to fill in the cracks for people, whether it is through the largest increase in welfare that this country has ever seen since, tw since 2020. We increased the welfare benefits, and we increased not just the quantum, but the number of benefits. And we then increased and introduced the household, the, um, we call it the, again, the family, Household mitigation unit, the $600 a month that the others spoke about. But I want to show you one last graph. The truth is that this one didn't get print before I found it. So you got to take a smallie from me. But this can go up on the internet too. And social media. All the talk about the level of taxation. You heard the member, the leader of the Democratic Labour Party last night. No? Would you believe... Would you believe that we have one of the lowest tax rates as a percentage of GDP in this country in the last 30 years? Would you believe that, sir? Would you believe that we inherited a tax burden, sir, that was higher than anything you see here, sir? I, 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 take my time. Because the people need the facts, and the facts they shall get. Our tax burden, sir, is 23.4% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, we inherited it at 27.4%. Do you understand that for every dollar produced in this country, Bajans are now paying 23.4 cents in every dollar, as opposed to the 27 cents. But you would have a leader of the Democratic Labour Party come in here and want you to believe that taxation is higher. People forget and have short memories that I came to this honorable chamber in 2019 and reduced income tax for everybody at every level. I increased the reverse tax credit at every level and expanded the number of people who could benefit from it. We created a new
category called compensatory income credit so you could get back every cent in tax. And if God spares life, and if this economy does well, all of you earning 40,000 and less, or 45,000 and less, next year stand by for a compensatory income credit. Take my words for that. So long as this economy is doing well. Because Mr. Speaker, we believe that as we do everything to give you opportunities for training, education, reintroduce Mr. Speaker back into this country for people, benefits for tertiary education, that we will still try our best to increase your disposable income so long as we can do it. Now, do you understand that we've reduced this country's tax effort while being in an IMF program and while facing a pandemic, a, a freak storm, a ashfall, and a hurricane? And, no, I ain't get to that one yet, and increased cost of living as a result of war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza. And also, it was at the back end of the COVID pandemic, too, that shut off the supply chains. Mr. Speaker, where is he living? I agree with the member for St. James South. He was clearly sleeping in long slumber. But you know, the previous leader of the Democratic Labour Party who was there was also in long slumber, too, and said that he was now waking up. So maybe it is a feature that is associated with the leaders of the Democratic Labour Party. Since Mr. Barr come, Mr. Barr never used to sleep. Different person. Now, Mr. Speaker, this issue of debt. <laughs> I hear, come in here. The pompous set. Others have told me that it is not 18.1 billion. Mr. Speaker, Central Bank report, document of the House. Mr. Speaker, January to December 2023. Please go, Mr. Speaker, to page 36. I have nothing to hide. If he was here, I would have even asked the um, Deputy Clerk to walk across and give it to him. In fact, I can still beg her to put it on his desk. He might collect it next week. <laughs> Appendix 6, 2017-18. Central government debt, gross central government debt, which is the domestic debt plus the external debt, 15.847. That's the figure that the member quoted yesterday, remember? But, Mr. Speaker... There were other public sector liabilities, Mr. Speaker. And if you look down the document, I want to send it to you. Other public sector debt, including guaranteed contingent liabilities, another $2.349 billion, sir, bringing to the grand total $18.196 billion. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts. They cannot change them. They can change their opinions, but they cannot change the facts. And if you doubt me, sir, I can't even lift this one now. This, Mr. Speaker, it was so heavy I had to beg one of the members of, of the police to bring it up the stairs because neither me nor my personal assistant can lift it as well easily up them top stairs. I had this bone today, sir and it shall stay in this parliament as a forever record of condemnation of the lost decade because this is the prospectus for the restructuring of our debt. I pray that no successive government and no prime minister shall ever have to face what I face with restructuring the debt of this country from the 18.195 billion that I just referred to there. And Mr. Speaker, this is what he says is easy work and could be done for free. Let me just tell you, for free. Mr. Speaker, this is 900 pages alone. And look at it, sir. Full of pages, and the blank pages in here, sir. 900 pages of work. First of all, anybody to read it is a month to read alone. But it could be done for free. And Mr. Speaker, I'm going to come to the White Talk after. But let me deal with the issue of the quantum of debt first, sir. Remember, for the Christchurch South needs to recognize that just because he can do theatrics and can talk pretty, the most that qualifies him to be is the great pretender. You heard it from the member for St. Lucie today. It doesn't qualify him to be a leader. It doesn't qualify him to lead a country or to lead a party. 
it qualifies him to give good entertainment. And regrettably, as you heard from the member for St. Peter, it was not even good entertainment last night. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, on page 77, get a calculator ready there for me, please. Right here. Uh, who want to zoom in? All who watching on, um, what do you call it, internet? You can try and freeze and zoom if you want. Look at the underlines that I have there and there. You know what they are, sir? Total external debt. This is table number 24. External and domestic debt of the public and private sectors. This document, let me give it to These listings, particulars, have been prepared solely for the purpose of admitting the securities to listing on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange and trading on the Euro MTF market. Mr. Speaker, this is dated the 18th of December, 2019. Mr. Speaker, on this one, the total external debt of Barbados to be restructured at that time, sir, 3.167.0 billion US dollars. Not Barbados dollars. And the total domestic debt, 5.9312 billion dollars US again. Add the two of those there for me, please. 3167. Yeah. Uh, the man said that he didn't know mathematics good, and I want to check my mask. I am pretending to be good at maths nor English. I just pretending to care about people. And I'm pretending about that either. I care about people. Five, nine, three, one point two. Mr. Speaker, that is nine point one billion. Nine billion and ninety-eight point two to be precise. Multiply that now by one point nine eight, and you will begin to understand eighteen point one almost billion. Mr. Speaker, let this stay in here so that every other MP, there's some members from the Youth Parliament. I hope that when your turn comes to being here, not as people in the gallery, that you remember the sacrifice that this generation of Barbadians made and that you will forever protect the public purse and the public finances of this country and the savings of all of us. Because all the fancy talk here, we got here because of a government that was obstinate, obdurate, and refused to listen. Went from the banks, to the public sector, to the um, advisors, to the private sector, to the international advisors, to the credit rating agencies. All said, and the then leader of the Democratic Labour Party was, according to him, sleeping. And, and, and I can be fair to the member for St. Michael Northwest, as he then was, he went and gave a speech at the Chamber of Commerce about the restructuring of the state-owned enterprises in 2010. And then after he made the speech, he was slapped down by his cabinet. Slapped down. And nothing was allowed to happen, sir. And for eight more years, this country went down a path that it could not justify. Could not justify. Mr. Speaker, this government must remain focused. This government must remain focused on its program and policy, sir. And I say so without fear of contradiction, sir. When he spoke about White Oak, I'll deal with this one last thing. Oh, this is a two-member firm. The member for St. James Central dealt with him as if he is not a sole practitioner. Where do you get the right to look in a mirror and point a finger at others, but don't see the four fingers pointing back at you? And worse still, now we heard what the Deputy Prime Minister has laid before this honorable chamber. I can assure him that nobody will charge him $141,000 on this side to represent him. <laughs> they come back to that. Mr. Speaker, White Oak, before White Oak, and White Oak wrote the last government, you know that's a joke? They didn't start with us. They wrote the Democratic Labour Party government who ignored them because they were singularly focused on the road that they were going down, down to the point of carrying us beyond the five-year limit into the 90-day extra time. 
You know in football you have extra time for 30 minutes? Well, in Parliament it's extra time for 90 days. And they went in the extra time voluntarily. Mr. Speaker, White Oak restructured Grenada's debt, 91% of it in 2005. White Oak restructured Dominican Republic's debt, 97% of it, 2005. White Oak did Belize's first restructuring in 2007, 98% of it. Cote d'Ivoire in Africa, White Oak was one of the people in that advisory team, 2010. White Oak was in the Seychelles, they were the lead advisor, 100% of the Seychelles debt, and that was 2010. They participated among a large group of people in the Greek restructuring as well in 2012. They were the sole advisor in St. Kitts and Nevis in 2012. They were the sole advisor for Be Belize's second restructuring, and may we never have to do a second restructuring, sir, in 2013. They restructured Ukraine. Ukraine that you hear all about, they were part of a team in Ukraine that did it in 2015 before the war, 83%. They did Grenada, Mr. Speaker, again in 2015. And that is why we are working so hard, Mr. Speaker. Both Belize and Grenada restructured once, restructured twice. And that is why this team must come together. And if I have some times to be a little unpopular, I will be. Because I do not intend for the government of Barbados to face another debt restructuring in my lifetime. In or outside of Parliament, I will do everything to help those who have ears to listen and hands to act. Mr. Speaker, Belize had a third one in 2017. And this goes back to whether you are prepared to cut deep enough and to do the structural transformation that you have to do. That is why we remain focused on dealing with the state-owned enterprises, sir. And then in Africa, White Oak and others, at the same time that they were doing us, they were doing Mozambique. Mr. Speaker, and what was the fee that they charged us, sir? 0.4%. Mr. Speaker, they didn't charge a fee that was disproportionate. They charged a fee of 0.4%. And that 0.4%, let me put it in context now. That's not even one cent in a dollar. So out of $10, that is four cents out of $10. You go and you ask a man to pay you, to, to give you back $100, and he asks you for 40 cents. 40 cents out of $100. You ask for $1,000, and you pay him $4 out of 1,000. You ask for $10,000, and you pay him $40 out of 10,000. Mr. Speaker, these numbers sound big to a little child. A thousand is big. You remember when you were a child, and you hear about a million? A million seemed like infinity. And what he's trying to do, as, as the member for St. Peter said today, is that he's trying to pass remarks and drop, drop remarks, good old Bajan phrase, drop remarks to make people feel uncomfortable, make people feel something nasty or sordid has happened. Mr. Speaker, we laid the white oak contract in this parliament. This is not like the deals of the Democratic Labour Party that we still can't find contracts for. No, sir. Remember, for St. Michael South Sea said, all who know about their deeds have not died yet. And Mr. Speaker, let's go to the actual restructuring. All the talk about not caring. Mr. Speaker, in the immediate, you heard me put the debt. The date on that, the 18th of December, 19th of December 2018 or 2019? 19. That was 2019 or 18? 2019. That's the 2019 one. The local debt was December 2018. One day I shall tell the story about that too. Because the member for Christchurch East Central came in my office on a Friday afternoon and said to me, 
Prime Minister, I regret to inform you that the local banks have, re have, 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 have rejected the debt restructuring. <laughs> One day she'll tell you. I told him thank you. Fifteen minutes later, I picked up the phone and I called the same way to And one day she'll tell the country what I said to them. Needless to say, that was a Friday. By the Tuesday, I was meeting with the two regional banks in here, in the committee room, and the meeting left in here. They went to talk to their principals in the afternoon, and we resumed in government headquarters in Bay Street about 7.30, 8 o'clock. The central bank person came down to my office at half past 12, quarter to one the night. One, the local banks, the two regional local banks agreed. All they had to, I had a few soda bicks and some cheese, and they shared in that about quarter to 10, 10 o'clock the night, and that was their supper. One day I shall tell the full story. Suffice it to say that all the fault stairs of the banks at the time that they would lose three and four years, one year of losses, one year. But Mr. Speaker, this matter was settled by the last leader of the opposition raising it in here. They campaigned on it in January 2022 and the country settled it in January 2022. But I'm conscious that I have some members of the youth parliament in here who two, three years ago may not have been following. And they're the ones who must carry the tradition and the knowledge and the customs of this parliament in the same way that I had the honor to be able to come into this parliament in 1989 and 1990 and 1991. I was in the Senate. I know what it is to tell the story of the 8% pay cut. I know what it is to be told that this economy was batting like Gary Sobers and the next thing you know, 4,000 people were being sent. Oh, I know the night when I was in Huddersfield turning and I made the point about the 4,000 people being sent home and I was called a liar as a young M candidate in this country. And lo and behold, less than nine months later, not only were 28,000 people marching up and down Broad Street, but that the 4,000 people were sent home and the 8% pay cut came. So Mr. Speaker, let me move from those matters. No, there was one other matter I wanted to tell you, that even after we were dealing, we had finished the domestic debt restructuring, sir, and we were about to go into the foreign debt restructuring. And Mr. Speaker, when that happened, we heard from some of the pensioners who had debt that things were rough and that they really needed to help. And Mr. Speaker, we then decided in two lots and gave back people up to $100,000 in cash, even though we were doing the domestic debt restructuring. Mr. Speaker, in November 2018, people got short memories. In November 2018, we gave them back, sir. $50,000, 20 in November 2018, and 30000 in March 2019, four months later. And then we committed, Mr. Speaker, to pay the other $50,000 over 42 months. Mr. Speaker, all of them received their money. We even gave another increase, and then I paid down debt again here last year again. Not only did we not raise taxes last year, but we paid down debt too. And Mr. Speaker, this country, lest we forget, Yet, lest we forget, lest we regret, this country cannot afford the mistakes. Member for St. James so, so said it again. That the member for Christchurch so said that, oh, he might be wrong. Well, you can go and play school in George Street and tell me if you're wrong. But this country cannot afford the luxury of another Democratic Labour Party administration. We have had no since regrettably the passing of the right excellent Errol Barrow. The Democratic Labour Party is yet to find its feet in this country. And unlike others, I pray that it does. I really pray that it does in the future because I believe that it was a noble institution and I believe that it has done great things for this country. But those who have come to participate in it in the last 50 years this year, since Mr. Barrett took his sabbatical, have trifled with it like a plaything, to the point now where you have two former Barbados Labour Party members vying for a two-headed creature. 
Warren couldn't make the second 11, third 11, sorry. Vexed that he couldn't be a candidate. And Warren vexed that he couldn't get into cabinet. Mr. Speaker, I'm accustomed to it. The last leader of the opposition, same thing. When I went to offer him the chairman of committee's position, he said he would get back to me. And then within two, three days, he said, he, he told me no, within a half hour. And then within two, three days, he decided that he formed me. He, his conscience now got to be the opposition. Mr. Speaker, I wish I could have met all them cabinet members. But that's the truth. But if this is what you have to face for an abundance of riches, and where people's sense of commitment to cause and party and government and people is so thin, it better it come out in the wash. Because you know where you're standing. But let's get real. And let me come to a few other things, sir, before I really come and deal with some other things with him. Because some serious things were asked, and he asked a question. I'm going to give him answers. Just as the Deputy Prime Minister and others in this thing did today. Member for St. George South and the member for Christ Church West also answered him on the housing. And I don't sugar wash things. If things are going wrong, I told this country on May 27th, 2018, that I would be the opposition to this party if I had to be. And they will tell you that I have learned the art as much as, much as my hair has gotten grayer. I've learned to be very direct in my speech because I realize that the country requires it and demands it, and I don't have the luxury of playing as if. I keep telling people I don't ball googly as well. I don't. And Mr. Speaker, let us be real. We have serious problems in this country. Remember, I'm not going to get into all of it tonight, but what they left for us at the Water Authority, the reason why I took responsibility for the Barbados Water Authority is because I discovered that the situation is far more dire than even we realized in the early years. The Water Authority does not and cannot go and raise money on its own. It has to depend and to weigh down government's balance sheet. The same balance sheet I want to build schools and refurbish schools. The same balance sheet that I want to be able to do things with the police and law and order. I can come to why hope exists because we found a way of not weighing down the central government's balance sheet with hope. Mr. Speaker, these are the real facts. And if they don't understand, say so and let us arrange for some tutorials for them. But to come in here and to cast aspersions is wrong. Let me tell you what I got from, from this, sir. The last unqualified audits for the BWA are up to March 31st, 2017. You know why, sir? Because in April 2017, sir, the Water Authority under the last government bought a new IT modernization system. And that modernization system, Mr. Speaker, between them, some of it was for smart meters that were never smart. The smart meters was 34.499 million of that, and they were never smart. Never got the remote reading. And we're now working to deal with that through properly getting the codes, etc to be able to make them function. Mr. Speaker, there was a company called SCL Sales and Services, $13.3 million. Another company called Water Management Caribbean, $9.2 million. Another company called EDM World Services Limited, Worldwide Services, $17.5 million. Mr. Speaker, Co-Water Sojima, $62 million. And that Co-Water, I believe, is the company out of Canada. And then the task unit fees for 616,000. Mr. Speaker, not only did the IT, the smart meters not work, the IT system has not worked. The BWA was then locked in with that contract into an 18 month maintenance contract with Co-Water at a total cost of $825,000. Say what you say about White Oak, why thought we structured the debt and we had all the room to ride through the pandemic and all the other misfaults that we had. You know that you can get proper figures out of the Water Authority and proper reports. They have to use Excel. 
You know the same Excel that every little child and everybody personally is used? That's what they've had to resort to. And Mr. Speaker, when the contract came to an end also, not just the maintenance, but the overall contract in April last year, under the Deputy Prime Minister, they said that they wanted 24,000 US a month. And mercifully, the board up there said, no, 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 no possible way. And the reason, Mr. Speaker, is that when all of the contracts and works were undertaken, the price to date, we suspect, may even be more than 137 million, because the reason for the uncertainty that we have is because the very same system that they gave us is broken. No, Mr. Speaker, that IT software system was meant to interface with all of the systems to provide data on customer account information and work management systems, and it never worked properly. I have a barrel of emails and letters that the Water Authority sent me today of them asking over and over and over for this to be fixed. The company responsible, sir, had also remote control. That's what the Democratic Labour Party left us with of our entire data there. And Mr. Speaker, that no one here then could go into it and try to fix anything that had gone wrong. And the same company, in spite of us writing as a country to them, they didn't seem to be able to fix their own system. That is what I have to clean up now, sir as Prime Minister of this country. That is why, Mr. Speaker, I have taken responsibility for this. And for the next two years, God spare life. I'm going to get it in order and then put it back to a line minister to be able to take control again. Because this foolishness must stop. There is no greater problem facing this country than water. We've said it from St. Lucy with the brown water and St. Peter to St. John and St. George to the outages in, 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 in Christchurch. Mr. Speaker, we feel it. We feel it. And then you're going to have the foolishness being talked in here by the leader of the Democratic Labour Party, and them can't even get the act together. The two leaders can't even make one up. They can't make up either. And they can't make one together. Mr. Speaker, what is that going to require from us? On the 31st of March, and the board has recommended, and I have accepted the proposals, as has the Director of Finance and Economic Affairs, that the balance sheet of the Barbados Water Authority will essentially be cauterized, in other words, cut off, clean, and start the new year with verifiable balances. The old balances will then be reconciled and verified and brought in piece by piece by piece in order to create a new balance sheet for the Barbados Water Authority so that we can take the Water Authority from off the back of central government and that we can then allow the Water Authority to operate on the basis of its own balance sheet in order to be able to do the strategic mains replacement and all of the other things. And I am talking tonight about the deal with the desal plants and that. They'll leave that for another day. I can't get all tonight. I ain't getting it all from the other things with the Water Authority or the meters tonight either. The truth is that the AG may well, the AG had to stop during COVID because we had to direct money to public health matters. But as we said to you late last year, the lawyers have taken responsibility for these matters again. Mr. Speaker, at the same time that that cauterization has taken place, we have gone out to be able to ask for the audits to be done on a parallel track. And may I say to the country, sir, that this country has been badly hurt by the big four accounting firms effectively withdrawing from doing audits in this country. And therefore, it has meant that the audits have become much, much more difficult to have undertaken. We're using smaller firms now who then may not have the same level of capacity but I will let the Director of Finance issue a statement to the country because you need to not only hear from the politicians, you need to hear from the person who at law has responsibility under the Public Financial Management Act on these matters, sir. And, 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 and let me go forward, sir. As after a period of time, and they advise me that it's after a few months, 
the bank balances will have been reduced to a minimum. The back balances, not bank balances, the back balances will have been reduced to a minimum and the balance sheet will be clean going forward. And Mr. Speaker, the residual bank back balances, there may be some that may be unrecoverable, but when they reach that point, they will then recommend whether those have to be written off or not, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is the legacy. That is the legacy of the Democratic Labour Party with a long, long, long shadow. And Mr. Speaker, you know, we keep saying when you have symptoms, when you have a condition, you must start to see symptoms, you know, but we believe that we can talk about these things and you don't see the symptoms or the consequences. The symptoms of the last decade are with us in almost every respect. And we face them in too many instances. You, you think that the Deputy Prime Minister just wake up and find bad roads, so? That came as a result. You know when they started to do roads, sir? The member, the last member of the St. Philip North started to do roads about three, four months before the election. Do you remember? And we had to inherit all of the bad roads. And then on top of that, Mr. Speaker, because of the change in climate patterns, that is what we have been facing, sir. But let me go further. Because I'm telling you, sir, he talked about the consultants. Mr. Speaker, they presided over the largest number of retirement, early retirements. Let's go through them. The Director of Finance, the PS Finance, the PS Foreign Affairs, the PS Health, the PS National Security. And I can go down the line one by one. Mr. Speaker, that is what we inherited. And there are people who were promoted two and three levels above their natural fit, which meant that you're now asking them, sir, to become good at crisis because you've thrown them off the edge of a cliff. A man can work good in normal calm circumstances, but when you throw him off the edge of a cliff, those who can't handle crisis go wobble and go catch yourself and don't know how to feel. That's what happened to this country. Now we found, therefore, sir, that we had to bring in people to be able to bridge the gap. And if we didn't bridge the gap, half the things that we are doing could not be done, sir. Are you telling me that this country was wrong to have Mr. Ben Arundel as a consultant? God bless him in his grave, sir. The man who helped us, the former member for St. Michael North, the man who helped us bring 18 pieces of legislation within being in government in four or five months of coming to office on the complex matter of international business. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Dr. Annalie Bob, who was an expert in digital and ID and was a former head of Invest Barbados and will be the new ambassador to the UAE. Mr. Speaker, make all the difference to us. Mr. Speaker, Professor Passaud, and beyond the very unfortunate, unfortunate racist remarks that the Democratic Labour Party continues to make about him, he has more than contributed to this country and contributed to the developing world by reason of his scholarship and by reason of helping us craft the Bridgetown Initiative. So much so that he is now the special advisor on the, to the president of the Inter-American Development Bank on the entire issue of climate financing, sir. And up to less than four weeks ago, was also helping Brazil to be able to deal with new metrics and new modalities. Mr. Speaker, this is what we are dealing with. But because he talks with a British accent, he grew up in England, but he was born in Barbados. Mother taught at Harrison College, all like the same former member for St. Philip South who was busy helping the leader of the opposition last weekend. Poor them. The president didn't even know that he was being left out when they had Anthony Wood, um, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs who was in here yesterday, um, Dr. Eswick, um, Don Valinas, all of them. That's neither here nor there. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Hugh Seeley, of blessed memory as well. Dr. Hugh Seeley, Mr. Speaker, was the negotiator 
for Article 6 of the, of the Convention where they claim it, Dr. Seeley is known by the entire world as a Barbadian expert. And Mr. Speaker, he didn't only do it under us as a government, he did it under them too. What foolishness am I hearing, Mr. Speaker? It's because of Dr. Seeley and eventually Dr. Mwanza and the Water Authority. That remember we used to talk about doing a West Coast sewage project that would cost us almost a billion dollars if we had to do it? Dr. Seeley and Dr. Mwanza came to cabinet and their first foray in determining whether a West Coast sewage plant was necessary was in the cabinet of Barbados four years ago, five years ago, 2019, I believe it was, because we were still down in Bay Street meeting to about me five years ago. And Mr. Speaker, we put the two of them to go and resolve the technical, scientific, and engineering consequences. And to Dr. Mwanza's comment, um, credit, Mr. Speaker, we worked out that we can use the injection wells and we can use reverse osmosis rather than having to build one to go across the entire West Coast. This is who we have. Mr. Speaker, there's a man called Leroy McLean. I know him well. And the truth is that a story will be told of a tale of two men. Like the leader of the opposition, Mr. McLean ran against me. I beat him once, I beat him twice, but we always continue to work. I'll come to what happened with me and the leader of the opposition later, and you'll see a completely different response. But everybody in Barbados knows that Mr. McLean is an expert in black belly sheep. And, and let me come to that now for the moment, because we had the distasteful exercise in this house with the cross-examination about sheep. It is true, I have wished that it was his brother speaking because at least his brother is the single largest owner of a of, of sheep in this country and knows something about it. But do you know, sir, that when he made mock sport about the Guyana sheep, we asked uh, uh, Mr. McLean, former personal assistant to the right excellent Errol Barrow, Mr. Speaker, about the sheep in Guyana. 707 sheep were sent to Guyana. All of the sheep were sent down and secured in three voyages. They arrived alive and in good health. You know how much sheep we got in Ghana now? It moved from 707 to 1,150. And that is in spite, sir, that apart from the main, the, the, the few losses that you would expect normally with any large number of sheep, there was a dog that attacked 39 of them, of the sheep and lambs that were killed. Mr. Speaker, nothing wrong with them. The mortality is below 10%. And like us, in Barbados, both countries have been experiencing very dry conditions. But Mr. Speaker, we didn't stop there. We heard all the foolishness that this government is only as if, as if it is minor. You know what difference a hampers make to a family at Christmas that ain't got nothing? You know that churches do it too, sir? You know that businesses do it too, sir? Because all of us were brought up in the faith. And whether it is the New, Testa um, the New Testament, or whether it is the Quran, or whether it is whatever faith that you believe in, sir, it tells us to take care of the least fortunate among us. That is human beings. But we didn't stop there. This nonsense about the country ain't got the soul. I could come to that. Because, Mr. Speaker, Southern Meats, we brought in a butcher. You hear that we only want to give people. Number for St. James South put it well again. That we started these programs, yes, in the middle of COVID, because we didn't have a choice. But the asphalt program was always meant to be a three-month program. Member for St. Michael Northwest made the point today, thank you, sir. And that it went from three months to six months to 12 months to 18 months to 24 months. And we made sure even when they were supposed to go before the 24 months, we said, no, make sure that they can receive training under the member for St. Philip West with the construction gateway program, Mr. Speaker. And when they get that training, let them, Mr. Speaker, be the beneficiary of new skills 
that can carry them for life. Welding gave them building. Tree trimming. You remember that I had a member of Michael Southeast that paid $28,000 to cut down a tree? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we did butcher training so that we are not only looking at dealing with the livestock industry in terms of rearing. And Mr. Speaker, they brought down, they brought down here, but he was so busy trying to work out where Molly and Dolly was that he didn't go to the value added. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, animal welfare training at the time of slaughter and best practices for cattle, pigs, and lambs, the 3rd to the 21st of July last year. Buttery Skills Foundation, Cuts produced beef roast, French style lamb shoulders, pork sausage, lamb kebabs, crown roast. Then we took four butchers from Barbados and sent up to Yorkshire. And you know who was doing the training, sir? A gentleman by the name we brought down here since August 2022, by the name of Mr. Martin McIntyre, ranked number 31 in the world by the Institute of Meat. Mr. Speaker, I can go on and on, National Training Initiative. But this is the country, this is the government that only want to give people, um, don't care about people, don't want to give people opportunities. Mr. Speaker, 51,284 Bajans took courses. I have asked how many of them did double or triple because I don't want to mislead this house and I've not gotten it yet. But for any number up in 51,284 courses to be undertaken in the last four years, we introduced this on or around the time of COVID. And the Bajans do not have to pay a cent for it, Mr. Speaker. 95,823 learning hours. Mr. Speaker, the same public service he's talking about, we now have them in a partnership to do a public sector academy. Because I told you on Monday that I don't worry about foreign reserves anymore. I worry about skills in this country. And you're seeing it in every institution, sir. It's not that we want to go outside of Barbados and hire people. Let me come back, sir, to the consultants. Yes, Mr. Masker, Professor Masker, but we have another set of consultants that we pay until when we first were in here. Dr. Greenwich was brought back from the IMF when we entered the IMF program, and he was paid predominantly by the Caribbean Development Bank, not the taxpayers of Barbados. Mr. Bess, who I spoke about that we've just brought on to help us restructure and to do all of the standards again for the climate crisis, being paid by the Latin American Development Bank and Fund. The lady who has now been seconded from the International Financial Corporation to work with me and who drafted our climate resilience plan, investment plan that I spoke about on Monday, she is being paid for as well. Mr. Speaker, we then had to find somebody to replace Dr. Greenwich when he left, and we took another person from the IMF and helped them to be able to help raise the skills and helping in the macro fiscal unit and helping across the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, sir. A former PS was brought back, two of them, because, sir, if you have skills and you don't have anybody to fill that gap, and these are Bajans that we brought back in here to help us out, sir, then there's another one who is here dealing with state-owned enterprises as well, sir. Because if you don't have somebody to come to work every day to make sure things happen, they will not happen, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the former head of the Green Climate Fund, working for the government of Barbados, being funded by the Inter-American Development Bank. Mr. Speaker, this government has taken time I, you know, I hear all the talk about the travel and all the talk about that. Sir, what happened when we went to Dubai and a year before in Egypt? You know, sir, you hear me talk about the $80 million in grant that the Water Authority get. Why do you think we get that? You know, Mr. Speaker, we get $30 million in grant to start something called the Blue Green Investment Bank that I mentioned and that you will hear more about in this parliament because the legislation is to come within a month or six weeks. $30 million in grant. If I just took the 80 and the $30 million in grant, I ain't even going to the other things that we have gotten. 
or the other consultancies that we get people to pick up for us. That's $110 million. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that you can't stand, and Mr. Barra said it better than any of us, but they forgot that part of his legacy, that you cannot stay in Bridgetown and negotiate work for this country that is 166 square miles in the middle of the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. And I am telling you, if you didn't know it yet, sir, the others will tell you, I do not travel first class. The last time I travel first class, the, the British Airways people come and carry me up there. Last week coming back. Last week coming back, the people from American Airlines saw me in the economy and come and say, they want me to come up to the front and I tell them, no, I travel predominantly business. And there have been times when I even share apartments with my staff to save money for the government of Barbados. Ask them what happened in the Summit of the Americas. Ask them what happens when we go to Unga sometimes before the apartments, a lot of the apartments shut down. Unga is the UN General Assembly. Mr. Speaker, I have a conscience and I know what I have to account to for, for the people of Barbados for what I do. But I also know that if I want the fiscal space for the country, and if I want the policy space for the country, and if I want them to change, like getting and accepting natural debt, natural disaster clauses, Barbados is the biggest issue of natural disaster clauses in the world. I told this country on Monday, that there is no international meeting on finance globally that does not talk about the Bridgetown Initiative in the last three years. It finds itself in every resolution. And a whole president of France crafted a summit with a pact for people and planet. Mr. Speaker, I serve as chair, co-chair on a number of bodies. And these are the things that have opened up for us Mr. Speaker, because I chaired the One Health Global Initiative, it meant that we were able to pick up the phone and get help from the WHO and PAHO in the middle of the night, midnight, you're calling people. Mr. Speaker, every Bajan know that you can't go and play, you go in a walk in somebody's house that you don't know if you ain't got a relationship with them. You can't do that. Are you going to get a relationship by what? By phone? But they might feel that we're a scammer. They want to see you. They won't hold your hand. They won't get to know you. They won't let two eyes make four. And this is what we are being miniaturized into by a Democratic Labour Party that is so lost that it wants to use, thinks it's building a platform for itself, but it's bringing a, building a scaffold for the whole country to fall down upon. Somebody said it in here. They're looking for the nylon rose at the top of the washway. I've never seen it so. You mean that you are so desperate that the only way you can see yourself succeeding is by tearing down everybody around you? No, Mr. Speaker. No, 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 no. No, sir. Let us continue, sir. So that the credibility of the message and the messenger is absolutely critical. And you heard the Attorney General, the member for St. James Central, and the Deputy Prime Minister say that this evening in here, Mr. Speaker. You heard it. You heard the Attorney General talk about $700 million in contracts at the Barbados Water Authority, most of which did not vote to tender. Mr. Speaker, this is the reality of what we have been facing. Now, he raised the matter of housing and hope. And I'm going to deal with it, sir. Because, Mr. Speaker, You will find out that I learned under Owen Arthur that when you have problems, you face them and you fix them. And Mr. Speaker, needless to say, without going into a lot of detail, that there were some issues with respect to us not being happy with the pace at which things were happening at home and the effective structural systems that we wanted in place. Mr. Speaker, without going into the details tonight, suffice it to say that you don't have to wonder about what this honorable member did and where we are, and that there are matters that have been fixed and are being fixed as we speak to, sir, because we understand that in order to have a 
credible program that doesn't build 1,100 houses in two years, but that can build 1,100 houses or 1,500 houses in one year, and then when you get into your stride, start to build 2,000 houses between the public and private sector in this country. Why? Because the member for St. George South told you what the backlog is at national housing. Mr. Speaker, when I met before the budget with many of the stakeholders, the police, the nurses, a lot of the other public servants, they all tell you that they want access to their people at housing. And then we also had to correct an anomaly with the teachers and the police because with the allowances, some of them were then not eligible to get the mortgages. And we said, no, when we said $5,500 and under, we mean without the allowances, because the allowances are not necessarily always going to be there. Flexi allowance is not there every month. And therefore, and we also said that in the same way banks favor their employees, that hope for us was to be able to give public servants the chance for housing, and that two-thirds of the numbers should go to public servants, and then once we satisfy that demand, the rest can go to everybody in larger numbers. Mr. Speaker, you heard already in here how we try to ensure that we control the cost of land, but the member for Christchurch South would want to get vexed for that and talk about us selling the land. You imagine that government selling the land from one arm to the other arm and won't get vexed and tell me that we should sell it at $18 rather than the $2.50? What foolishness is that, sir? We made a policy decision that we want to be able to cap the price of the land at no more than $12, and that would include services, water, roads, gutters, lights, in some instances, gas. And Mr. Speaker, that is the policy position of this government. Where we have fallen down, Mr. Speaker, is that regrettably, and they will tell you that I kept asking for this, is that we needed to make sure that the work with the lawyers and the mortgage entities, the financial institutions, was proceeding apace so that you would not only have to rely on the working capital given to you by the housing credit fund, but you could have a cash flow based on stage payments as is done by every other private developer, sir. Well, you heard from them in here today, sir, and the reality is, and you heard from me on Monday, how unhappy this government is about the length of time that it takes to do mortgages. And it is born out of the experience of executing our own housing program. And I said that it is unacceptable. You cannot get a mortgage in Cayman in a week and Trinidad in a month and Barbados taking three, four, six months. And I've asked for that, no, separate from the colloquium, I've asked for a meeting with Hope and its lawyers and the Attorney General and the Ministry of Finance because it has to be made clear that that process of expediting the flow of mortgages and stage payments has to be considerably increased. Now you hear about $60 million. You would think that the $60 million has gone for good. Mr. Speaker, i never seen nothing like it. Where did it come from? The Housing Credit Fund. Mr. Speaker, what? The Housing Credit Fund was established in the 1980s. Owen Arthur was a desk officer along with Reverend Cox and others. And it was helped, we were helped in its establishment by USAID. And it was intended always to be a revolving fund. Started at 10 million. And it was intended to be a revolving fund, sir. It still is. And therefore, the monies that have been put into hope, and in some instances, national housing, will be repaid because it is not a grant. It is not the grant like the Water Authority got from the Green Climate Fund or the Blue Green Bank got from the Green Climate Fund. It is a loan. But because of the hiccups that we have had in the execution and in the procurement, because hope also started during the back end of the pandemic. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is the first time the government of Barbados is seeking to do something at this level of industrial scale. And has it had teething problems? Yes, it has. And have we found out things that I don't like? Yes, we have. And have we taken action with respect to some of them? Yes, we have. But I'm not going to prejudice it this evening because I've asked for a full investigation into every aspect of it. And Mr. Speaker, I go further. I go further. 
the houses that have to be done, and the lots. The Ministry of Housing now has the lots for 20,000 housing solutions. We met with the engineers, and what we found out that is because of Barbados' geology, you could have solid rock here, and right where the AG is sitting, you would then have a hole. And then you have solid rock where the member for St. James Central is sitting. And then where the member for Christchurch West is sitting, you could have a cave again. So that the engineering of foundations has to be careful. But we're trying to find the most cost-effective way because we found that a lot of these foundations have simply been too costly. But part of the problem also is the rate at which people want to be paid. And that's why I say we have to export capital. Because if you're trying to recover all that you want for your quality of life on 267,000 people, then it means that you're charging higher profit margins than might otherwise be capable of being sustained with a larger thing. Let me give you the example. We talk about semi-professional football in here again. I ran the tournament back a couple of years ago. And Mr. Speaker, if we had done that tournament in Guyana or Trinidad, it would be going on all like now at the time. Because instead of having to worry about how you're going to get 1,500 or 2,000 people in there, you would be getting in the Guyana and Trinidad probably 10,000 people every Sunday because the population base is significantly more from which to draw. And it's the same thing with almost every commodity sold in this country. And we're going to have some straight talks and maybe we're going to find some public venues other than Parish Speaks to begin to have some straight talks with people, as I've said, ministers have to start accounting to the, to the public on their own, separate than, um, from the parish speaks as to what they're doing. But we also have to talk the country through the problems that are likely to be generational if we don't fix them and likely to cause real problems. But in Lancaster, yes, 152 houses, 16 mortgages executed, 40 mortgages in the process, and the purchase and vetting and letters of others progressing. Mr. Speaker, there's no way that should have been taken almost a year. No way. We have the ones at pool, and those are being held up, Mr. Speaker. Let me go back. The Clico lands and the Clico settlement arranged that there were certain things to be isolated for the Eastern Caribbean. Villanova was one, Wakefield and Poole and others were in there. The building next to the Supreme Court with the Clico headquarters is one. And Mr. Speaker, we made, and it took us almost a year to get it done initially, where we said to the Eastern Caribbean, the government of Barbados will replace those properties for you which are of no use really to you with bonds. Because we want to use these properties that have become a public nuisance the derelict, the breeding rats. And we want to be able to monetize these, same thing I said in this budget, in liquid and derelict assets. And Mr. Speaker, we have been waiting for the court, it isn't only the private people that's got to wait, we have been waiting for the court to sign a document now for how long, AG? Almost two years. That's what we're dealing with. But if you hear me coming here and make noise, then you can hear that the Prime Minister won't cross the lines with separation of powers. So I sit down and wait. I sit back and wait. Now, there are others who have written me that I can't sit back and wait because they then have a Prime Ministerial obligation under the Constitution. And I give them that assurance. But let me come back to this, sir. So that we have a whole host of things. Pool, North, 201 units. 17 wall structures up and more foundations. Colleton, 50 single units. Pool South, 115 at the site design stage. Todd's East, 195, awaiting planning permission, but subject to the same weight for title from Pool North and South. That's the title I just talked to you about coming out of the Clico land, sir. Although I believe that we've gotten permission for a license to use the land, and therefore you can put the roads and services in on it first. Then we have Clifton in St. Philip, and River Crescent in St. Philip, and Concordia North, Concordia South, Woodbourne, Lower Burnie, same Lower Burnie that the Deputy Prime Minister talked about. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, I have asked for these things to be paused in order for us to put industrial processes in place, processes that looked at the appropriate vesting of land so that they can 
transfer the land and get also, Mr. Speaker, the stage payments. The streamlining of the planning approvals, the Honorable Member for Christchurch West has gotten the memo and has been working assiduously to get that streamlining for them. The aligning of the building of roads and infrastructure will allow the land sales. If it was one thing I complained about for more than a year, Member for St. George South and the Member for Christchurch West will tell you with hope, I said you have to align the stage payments with this because you cannot only rely on central government initially for your working capital. Mr. Speaker, I go further. I talked about the execution of mortgages and the systems that need to be put in there and the matching of construction with mortgage payments. And Mr. Speaker, then the various construction technologies that we are using, whether for wood, light gauge steel, precast, concrete, or blocks. Mr. Speaker, the member for Christchurch South reminds me, sir, of a person who sees somebody go and buy a leg of pork in basics and oysters. The car at home in Scarborough. Well, I shouldn't say Scarborough because you didn't go up and there to see the people. The carrot by the market. He used to go there occasionally, but not recently. And to see them season it. And to see them put it in the oven. And when it gets in the oven, after 15 minutes in the oven, he said, take it out, let me cut it. And when he got a taste, he said, oh Lord, this can torment me. Well, it must torment you. You ain't let the thing, you ain't let, you ain't let it cool down. You ain't let it cook. The government's housing program is now starting. Let us get on with it. Let us get on with it. And if when we get on with it, there is something still to be said or done, we shall be accountable for it, Mr. Speaker. Nobody is asking for any special pleadings. But what we are asking is to be able to get the work done. And to have 1,100 and something houses finished nationally is not enough in two years. I have said so. And that what we need to have, Mr. Speaker, we need to be able to put the systems in place, and I'm now satisfied that it is being done. He talked about the CEO. Of course, yes, the CEO is not Beijing. But that is not because we didn't look for Beijing's first. There were advertisements about here. There were even engagements with Beijing's engineers that I know about. And it was held up for almost three months trying to negotiate with Beijing's. At the same fee, by the way, that the people are now getting paid. And I didn't set the fees for state-owned enterprises, sir. The fees were set by others and by the last government in the most part. And we inherited it and continued. But you would have him cause people to believe that we're doing something nefarious in here. Look at the letter. I make it a document of the House for the work permit, March 15, 2024 where the work permit is granted from the 11th of February 2024 to the 10th of February 2027. It is now a document of the House, sir. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I asked, you know me, I hear about foreign exchange going in an account to go to England. I asked, what's the position? Because nobody can get the salary. They said no. That what happened initially before the work permit is that the gentleman was doing a consultancy assessment and that the consultancy is what was paid for to go to the UK, but that his salary is very much going to be paid in Barbados and he too will be resident. The chairman is not yet resident in Barbados. The chairman is working on another major project for the government. But we do not have the luxury with 267,000 people only to draw from within now. And there are many people who will work between here and elsewhere. And that is the reality of what we have come to in this world, Mr. Speaker. Now, I would love to develop the capacity among the resident population and to grow the resident population so that we can do all that we need to do. But we're not yet there. You heard the Minister of Health. 84 people applied for the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Only two were Bajans. At the Water Authority, they advertised to engineers under the Deputy Prime Minister. Over 100 applications, I'm told. Less than a handful, single-digit Bajan. Mr. Speaker, we have a problem. And let me explain it to you. If we do not get on top of it, it means that your labor costs are going to be excessive. And if they are excessive, it means that it will also be inflationary with respect to the goods and services that those labor costs are servicing. So Mr. Speaker, we are very clear as to what we are required to do in order to resolve these problems. And may I say, sir, 
that government will proceed with its housing program because this is a major problem in this country. But government will keep its eyes open because we will face and fix anything. There is no evidence of corruption before me at all today. But if the investigation I've asked for shows it, then we will deal with that too. But suffice it to say that what we have is systems that have not been properly developed. And I said so in October, and I said so in January. They're not hidden. Just as I said with the East-West that you are over budget because of the fact that we did not get the labor source that we expected and that we could not get the people out of either China or the Gulf states for 11 months with no transit visas until eventually Beijing's developed the capacity and then through the quantity surveying firm, when I saw the figures, I said to the member for Christchurch West, go and get an independent assessment before you pay a cent as to whether the requests are, are legitimate or not. And that came back in by one of the top quantity surveying firms, not just in Barbados, but in the entire Caribbean, sir. Sir, you know what has happened to us? That we have a person, and I will simply say to him, to the member for Christchurch South, that there's a good old Bajan saying that he needs to apply his heart to wisdom with. That if greedy could wait, heart will cool. You cannot judge the housing program before it gets off properly and is fully in its stride. And because we are moving from a culture where we never built this volume or scale of houses, it means that it is going to take time. It's the same way I explained to you why the anti-corruption unit took time to get up, the Civil Aviation Authority took taking time to get up, why the Integrity Commission will get up, but it is also taking time. And let me remind this country that you see it's the same handful of public servants and the same handful of ministers doing everything. This is not like the other countries where when I look at them and I get in a room, I walk in with three and four people and then walk in with 30 and 40 people. But we are meant to do the same thing. And we have distinguished ourselves with three and four, even when others have 30 and 40 people. That's why the Inter-American Court coming here. That's why we are president of UNCTAD, sir, and do the first ever global supply chain forum in the history of the world. Mr. Speaker, and when I hear him talk about this country has no soul, let me tell you who has no soul. People who look in the mirror and don't like to see what they see. Because I would never find myself with KC behind my name. I was so happy when this country became a republic, sir, so that I can move from QC Dome, and it was my old school initials. I can move from QC to SC, senior council. But this one, who leads the Democratic Labour Party and all the others who are walking around with him as lawyers who are senior council, a lot of them choosing to use KC King's Council. And I said, do these men of independence, but then again, he was born before independence. I was too, but I was so close to it that I feel I'm an independence baby. Do these men look in the mirror and see what they're saying? But then again, he wanted to talk about the former member for St. Peter wanting to work for free. Let me tell you about the former member for St. Peter and him. The former member for St. Peter called us one day and said, can you imagine that a young Barbadian who is supposed to be proud of, who has four numbers ending in 1937 and 1966, has as his profile picture, a picture with a, with a, with a, with a legal horse hair wig. A wig that nobody in Barbados has had to wear for almost 30 years. But two, three years ago, that is the profile picture of the leader of the Democratic Labour Party. That is his mirror image. Everybody talked about the mirror image. Is that his mirror image? And then you're going to tell me about a party without a soul, a government without a soul? Mr. Speaker, we are the government that took the hallowed ground of Golden Square and said that the half people with a bus stand there and glittering and garbage was wholly and completely unacceptable and that that area needed to be preserved to give and pay honor to the people like Israel Lovell and Clement Payne and all the others who lost their lives in the 1937 riots. That space is what secured for us 
the political parties, the one that I lead will become 86 years Easter Sunday night. And I can tell you, hold tight because you're going to join us somewhere that Easter Sunday night as we celebrate it 86 years. Mr. Speaker, I am telling you that this is the same party that carried this country to the Republic. And every member of the Democratic Labour Party tell me that I can't go to a Republic, that we ain't concerned. We ain't concerned, the people. The Ford Commission. I was a young minister, you know, in Arthur's cabinet. Mr. Speaker, we went further. I was the one that led and came in here. And when the then Prime Minister decided to roll back because of the pressure at the time, we regretted it, but we understood what was happening. That's why he never moved Nelson. This is the party that moved Nelson from the center of Bridgetown, sir, and replaced it. This is the government that says this is where the slaves got off and were separated. And the tribute we want in the center of our town is to be able to pay tribute to the resilience of the Barbadian family. Mr. Speaker, it is not by accident that I come in here today and on Monday to talk about building resilience in this country because if those forebears of us did not have the resilience to withstand the wickedness and the horror of slavery, we would not be standing here today as we are standing, sir. No, Mr. Speaker, the great pretender You cannot sit behind there for five and a half years. You know, Mr. Speaker, I have never seen the, sal the, <laughs> the signature of the member for Christchurch South until about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, when I saw it on an invoice, and I was horrified because we have a custom that we help each other. But when a six-figure invoice comes to be able to claim from one of its own members, we knew that this was, something was wrong. And I don't take these decisions on my own. You heard the Deputy Prime Minister talk about it. You heard others in here talk about it. I go around the room one by one, by one, by one, by one, by one, right down. You know when a division get called in the house? Yeah. It's called a division in the cabinet and the parliamentary party on fundamental issues. Because all of us must stand by them together. But I'm not gonna get into that today, sir, because you have heard enough about why this party must now understand how this member who now wants to cast aspersions on every member on this side without an ounce of proof not like the proof the Deputy Prime Minister bring here today. Not like the proof that I have on him. But you cast aspersions. Because you can talk sweet. The Lord bless you with a tongue, a sweet tongue. But he didn't bless you with commitment to cause or party or even client, it seems. No, Mr. Speaker. If we're going to talk about credibility and message and messenger, let us talk about it. And, and I say to us, sir, I say to us that these things are important because we learned in 2008 when you let these things slide, you can end up in trouble. And that is what led to the last decade. And Mr. Speaker, I gave you a solemn promise that even if it was to be my own party that I have to oppose, I will do it because I have been in public life too long and I know the consequences to ordinary Barbadians. I also know how long it took me to do what I wanted to do for the police and the nurses last year and this year because the first three years, two years, sorry, were caught up in debt restructuring. So I couldn't move left and I couldn't move right. Then when I thought in December 2019, 18th of December, we getting ready and you're licking your chops now for what you can do to help people and what you can do to build out this economy, what you can do to get the project started. 31st of December, driving in my car, driving myself. 
And I on the BBC News. And I hear about this virus coming out of China. And I put it back there and I said, oh Lord, let me pray. But I put it back there. Three weeks later, I was meeting with the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Health for us to roll out a plan long before COVID hit Barbados till March, 20, March 20th, 2020. But we were preparing for it because that is the kind of government we are. And Mr. Speaker, I say to you that it, it, it really bothers me and, and I want to go further. You know, the gentleman likes, the honorable gentleman likes to speak about law. And I respect that. I'm a lawyer, he's a lawyer. He might have more recent practice than me, but I still remember something that I learned in law school, in the law of evidence. And the law of evidence, sir, tells you about the rules against hearsay. And Mr. Speaker, the rules against hearsay have certain exceptions, contemporaneous reports. But one of them, sir, is something called similar fact evidence. And similar fact evidence is simply, sir, a principle that establishes the conditions under which factual evidence of past behavior, subtext say misconduct, but I say behavior for the purposes of this, sir, can be introduced to be able to prove and to infer that the accused practices certain conduct. Now, there's no accused in here, although he took my speaking about case close in a press conference on a Saturday, a metaphor politically, to then try to say that I am usurping the role of a DPP. What madness am I hearing? This is play school. This is play school or desperation, one of the two. But Mr. Speaker, let me carry you through the similar fact evidence. And you heard one or two people kind of refer to it. But you know, I perhaps am the best one to do this. In 1989, I decided that I was running in St. Michael Northeast. And I went to contest a nomination. And that's why I say to young MPs, don't be afraid to do that. At the time, Senator Barker was interested. Another, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Griffith, of blessed memory, now who used to live in the States. The former MP, Leroy Cisnet, of best, blessed memory. And one Ralph A. Thorne. R-A-T, Ralph A. Thorne. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there was a six-week nomination process. And the Sunday afternoon at Lawrence T. Gay School, I mobilized my people. We gone in there, we inside. We see Senator Barker. We see Anthony Griffith. We see Mr. Cisnet. So much so, we did not see Mr. R.A.T., Mr. Um, the member for Christchurch, so sorry. That people even asked whether his name was still on the ballot. And the MC of the afternoon said, of course he's still on. As fate would have it, he did turn up at Lawrence T. Gay, but didn't get much further than he gave. And Mr. Speaker, the rest of us, and, and to her credit, the Billy Biller always said you should have known from that day. The rest of us said nothing. Didn't come in to thank anybody, and this matters to me, because I know what it is to lose. In 1994, I lost an election. And in spite of losing that election, I went to the counting house, Mr. Speaker, late the night to thank the people who worked in 1991 to thank the people who worked for me, who counted for me, and my constituents who were outside waiting for me on that night, 11.30 midnight. I could have easily gone home like many do. I went and thanked them. In 2008, January, we lost government. 
when others were busy cleaning out their offices at midnight and three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning. He said, I ain't coming here like a thief and I ain't laughing like one. I went in my office after some sleep at 1.30, to the afternoon in the building right there, the barrack building in, 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 in Lodge Hill and went and thanked all the members of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment. And they even summoned me into the conference room to thank me as I thanked them for the period of time that we worked together. So Mr. Speaker, when I see somebody behaving and fleeing, running, I don't know what other kind of things is, run fast and move. Not me and that, I ain't getting that. But I want to say that the people in Butler's Avenue and in Grisette's where he was born and in Pioneer Road who came in there to vote for him came and explained to me afterwards in utter shock and horror when he was announced as a member of the Democratic Labour Party running in the, part, the constituency of St. Michael North. They did not know when he had left for he did not tell them anything. He did not say anything. He then went to the Democratic Labour Party in St. Michael North and was beaten twice as a dem. Twice, not once. And Mr. Speaker, you know the sad part? It's a constituency in which I live. And I then discovered that the same thing he did to the Barbados Labour Party in 1989, he then, a decade later, did it to the Democratic Labour Party. And Mr. Speaker, not a word in English, Mandarin, French, or Spanish, not even sign language was uttered. Now, Mr. Speaker, I understand this, and I am telling this story because this is the second time now that this party has had people cross the floor and want people to believe that it is on high principle when in truth and in fact, the facts need to be told to the country. Not for my benefit, because all is well with my soul. As it was in January 22, when I had to deal with the then member, then leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, the late Owen Arthur came to me. He made me in 2005. Six, 2006. No, 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 it was before then, sorry. In, in, in 2003, I became Minister of Home Affairs and Attorney General. 2001 I was, but in 2003 he came. He said, I can't remember if it's 2001 or 2003, but he asked me if I would agree to the Honorable Member for Christchurch South being chairman of the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. And I said, yes, Prime Minister asked you, and I'm, I work with everybody. The others would tell you, I, I work with, and I don't, I, I work with any and everybody. No. 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 Mr. Speaker, sir, it soon became clear that what I was expecting of him as a chair at CBC was not happening. It wasn't any infelicity, it just he was not up to the task. And we had to have a conversation, and it is the only time I've ever had to ask a board chairman to resign and to be relieved of his portfolio. The only time. Because it was clear that he was not up to standard administratively. Now, Mr. Speaker, I say that conscious that I know when things and people have things in the crawl. But in spite of all of that, sir, the others will tell you, I pride myself of not carrying malice in my soul because I believe malice gives cancer. I believe it eats out your inside. And when the constituents of Christchurch so said this is who they want to represent them. The party agreed. And all of us, as you heard from the member of St. James Central, went and worked and worked our liver gall out for him. Now it is true, sir, 
that people will cross. And I said so. Some people cross once. Some people cross twice. Change parties twice. But there are very few people who ever change it three times. And I've been told that how could I say easy come, easy go? Well, I'm showing you how I said easy come, easy go. It was easy come, easy go to the Labour Party people in St. Michael Northeast when he went to the Dems. It was easy come, easy go when he left the Dems to come back to the Labour Party. It was easy come, easy go having won twice under the Barbados Labour Party. Never won once for the party he now leads. But the similar fact, evidence of behavior, I have had to listen in the last month from husbands who tell me that the wife almost put them out because of how many times they walk up and down in the night Jew, canvassing for him. And the wives didn't believe that they would be working so long and so late. I have had to hear how mothers miss children important events. Because that's what happens when people work for you. I have had to hear somebody say that they almost get fired because of getting into work late, repeatedly trying to do things to help him out. Mr. Speaker, you can go and ask anybody in Christchurch, so do not ask a single member of this government. And when I can hear him talk about representation, Mr. Speaker, it, it fires my skin. You heard the others talk about the reference to the lady who nominated him. But they didn't tell you about the lady who had his picture up in her, her house. And she ended up sleeping under the bridge here a few months ago. And were it not for the help of one Mr. Donovan, bringing it to other people's attention, it would continue. And I can go on with story after story. I'm not going to go into it. But what I will not do is have somebody come in here and drop remarks about people as if they're a paragon of virtue. And then talking about who is dictator and who is this and who is that. And then want me to tell me nonsense about I am trying to, to, uh, to bring on to myself powers of a DPP when the director of public prosecution should really only be seeing him and nobody else here. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister said over and over, she never received the check. She didn't even know it had come. The person dropped it through a window in her office. She neither solicited, and he read the section. And the section was very clear with the operative words. She neither requested, solicited, nor accepted. No, Mr. Speaker. And I say to you, similar fat behavior, BLP to DLP. Similar fat behavior, DLP to BLP. Back to the BLP. I warned them, they better watch themselves because you ain't even gonna know when he's gone again. Well, I don't know where he came. But let me go further, sir. Because I'm not even gonna get into the facts of this. But when I say client, I wasn't even knowing that the Deputy Prime Minister was going to show that he didn't have commitment to client either. But in the Northern Caribbean, same thing. Who resigns as a senior counsel by email to the point where the, the client does not even know that you have resigned? So you ain't talk to constituent. You ain't talk to the general secretary. You ain't talk to the branch. You ain't talk to the chairman of the party. You ain't talk to the political leader. We can't feel no way. I tell them don't feel no way. I got a whole thing here showing how his behavior also occasioned major disruption. You are a lawyer yourself, sir. You know that you cannot resign by email. Didn't even seek leave of the court. When the court asked him to come, he gave a sense of what he calls, you know, he liked the big words, like the former leader of the Democratic Labour Party. He sent a missive. I can call it an email, but he doesn't say I don't know English, so I'm happy not to know English. A missive. No, sir. And then not to be in here, sir. 
everything I am saying I would have said in his presence, sir, as I say it now. And I'm saying it for one reason. His behavior has shown neither commitment to cause, to party, or to client. And you come in here now to try to lecture people. Lecture people. No, Mr. Speaker. No, sir. I will simply say to him, sir, that there was a man who a few years ago warned me, sir, that there is a poem I should keep to use against the leader of the Democratic Labour Party as he then was, and that I may want to keep it for all leaders of the Democratic Labour Party. I did not know, sir, that that same man would be the same man I may have to use it and remind him of the words. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, that poem is well known to many of us. He loves to quote literature. He's a man of words. He quote Martin Carter how much times yesterday, Mr. Speaker. And, and as he did that, he, he, he wants us to fall over his words as if the words will mean everything. But there used to be a dub song, action, not a bag of words. People need action. And for him, who says that he is the paragon of virtue, study theology. He knows John 3.16, but I wonder if he remembers John 3.18. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Mr. Speaker, it is the actions by which we judge each other. And the credibility of the messenger is as important as assessing the credibility of the message. And that is why when he gave me this poem and he said it, you can go and find it on the internet too. Because you hear his long voice saying it. I kept it. But little did I know that I would have to use it this soon against a leader of the Democratic Labour Party to fortify my presence and to ensure that I remember and remain focused. And I share it now with the people of Barbados because I realize that I may not be the only one who finds it comforting and needs it. But I hope that those youngsters in the art gallery and others who are listening, especially young women, will remember this. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust. I'll rise. Mr. Speaker, those were the words he used when he said that a leader of the Democratic Labour Party was trying to explain me to the Barbados Labour Party and to the country. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still. I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes. Shoulders falling like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. And this paragraph, I want this stanza, I want him to remember. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Mr. Speaker, sir, I will not go into the rest of it. I say simply, sir, that the last verse inspires me even more. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Mr. Speaker, we cannot choose what befalls us, but we must know how to respond on each occasion. I find it unfortunate that this situation has reached this point and that a person who has offered themselves and we accept it in good faith now wants to use this parliament as a whipping boy 
to justify what may be a tantrum and what may otherwise be a desire for glory. But suffice it to say that we have to be motivated by the noble traditions of representation and by the noble ambitions of the people of this country. Because what we inherited cannot be what we leave to the people of Barbados. I believe that this government will try its best. We are not perfect. But we shall rise to the occasion. And in the same way, I am comforted by the stanza that I will rise. I know that this government will keep rising in the interests and in the desire to bring the best for this country and its people. Mr. Speaker, I hope that over the course of the next few years, that the people of Barbados will recognize that do not be distracted by pretensive noises, but stay focused, because less we forget, less we regret. I'm obliged to you, sir. The question is that this bill be read a second time. All those who are members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ice have it. Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move the suspension of the House until 20 minutes to 11. The question is that this honorable chamber be suspended until 10.40 p.m. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes have it. This honorable chamber stands suspended until 10.40 p.m. <laughs>